The guerrilla soldiers fire their rifles blindly into the jungle. They don't know what exactly they're shooting at, but something is out there among the trees, something they can't see, something that's killing them. One of the young soldiers, barely more than a boy, stops to reload. As he pulls the magazine from his rifle, a blur passes by. The soldier next to him suddenly drops to his knees, clutching his neck, blood pouring out between his fingers. A hand grasps the boy's shoulder, and he spins around, nearly opening fire on his commander. The older man tells him they've got to go, and the boy joins a small group of soldiers who start running through the jungle, trying to get away from whatever this thing is. As they run, there's another flash of movement, and one of the soldiers is pulled into the trees. He can hear his screams mixed with the otherworldly shrieks, but there's nothing they can do. It's already too late for him. Another soldier disappears into the trees with a blur. It's just him and the commander now. They emerge from the jungle into a clearing that contains a small abandoned farm. The commander motions for them to head towards the old farmhouse, and the two take cover around the corner of the home. They crouch with their guns ready, peeking around the corner, looking for any sign of the monster that's killed so many of their comrades. The boy wants to know what they should do. He opens his mouth to ask the commander, but he puts a finger to his lips and motions for the boy to keep watching. The boy peeks around the corner of the house, but he doesn't see anything emerging from the tree line. It's quiet, until the commander begins to scream. The boy turns to see a point forming on his chest. It's a black circle. No, not black, something darker. It's like it is the absence of any and all light. The commander screams louder as the point of darkness grows. The commander's screams fade out, even as it looks like he continues to yell. The boy watches as the commander seems to be collapsing in, sucked into the dark orb in his chest. The commander's body folds in on itself, growing smaller and smaller, until it disappears completely into the black hole, which vanishes along with him. The boy doesn't know what he just saw, but he doesn't have time to think, because emerging from the forest is the creature. The boy has never seen anything like it, and runs into the farmhouse. He locks the door and pushes the old kitchen table in front of it, trying to barricade it as best he can. He looks around and spots a bed against the wall. It's the best hiding spot he can find, so he runs and slides under the bed, pulling himself as close to the wall as he can. The boy watches and waits, unsure of what he should do. It's quiet. There's no more screaming of soldiers being killed or any more of those guttural animal-like squeals. Maybe it decided to go back to wherever it came from. The boy doesn't dare come out from under the bed, though. As he watches the door, waiting for something to burst through, he sees something else. Another of those black points appears in the middle of the room. It looks like it bends the light around it, distorting the room nearby. The boy watches from under the bed as, out of the point, a thin black limb emerges. First one, then another. He can see its strange pointed legs with no feet standing just in front of the bed now. With a high-pitched cry, the creature effortlessly tosses the bed aside. The boy is left exposed, cowering against the wall. The creature screams, opening its wide mouth that seems to split its eyeless face in two, revealing two rows of jagged teeth. The boy screams back, crying in fear, and sees that the creature isn't eyeless after all. Inside its grotesque mouth, a milky blue ball appears. There's no iris, but the boy knows whatever this thing is. It's looking at him. The boy feels his chest grow tight. He looks down to see that one of the black points is forming on his chest. He can feel himself being squeezed and crushed, pulled down into this singular point. All noises, including his screams, disappear as he is pulled into this soundless void. But then he hears something again. He looks up to see that the creature is being riddled with bullets. It turns to escape and bursts through the wall of the farmhouse. The dark orb on the boy vanishes, and he sees, standing in the doorway, his friend and savior. He clutches his bleeding throat with one hand, holding his rifle in the other. The boy rushes to him as he collapses to the floor. Blood is pouring out of his neck, and he can no longer speak. But he dies knowing he saved his young friend. The boy starts to feel very tired, and he sits down next to his dead hero. He's all alone now, his entire group of freedom fighters now wiped out by this demon. The boy feels nauseous and dizzy. He coughs into his hand and looks down to see that it's covered in his own blood. A group of boys run down a jungle path, laughing and playing, when they suddenly stop and grow quiet. There's something up ahead of them. It's a man lying on the side of the road. The boys look scared, unsure if they should check it out. But then the smallest of all of them emerges from the group and bravely marches up to the man. 
Not wanting to let the youngest of their friends make them look like cowards, the rest of the boys soon follow. The man on the side of the road is moaning and looks to be in pain. As they get closer, they can see that he must have been in a terrible accident. His skin is gray, and it looks like his long, thin arms only have three fingers. What should they do? The small boy picks up a stick and reaches out with it to poke the man, not wanting to touch him with his own hands. But before he can, the man rolls over, opening his mouth with a horrible shriek to reveal the glassy blue eye inside as the boys turn and run, hands over their ears. Several weeks later, the small Guatemalan town holds a meeting. A crowd of people in the room are angrily yelling at the mayor who stands at a podium, demanding answers from him about what happened to their dead or missing loved ones. A series of photos are hung on the wall behind the mayor in remembrance of those who have disappeared into the forest or mysteriously died from a rapid illness, including the brave young boy. One man shouts at the mayor, wanting to know where his daughter was. Another asks how her healthy husband could drop dead from an illness after being perfectly healthy only days before. The mayor tries to calm the frustrated townspeople, telling them that he knows there have been rumors of a demon out in the forest, but that's all they are. Rumors. The mayor warns them, though, that something is out there, though he doesn't know what. There is an animal or man that is making people sick. It may also be hunting people. Neither he nor the police know exactly what is going on. But there is good news. A group of men have come to help them. The mayor points towards a stern-looking man in a military uniform who is standing with a small group of other soldiers and a scientist off to the side of the stage. The mayor explains that this man, General Machoy, is from America and that he's going to help them. The crowd doesn't cheer in the way that the mayor seems to have expected, but they at least stop their yelling as the general steps to the podium and thanks the mayor for the introduction. The general looks over the crowd who are waiting and hungry for answers about the monster that's suddenly begun plaguing their town. He tells them that it is true that he's been sent here by the US government in order to investigate what's been happening and stop whatever threat is out there in the jungle by any means necessary. He can't promise that he'll be able to bring back any of their missing loved ones, but he can at least prevent whatever this is from taking any more. He then gestures to the rest of his group and tells the crowd that the men he has brought with him have been specially trained to deal with this exact type of situation, and that they don't need to worry any longer. The only thing everyone needs to do is stay out of their way, and all will be taken care of. With that, he walks off the stage as the crowd erupts into more shouting. General Machoy stops at the scientists waiting next to the stage. Well, Dr. Ketter, what do you think? The scientist adjusts his glasses and answers, This is what we've been preparing for. The overseers kept telling us this day would come. It looks like it finally has. The group of soldiers led by General Machoy make their way through the dense forest. Dr. Ketter is just ahead of them, using a Geiger counter to follow the creature, the audible clicks of the radioactive entity telling him which way it came. They track the source of the radiation to a clearing in the jungle where a small village once stood. Most of the buildings are overgrown with plants and thick vines, but with it growing dark, this seems as safe a place as they will find to make their camp for the night. The soldiers fan out to search what's left of the town, as Dr. Ketter continues looking around for where the radioactive trail might lead them next. As General Machoy is checking out one of the many dark old buildings, one of the older soldiers cries out, Hey General, it looks like this generator still works! With the sound of an old diesel motor coming to life, lights in the village suddenly flicker on. They now have fortifications and light. Though he'd never admit it, General Machoy was feeling nervous about spending the night in the jungle, but now at least some of those nerves were being washed away by the old flickering yellow lights. Later that night, the general is questioning Dr. Ketter on where the creature went. Dr. Ketter is confused, though. His readings showed high traces of radiation leading into this village. The creature came here, he was sure of it, but now he can't figure out where it went. It's as if it came into the village and then simply vanished. Outside, one of the soldiers on watch tells the rest of the group who are sitting around a fire to shut up that he thinks he saw something in the woods. Everyone immediately springs into action, taking defensive positions and aiming their rifles into the dark tree line. There it is again, he says, as a flash of darkness moves just beyond the clearing. No, it's over here, says another soldier on the opposite side. How could the creature be moving so fast around them? Are there multiple of whatever this is out there? The soldiers form a circle to make sure that the thing can't get behind them. What they can't see is the point of darkness forming behind all of their backs, and the thin, pointed legs stepping out of it. The general's radio comes to life. I think we've got something out here, Gen- But his message is cut off by screams and the sound of gunfire. General Machoy tells Dr. Ketter to stay inside and runs out of the building. 
where he finally gets a glimpse of the demon that they've been tracking. The tall, thin creature is massacring his squad. It dashes between them at an inhuman speed, using its three-fingered hands to rip the limbs off of some soldiers and slash at others with its razor-sharp claws, opening up their necks or disemboweling them before moving on to the next. The general fires his rifle at the creature and misses, but it's enough to get it to retreat. General Machoy runs back inside the building where Dr. Ketter is waiting. What was it? What did you see out there? The general doesn't know how to begin describing the monster that just killed all of his men. It's like nothing he's ever seen before, and something that no amount of training could prepare him for. As the two men ponder what to do next, the Geiger counter on the table suddenly starts to click, softly at first, but then more and more, as if a huge amount of radiation has suddenly flooded the room. The general grabs the doctor and drags him out, leaping out of the building just before it collapses in on itself, disappearing into the micro-singularity that formed inside. The two men look up to see it standing right in front of them, its huge mouth open to reveal its glassy blue eye. Look out, Dr. Ketter cries, but he isn't talking about the demon as he and the general roll to the side, just avoiding the power line that has been cut loose by the destroyed building. The power line hits the ground and immediately begins to spark, sending out bright pulses of white electrical light. The creature cries out with a gut-wrenching scream and collapses to the ground, huddling up into a ball as it tries to cover up its mouth with its thin arms. Is it the electricity? The general asks, confused about what suddenly stopped the killer's rampage. But Dr. Ketter realizes it isn't the sparking power line that the creature has been immobilized by, it's the flashing lights. The general doesn't wait for his answer, though, and fires the weighted net from his gun, trapping the howling creature. Dr. Ketter examines the creature at the field research center that has been set up several miles from the village. A strobe light has been affixed to the inside of the creature's cage, but even when the doctor turns the light off, the grayish-brown-skinned entity still remains curled up in a ball on the floor. The doctor wonders if perhaps the creature is hungry, but it shows no interest in any of the various meats, fruits, and vegetables they've presented to it. The doctor stands in the doorway of the tent that has been set up to house the creature's cage and gives an update to General Machoy, who is anxious to get the creature moved to the United States and a more secure containment environment. Dr. Ketter stresses that he fears the journey might kill this creature, though, and put an end to the incredible research and testing they can perform on this amazing living specimen. The general turns to leave, but stops to salute the body of one of his soldiers being carried by on a stretcher. Dr. Ketter himself turns to go back to his research when he notices something. The creature's mouth is ever so slightly open. Dr. Ketter has yet another idea. That night, Dr. Ketter enters the temporary morgue and takes a severed arm from one of the dead soldiers. Back in the research tent, he presents the arm to the creature, sliding it through the cage bars. The creature doesn't react, but Dr. Ketter continues to watch and wait. After a time, the creature finally stirs. It's the first time he has seen it move since it was captured. The creature reaches out with its long, three-fingered hand and grabs the arm before starting to feed on it. You like that, don't you? Dr. Ketter asks, and bizarrely, the creature seems to respond, giving an almost baby-like coo. There's lots more of that if you behave. All I want is to study you, learn how you work. The creature continues to feed, starting to crunch on the bones now that all of the meat is gone. Yes, I believe you'll be good, the doctor says as he approaches the cage. You're going to make me world famous. Soon, everyone will know the name Herman Ket. The creature's hand shoots out from between the bars so quickly he never even saw it. Dr. Ketter starts to scream as it grasps and claws at him. A soldier standing guard outside runs in but a black point of light immediately appears on his torso, causing him to fold in on himself into the singularity. The creature drops the bloody Dr. Ketter to the floor, who reaches for the emergency strobe light activation button as another singularity opens up inside of the cage. The creature appears to willfully step into it before emerging out of another just outside of the bars. More soldiers rush into the tent in time to see the creature feeding on the still living Dr. Ketter. One presses the button to activate the high-powered strobe lights, which cause the creature to start screaming and thrashing about, trying to escape the flashing lights. Multiple nets are fired onto the creature, pinning it to the ground as its screams slowly fade back to whimpers. On overseer orders, the creature is moved to ADRX-19, a secure base located somewhere in North America. The site's director gives a presentation to a group and explains that thanks to the work of the late Dr. Ketter, they now know that the creature exhibits signs of fear and sickness when in the presence of strobing lights, and that it is unable to produce the micro-singularities that it uses for defense and teleportation when it is in this sickened state. When healthy, though, the creature is extremely dangerous thanks to its superhuman speed, strength, and cunning. 
it was also discovered that it is unable to teleport through lead, which its new containment cell has been lined with, and extreme security procedures have been implemented, including the installation of a reinforced steel blast door, and constant patrols of the outside of the cell by armed guards who are equipped with high-powered strobe lights. The site director leaves the room and the overseers discuss the fate of the creature which has been given the designation number 86243AR-001, though most have taken to calling it simply 001. One of the overseers argues that the creature must be secured and contained in order to protect humanity. Who knows how many more of these might be out there? They now know that the rumors of these types of entities aren't merely isolated events, and that there could be countless more of these anomalies. Hundreds, maybe even thousands. The rest of the overseers unanimously agree. One of them picks up the report that was left behind by the site director. Redact this report immediately and start a new document archive. This is only the prototype. I have the feeling there will be many more of these. A group of three Class D personnel approach the locked containment chamber. One of them is carrying a bucket and mop, but all three of them look jumpy and hesitant to move forward. An SCP Foundation guard walking behind them gives one of them a push forward with the barrel of his gun and they continue stepping towards the cell door. All three of them nervously stare at the heavy, locked metal door. Behind it, the sound of stone scraping against metal can be heard coming from inside. A second guard standing next to the door asks the three if they are ready. They don't answer, and the guard <laughs> starts to laugh. They never are. The guard loudly announces that, Special containment procedures are beginning now. You know the rules. Two maintain eye contact at all times while the other cleans. If you have to blink, do it one eye at a time, and announce before you close even one eye so everyone knows. The guard turns and starts to enter a code into the keypad next to the door. Each of the D-classes take a couple hard, last blinks, taking the last opportunity they have to shut both of their eyes at the same time before they begin. With a loud hiss, the sealed chamber door unseals. All right, eyes up, the guard commands. The door opens to reveal a small, dimly lit chamber. There are no furnishings and much of the metal floor and walls are covered in a reddish-brown substance. And there in the corner is what they've heard stories and rumors about. The thing that has given them nightmares ever since they learned that they would have to enter its containment chamber, SCP-173. Or as most of the staff in the SCP Foundation call it, the Sculpture. It looks so unassuming in person. Just a crude, concrete figure with a stupid-looking spray-painted face standing motionless in the corner. The three D-classes get another push from the guard behind them, and they enter the chamber. The two assigned to watch SCP-173 assume their position in the middle of the room, their eyes locked on the sculpture as the other starts cleaning the foul substance off the floor and walls. It smells terrible, like a mix of old blood and human waste. The two assigned to watch 173 pay no attention to the one cleaning, though. They follow protocol to a T, maintaining their vigil and announcing each time they are going to blink, even if it is only one eye. The third one continues cleaning, trying his best to keep his own eyes locked on the sculpture as he attempts to mop around it without getting too close. D-5933 does his job and doesn't break eye contact with SCP-173. Even though it hasn't moved, he can feel the presence of the sculpture, something within it, just waiting for him to slip up, to let his eyes avert for just one split second. They say that's all it takes. You stop looking for even an instant, and it's all over. With all of the fear coursing through his veins, it is hard to maintain focus. All he can think about is how dry his eyes feel, and blinking them one at a time never seems to be enough. He wants so badly to shut his eyes, to end their itchy, dry feeling. But he can't. Even with another watcher, it's too risky. There's suddenly a loud crack, but D-5933 doesn't move his eyes away from 173. He can see in his periphery that the other D-class dropped his broom and instinctively looked down at it. Luckily for him, there were others watching. D-5933 shifts in place, taking a step back and bumps into something. He can't look at what it is, but he reaches behind him and feels that it's the other D-Class Watcher. But wait a minute, why is he facing the other way? What are you doing? What's going on? He asks, his eyes never leaving SCP-173. What are you talking about? The other D-Class asks back. You're facing the wrong way. I'm facing the wrong way, you're facing the wrong way. We're supposed to be watching 173, what are you looking at? I am looking at 173, what are you looking at? D-5933 doesn't know what's going on and starts to panic. The one cleaning is focused on his task, trying as hard as he can to quickly mop up an especially dirty corner of the cell. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. 
It's the worst sound D5933 could have heard. Achoo! <gasps> a sneeze, just inches behind his head, followed by the sound of bones being cracked, a scream that was cut off too short, and then a sick thud as a body dropped to the floor. D5933 doesn't even have a chance to scream before a pair of concrete hands grab his neck and his own head is twisted around to see another identical-looking sculpture staring back at him. Ladies and gentlemen of the O5 Council, we have a problem. A senior researcher is giving a presentation to a group who remain largely in the shadows, obscuring both their identities as well as their reactions to his horrendous news. SCP-173, through means which we have not yet been able to determine, has multiplied. There's no reaction from any of the 13 figures seated around the large, curved table. The researcher in charge of SCP-173 waits for a response, anything at all. But after receiving none, he clears his throat and continues. We gave each of the new instances their own designation, SCP-173-1 and SCP-173-2. Two of the D-Class on observation duty during their regular cleaning of 173's cell were killed. The third was able to keep them both in his line of sight until they could be recontained and moved into separate cells. Again, no reaction from the shadows. But as you know, this wasn't the end of it. At some point, the instances of SCP-173 multiplied again, each splitting to form yet another instance. SCP-173-1 through 4 are all contained separately, but we don't know if or when another split will occur. The senior researcher waits, but no one on the O5 Council speaks or moves until the one seated in the very middle slides a piece of paper across the table in front of him. The senior researcher looks confused. He looks to the mobile task force guard stationed near the door, but he too remains expressionless, eyes locked straight ahead. The researcher, unsure of what else to do, steps away from the lectern and walks towards the table. He picks up the piece of paper and reads it. Object class, upgrade from Euclid to Keter. Orders, continue observation. The senior researcher nods in agreement, thanks the O5 Council for their time, and leaves the room. Lights flash and siren blare in the halls of Site-19. It's a containment breach. Facility staff, researchers, and site guards all run down the hall, screaming, trying desperately to get away. There's no hope for any of them, though. In a flash, SCP-173 instances appear behind them, snapping their necks and dropping them to the floor before moving on to their next victim. There must be dozens of them. Even as a guard tries to keep their eyes on one instance, preventing it from moving, another appears behind them. The staff of Site-19 flee for their lives, screaming for someone, anyone, to help them. The senior researcher presses pause on the video. The terrified face of the senior researcher who gave the last presentation is frozen on the screen. An instance of SCP-173 is directly behind them, its hands wrapped around his neck in a split second before his life was snuffed out. The new researcher giving the presentation looks considerably more frazzled than his predecessor. He explains to the O5 Council that following this horrific containment breach at Site-19, at least 61 instances of SCP-173 are now unaccounted for. It is still unknown how they are replicating, but worryingly, there is evidence that the process may be speeding up. He presses play on a new clip from the security footage, which shows what appears to be multiple instances of 173 working in tandem, some using their bodies to block exits, others creating choke points in the facility corridors. We have theorized that SCP-173, as we are now referring to the collective instances, may possess a form of hive intelligence. It also appears that this intelligence scales with the number of instances that are nearby. This allowed them to implement tactics that thwarted our containment efforts, as they used instances to block our containment teams from being able to pursue others. What you have in front of you is a proposal for revised special containment procedures. What I recommend may sound drastic, but it's what I truly believe is the only way to contain this threat. Each of the O5 Council members picks up the folder in front of them, bringing it into the shadows that obscure them. What I propose is that SCP-173 instances no longer be kept in containment cells, but instead placed inside of form-fitting metal containers. We can then use SCP-120 to transport the instances to the Foundation site on the lunar surface. The facility will have to be abandoned, of course. It's too risky to maintain a presence there, but each of the instances will be fitted with a tracking collar to ensure that we will be able to detect if any of them are somehow able to escape. The senior researcher waits. After a time, a paper is once again slid across the table. He approaches and picks it up. He sees that it is the same folder containing the revised Special Containment Procedures proposal. He opens it to find that it has been stamped, approved. 
Breaking news flashes across the screen. A worried-looking reporter appears as though she didn't have time to do her hair or makeup before rushing on air to deliver this special report. She explains that civilian deaths across North America are now estimated to be more than 500,000 people in the last 48 hours, as these still unidentified creatures continue their deadly rampage across the continents. It is unknown how many of them there may be, but the number of sightings has led some to estimate that there may be hundreds if not thousands or even tens of thousands of these living, neck-snapping sculptures. The reporter explains that rumors are circulating that the creature can be stopped by maintaining eye contact with it, but that this has yet to be confirmed. There is still no official word from the White House or from any members of Congress, and their current location and status are unknown, following reports that most of Washington, D.C. was overrun by the creatures earlier that day. The reporter suddenly stops speaking, and a terrified look comes over her face. Her eyes locked on something just off-screen. The camera pans over to show an instance of SCP-173 standing over a dead cameraman. There's a scream, and the camera goes back to the reporter, who now lies dead on her desk, her head twisted 180 degrees, before there's another sound of bones breaking and the feed goes dead. A woman in an SCP researcher coat sits at a computer terminal in a secure bunker, a large, jeweled medallion around her neck. Personal log of Dr. Bright. From the little news I've been able to gather, it sounds like SCP-173 has besieged and destroyed four Foundation facilities pretty much simultaneously in the last 24 hours. Each instance shows the same strength as the original, and thousands of them working together are capable of ripping open concrete bunkers and compromising foot-thick steel doors. I alone have been killed 37 times in the last week. They can smell me, somehow, regardless of what body I'm in. The majority decision of the remaining O5s is that this is an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario unfolding, and they're gonna deal with the problem, or else the Russians are. They're evacuating this base, which means there won't be a single Foundation scientist anywhere in the New World. They say they're gonna try to evacuate the surviving civilians, but I doubt it. There can't be more than a couple hundred people in all of North America anyway. I managed to make it down to a secure bunker, but who knows how long it will be until they're able to get in. I don't think there's any chance I can get out either. I'm running out of food, and I'm not sure which will get me first. Hunger, the sculptures, or what I know the O5s will inevitably do. Dr. Bright closes the computer terminal and sits back in her chair. She looks up at the ceiling of the bunker where the sound of concrete scratching against metal can be heard through the thick walls. A sullen and tired-looking researcher steps out of a room in the makeshift foundation site that has been established just outside of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He's holding a piece of paper and closes the door behind him, which has had O5 Council authorized entry only hastily painted on the outside. A small group of Foundation staff are waiting for him. They've gathered to hear what the Overseers have decided to do in the face of this world-ending disaster. The researcher looks around at his colleagues' faces, and as they make eye contact, any hope they had is quickly replaced by the bad news they know is coming. He begins to read. Revised Special Containment Procedures Containment Zone X-1, formerly North and South America, is to be denied access. Following saturation nuclear bombing, the number of SCP-173 instances has been reduced. All available Foundation resources are to be redirected to monitoring the ocean to ensure the integrity of Containment Zone X-1. Foundation adjuncts from national navies are to perform around-the-clock patrols and sonar sweeps. Detected instances are to be contained and removed to SCP-120 for transport to the Lunar Containment Site. That's it? One of the staff members asks. That's it, the researcher replies. Several of those present <laughs> begin to cry. There's nothing more they can do. Their homes, their friends, their families, all of them are gone. Killed either by the neck-wrenching sculptures or in the heat of a nuclear blast. Why? Why did they have to do it? One of the other staff who appears to be a former site guard asks. That's all we could do, another argues. There's much disagreement in the small crowd. No matter how they feel, though, this was the official order from the O5 Council. Their word is law, especially in a world where all law and order outside of the Foundation has broken down. There really was no other option. All they can do now is hope that the sacrifice of two whole continents was enough to keep it contained. That SCP-173 is unable to cross the ocean to Europe, and that they remain safe on this side of the planet. The group grows quiet, mourning the loss of the world they once knew. When the silence is suddenly interrupted by someone running down the hall, it's another researcher, carrying his own piece of paper. He tries to push past the group towards the O5 Council's door, insisting that they let him through, that he has important news that can't wait. What is it? demands the group. We deserve to know. 
The group wrestles the paper away from the junior researcher, and it is passed through the group to the same man who read the revised special containment procedures. He quickly reads the report. It's just a couple of lines, and his face goes white. What is it? What does it say? Comes a question from the crowd. A message from the North Atlantic Navy General Command. Verified sighting of SCP-173 in the United Kingdom. Nuclear bombardment authorized and executed. No survivors. SCP-173 has come for them. It's one o'clock in the morning on a work night, and the last of the bar hoppers and club goers have long since turned in. At the end of the street, the last bar is finally closing down for the night. Or it would, except that the bartender is having trouble getting rid of a customer. Sitting at the bar, an old derelict is demanding yet another drink. The bartender grumbles in annoyance. This derelict is sloppy drunk, and the bartender just wants to go home. Closing time, growls the bartender. Just one more, protests the derelict, shaking his empty glass for emphasis. I've got money. He laughs at his own words, his giggles ending with a loud belch that blows a cloud of aromatic vapor into the bartender's face. That's it. This derelict has been hanging out at this bar causing trouble all night, and the bartender has had enough. Get out of here, says the bartender as he hustles the wobbling derelict out the door. You're done. The derelict creaks and totters as he stumbles out into the street. The night's festivities are really hitting him. It isn't so often that he's got the money to burn, but when he does, he likes to spend it here. The prices are right, and the conversation is minimal, which is just the way that he likes it. The derelict turns around, fire in his eyes. He's raring to fight, and he doesn't care that the bartender is quite a bit larger than he is. Right now, all he can see is red. Don't tell me why I've had enough, he slurs, raising his fists as he prepares to lash out. But the bartender has already slammed the door in his face. Defeated, the derelict turns his back on the closed bar and starts a slow stumble down the street. Stupid bartender, mutters the derelict, turning up his collar against the cold bite of the night air. He wishes that he just had one more drink to warm his stomach against the chill. He's so out of it that he doesn't stop to think that the bartender did him a favor by refusing to fight. There is no way that the derelict would have won that battle. Even if he was in his physical prime, even if the bartender wasn't twice his size, the derelict is in no shape to fight. His vision is blurry and his head is swimming. In fact, he can barely remain upright. If he had any sense, he would probably stumble home and sleep this off. But the night is young and he's not ready to give up yet. He walks down the street, eyeing every storefront in hopes of finding another bar. Unfortunately, every window has a closed sign in it. He swears under his breath. What a run of bad luck. What's a guy supposed to do in this town, he wonders. Just when he's about to give up hope, he spies something glinting in the reflective halo of a street lamp. He stumbles closer to get a better look, and he can hardly believe his eyes. Finally, his luck is changing. Someone has abandoned a half-empty bottle. Well, hello there, little friend, says the derelict. He struggles to focus, but the world is spinning. In his confusion, he could swear he's seeing things. But no, he can feel the heft of the glass bottle in his hand, and he knows that it is as real as he is. Who left you behind? Who would leave a perfectly good bottle just sitting out here? He recognizes this brand. There's only about three fingers of liquid left, but that's better than nothing. Some people might balk at drinking out of a random bottle that you found on the street, but the derelict doesn't give it a second thought. He tips the bottle back and slurps it all down. It burns going down, just as it should, he thinks. He sighs in contentment as he feels the harsh liquid warm his stomach. Perfect. That really hit the spot. But what happens next surprises him so much that he can't believe his eyes. There's still liquid in the bottle. He blinks, wondering if maybe his adult brain is playing tricks on him. But he shakes the bottle cautiously and is rewarded with a telltale swish of liquid. That's no illusion. He takes another swig, guzzling it down. Normally, he'd drop the bottle to the ground and stumble on, but something makes him pause. He maintains his grip on the bottleneck and raises it again to take another look. And sure enough, there's still more left in the bottle. The derelict cannot believe his luck. He feels like he must have won the lottery. He's found a never-ending bottle. Already his mind is reeling with possibilities. That bartender really thinks he's so smart, he mutters to himself as he weaves unsteadily. But I don't need him anymore. See if I ever go to this stupid bar again. He just lost his best customer. Now that I have you, little bottle, I don't ever need to pay for drinks ever again. <laughs> it's the best day of my life, crows the derelict, raising his arms in triumph. He's barely able to stagger back to his home, a seedy apartment on the bad side of town, before he passes out on the floor. 
The morning sun rouses the slumbering derelict, and he rises with a groan. His whole body aches, and his mouth feels dry and parched. That's par for the course after a night of drinking. But somehow this hangover feels different. He puts that thought out of his mind as his mind returns to the strange, never-empty bottle that he discovered the night before. It's lying on its side on the floor next to him. He reaches for the mysterious bottle, only to find that, in fact, the previous night was not a dream. The bottle still contains just as much as it did the night before. He can't explain it, but the derelict isn't about to question his good fortune. He lifts himself to his feet and walks slowly into the bathroom. He's feeling a hangover like he's never felt before. His head is pounding and his throat is dry. His tongue feels swollen and sluggish inside his mouth, but he knows how to handle it. A little hair of the dog is all you need to help with the hangover. He takes another gulp from his bottle, but this time it brings little relief. And he notices something else strange, too. It's his scalp. The skin on his head has started to itch, and he can't stop scratching. He feels like he's got the world's worst dandruff problem. He should probably take a shower, he thinks. He strips down and steps into the tub, turning the hot water on full blast and letting it wash over him. The shower only brings him temporary relief. Afterward, as he dries himself off, the towels feel rough and abrasive against his skin. His skin comes off in big flaky patches, and his nails leave red trails in their wake. What's that? Is that blood? He examines his fingers to see that his nails have grown into ragged claw-like talons. With a frightened yelp, he bites them off. It's easy to do. Although they look formidable, his fingernails are weak and brittle, almost as if he's dealing with a sudden calcium deficiency. What could be wrong with him? He remembers all the warnings he heard back in school, when they used to march everyone into assembly to listen to lectures from the local police. At the time, he scoffed at the long lists of scary-sounding consequences of a lifetime of drinking, but now he's not so sure. It's probably nothing, he says as he examines himself in the bathroom mirror. His skin looks blotchy and infected. It doesn't take long before his hair and nails are out of control. His hair grows down to his shoulders, but comes out in big ragged clumps if he runs his fingers through it. His claw-like fingernails are constantly breaking and cracking until his fingertips are bloody, and his quick is itchy and infected. If his habits had left him looking worse for wear before, he really looks awful now. For the next week, he barely leaves the apartment. He pulls the curtains and keeps the lights off, afraid that someone might see him. When the landlord bangs on the door, shouting that rent is late and demanding that the derelict hand over the money, he doesn't answer. He waits. The landlord gives up for now. That's good, thinks the derelict. It will give him time to think, time to figure out what to do about his disease. He knows that something is not right. Many of the local bartenders are, by now, probably wondering where he's gone. It's not like the derelict to stay away. He's practically kept the bar industry in this town afloat all by himself. It must be something major indeed to keep him away from his favorite poison. Luckily, he still has the bottomless bottle to comfort him during this trying time. The derelict is certain that he's caught some bad bug, but he thinks that he can wait it out. All he needs to do is make it through the next week and everything will be fine. Sipping free drinks helps him to pass the time in a pleasant stupor as he waits for his health to return. Unfortunately, things are only going to get worse for him. His hair and fingernails keep growing, to the point that he has trouble lifting the bottle without his twisted nails getting in the way. His dry, flaky skin is changing as well, becoming thick and leathery and hanging off him in great folds like the hide of an elephant or a rhinoceros. His skin continues to grow, until the folds flop over his knees and gradually hang lower and lower until they touch the ground. Moving is harder now that he's carrying so much extra weight. He thought at first he just had a nasty bug, but he's clearly picked up some weird skin condition, and even this derelict, sodded as he might be, suspects exactly where he got it. It's got to be that crazy bottomless bottle. He can't think of another reason. Even so, he can't bring himself to part with this little gift from heaven. Even in his darkest hour, a few sips of liquid courage always helps to calm his nerves. He considers lumbering down to the free clinic in hopes that they might be able to cure him or at least tell him what's wrong with his skin, but he thinks better of this option. What if he's got some weird alien parasite that no one has ever seen before? They might lock him away in some government lab or something. No, he reasons, it's better to wait it out. He'll sleep it off, swear off the sauce for a little while, and maybe it'll pass. In desperation, the derelict drags himself across the floor, hoping to at least find some solace away from human contact. He locks himself into his bedroom while he's still able to manipulate the lock on his door. The extra folds of skin are hanging off of his hands and arms, making it hard to do anything. The extra skin is so heavy that he can't walk much, carrying all that extra weight. He lies on the floor of his bedroom, away from everything, and hopes that tomorrow, when he wakes up, 
this will just be a fading dream. The only thing that brings him solace is the never-ending bottle, which even now in his advanced state of decay, he keeps close by him. After all, he reasons, the damage is already done. What could possibly be the harm in enjoying a nice drink? A week later, his condition has not passed. The landlord is back, and this time he's not taking no for an answer. The landlord isn't supposed to enter his tenant's apartment without permission, but he doesn't care. He uses his own key to unlock the door and go inside. The condition of the apartment is appalling. The furniture is broken, the floor is covered with unidentifiable filth, and there's a rotten stench in the air. The landlord wants to throw up as the full weight of the musty smell hits him in the face. It's as if someone has been living in here without any ventilation, with all the windows firmly closed and sealed. A sudden noise from the bathroom draws his attention. Of course, thinks the landlord, that old bum is hiding in there. He thinks I won't find him. The landlord steals his resolve and heads towards the bathroom, determined to get the money that he feels is owed to him. But what greets him when he steps through the door isn't the derelict anymore. It isn't even human. The creature in the bathroom is a massive pile of ambulatory skin folds. The skin flaps have grown so large and cumbersome that the derelict within can barely move. They sprout all over his body, covering him so that he looks more like some kind of alien sea cucumber now than any human. The landlord stumbles backwards, screaming in terror at the sight, unable to comprehend what he's looking at. Improbably, the creature reacts to the noise, and a ripple of movement spreads across its surface. It starts to move, despite not having any legs. The landlord is so terrified that he doesn't notice the glass bottle that suddenly drops from between the creature's skin folds as it starts to move toward him. The same bottle, still with three fingers of liquid inside. How could something like this happen? What parasite or disease did the derelict contract from the miracle bottle he found? Sadly, this never-ending bottle isn't a boon, but a curse, and the man who found it that night became just another victim of what the SCP Foundation has classified as SCP-420. SCP-420 looks like a perfectly ordinary bottle of a certain popular libation, even to the point that it bears the label of a common brand. The bottle always contains a small amount of a mysterious liquid known as SCP-420-1. If this liquid is poured out, SCP-420 will always replenish itself. When SCP-420-1 is potent, it is physically, chemically, and molecularly indistinguishable from ordinary whiskey, although drinking will have an effect far greater than even the strongest liquor. When SCP-420-1 is poured out of SCP-420, though, it undergoes a strange transformation, eventually losing its potency and changing until it is indistinguishable physically, chemically, or molecularly from urine. Consuming potent SCP-420-1 instigates a bizarre physical transformation called SCP-420-2 in six stages. In stage one, beginning 12 hours after consumption, the subject will start to have difficulty speaking, resulting in slurred speech that is not consistent with normal alcohol inebriation. Their fingernails, toenails, and hair will start to grow at an accelerated rate, but also become brittle and prone to breakage. Nail breakage to the quick often leads to bleeding and infection. The Foundation has had some success in curing SCP-420-2 if it is caught when still in stage 1, treating it as if it is an aggressive form of cancer with radiation and chemotherapy, as well as a constant intravenous supply of Formula 420A09T-T174B. Victims thus treated have a 73% recovery rate but a 21% fatality rate. From Phase 2 onward, this protocol can slow the spread of SCP-420-2, but will not stop it entirely. In Stage 2, beginning 1-2 to two weeks after Stage 1, the subject's skin begins to show similar properties to those exhibited by hair and fingernails in Stage 1, becoming dry, brittle, and prone to cracking. As old skin flakes off, the subject's new skin begins to grow at an accelerated rate, eventually forming thick leathery folds all over the subject's body. Skin flaps growing inside the mouth interfere with speech and eventually render subjects mute, but do not appear to impede breathing or eating. Indeed, subjects in Stage 2 exhibit a renewed interest in eating, possibly because the subject's body requires additional nutrients and calories to build the increasingly heavy armor of thickened, calloused skin. Stage 2 subjects will eat anything that they can get their hands on, and many die after attempting to eat poisonous or inedible objects. In Stage 3, beginning 3 to 6 weeks after Stage 2, nerves in the skin layer grow uncontrollably, but no longer connect to the victim's central nervous system. Genetic testing of the skin in this stage reveals that its DNA has become so mutated that it can no longer be classified as human. It is, in fact, 
a separate and very inhuman organism that almost acts as a parasite growing from the human host. The skin may develop tumor-like growths, which appear to be analogous to human muscle and secretory cells. Hair and fingernails sprout randomly from the mass of skin. By stage 4, beginning 3 to 7 days after stage 3, the skin has become a mass of thick, leathery folds, completely covering the human host to the point that they disappear completely. The skin begins to exhibit random twitching movements, as though it is indeed a living organism finally coming into its own as a life form and testing out its new body. The human subject within the skin continues to eat, although brain scans reveal that they are no longer in control of their mouth. Instead, the skin entity forces the mouth to move by moving the attached skin. Small holes begin to form in the skin, eventually growing into narrow tunnels or throats that lead back to the now trapped body of the helpless subject. The subject is still consumed with a ravenous hunger and will eat anything that they can get in their mouth. In stage 5, beginning 1 to 2 days after stage 4, the skin begins to move in patterns indicating rudimentary intelligence. The skin, although still attached to the original subject, is now completely and distinctly non-human. It is its own organism. It can move of its own accord, dragging the trapped host along for the ride, and it moves and feeds much in the manner of an extremely large amoeba. It feeds by excreting a digestive enzyme onto foodstuffs and then enveloping the nutrients with its skin folds, again like an amoeba surrounding its food. The food is taken into the throats. These tunnels connecting the outside of the skin to the now completely subsumed host are now directly connected to the host's circulatory system and function as additional mouths. They can consume nutrients which are moved down their length by bristly hairs and further broken down by grinding keratinous plates before being taken into the host's body. Most hosts will remain in stage 5 indefinitely, although there still remains a much more dangerous stage 6 yet to come. At this time, it's unknown what factor triggers SCP-420-2 to develop into stage 6. Little information about stage 6 is available at this time, although it is known that it involves even more accelerated skin and keratin growth, resulting in a sudden increase in size and mass. Perhaps the most terrifying part of the entire transformation is that the host remains alive for the duration of the process, and sometimes even after SCP-420-2 has settled comfortably into its new life at stage 5. Mercifully, most hosts will have completely succumbed to insanity by this point, although some are shown by brain scans to still be self-aware and quite calm, perhaps fading into a zen-like state as they accept the inevitability of their fate. SCP-420 is contained in a storage locker at an undisclosed site maintained by the Foundation, and it is only to be removed from this locker by SCP staff with level 3 clearance or higher. It has been given the safe class because, despite the horrifying nature of its effects, at least it doesn't move anywhere. Samples of SCP-420-1 not in use by testing should be stored in the container marked SCP-420-1 Decon in Locker 1014-420 until they lose potency, at which time they can be disposed of as biohazardous liquid waste. Victims infected with SCP-420-2 are not contagious and should be contained in standard solitary D-Class secure confinement. On reaching Phase 3, subjects should receive double rations. Due to the extreme danger of Phase 6, any subjects who reach Phase 4 should be closely monitored for signs that the condition may be advancing further, in which case they are to be immediately destroyed by incineration. Knowing the fate that befalls victims of SCP-420 should make anyone think twice about drinking out of a random bottle that you just found in the street. Though personally, I think that's just common sense. A young man tosses and turns in bed. He adjusts his pillow and tries sleeping on his back, his side, his stomach, but nothing works. He rolls over to check the time, 3 a.m. This is the third night in a row he hasn't been able to fall asleep. He feels tired. He wants to sleep. But every time he closes his eyes and sleep starts to creep in, something happens. And suddenly, he's wide awake again. It's as if someone keeps flipping a switch in his brain to awake and there's nothing he can do to stop it. It's affecting everything in his life. He can't concentrate in class, his work performance goes down the drain, even his hobbies become completely unenjoyable. All he wants to do is sleep. His friends and family can tell something is wrong. It's as if he has become a different person, and they urge him to go see a doctor. But the doctors tell him there's nothing they can do for him. He's perfectly healthy otherwise. He should try some natural remedies like valerian root and get more exercise. He has no idea how many days he's been awake now. Four, five, 
maybe more? At this point, the lack of sleep isn't even the worst part. It's the hallucinations. Sometimes they're just a shadow dancing outside of his vision, but others are incredibly vivid, feeling more real than his now dreary life does. He had to stop going to work and class entirely since he can't concentrate for more than a couple of seconds at a time. His friends don't want anything to do with him, and who can blame them? He has uncontrollable mood swings and lashes out for no reason. He's tried every sleep remedy there is. He took the doctor's advice and exercised as hard as he ever has. But with never being able to sleep, he has no energy left. He's becoming a living zombie. He gets up out of bed but loses his balance and collapses to the floor. He tries to get up, but he can't. He'll just lie there for a while. He starts to drift away, and he readies himself for the jolt that always wakes him back up. But this time, it doesn't come. The wave of sleep that starts to wash over him feels different this time, though. It's heavier, more peaceful, and more permanent. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-966, also known as Sleep Killer. SCP-966 is the designation that the SCP Foundation has given to a creature that belongs to a group of anomalous predatory beasts, standing 1.4 to 1.6 meters tall and weighing roughly 30 kilograms. These hairless humanoids have an elongated face, a mouth full of pointed needle-like teeth, and each of their hands has five razor-sharp claws that can be up to 20 centimeters in length. Though unlike humans and apes, they are digitigrade meaning that they walk using only their toes. But you won't be able to see the horrible visage of SCP-966 under normal circumstances, as they are only visible under very specific lighting conditions. They can only be viewed under light that has a wavelength between roughly 700 and 900 nanometers, which is just at the edge of the light spectrum that's visible to humans stretching into what's known as infrared light. The only exception to this is if their skin, muscles, or organs have suffered from second or third degree burns, in which case, the affected areas of their body will show up under a greater spectrum of wavelengths that are visible to the human eye. Though frightening to look at, SCP-966 are actually quite weak physically, with very low muscular density. Their bones are hollow, similar to birds, and while their claws may be incredibly sharp, they are also easily broken making them unsuited for use in combat. Additionally, they do not rest through sleep, but will, at seemingly random times, stop all movement and fall into a rest period that lasts roughly three to five minutes, after which they are able to resume their normal behavior. With all of these physical shortcomings, how did SCP-966 gain a reputation as such a fearsome hunter? The secret lies in their ability to emit bursts of a previously unknown type of wave, Hunting either alone or in pairs, SCP-966 uses this wave to inhibit its prey's ability to enter any of the restful sleep stages, and also stops the ability to micro-sleep. These waves have been observed to be effective at up to 20 meters, though tests have shown that they can be blocked by post-transition metals, of which lead appears to be especially effective. SCP-966 hunts and feeds on medium to large-sized animals, which includes humans. And once their quarry has been targeted by the sleep-inhibiting waves, the effect is permanent, with no method having yet been discovered that will allow them to regain the ability to sleep. Experiments have shown that unconsciousness can be induced in other ways, such as with the use of general anesthesia, though these methods have ultimately proven to be ineffective, since although the victim is unconscious, they are still not receiving any of the restful benefits of sleep while in that state. The effects of sleep deprivation on humans, both mentally and physically, are devastating. Symptoms can begin setting in after just 24 hours that can include mood swings, memory issues, and sensory impairment. After two to three days, the body's hormones become deregulated, and bodily functions like hunger, thirst, and temperature fluctuate wildly as cognitive abilities start to dramatically decline. Hallucinations, paranoia, and fits of rage are common and the risk of death from sleep deprivation increases with each day that passes without sleep. And this is exactly what SCP-966 wants. After surreptitiously sending a burst of sleep deprivation waves at their victim, 
They will then stalk their prey until lack of sleep finally leads to total incapacitation, at which point SCP-966 consumes them. SCP-966 have proven to be both extremely quiet and agile when hunting. However, they have actually been observed intentionally making threatening noises around their prey, presumably to further increase their already elevated stress levels and potentially hastening their mental degradation. On rare occasions, they will even physically assault their victim to further degenerate their mental and physical health. Some of SCP-966's prey will experience especially intense hallucinations and bouts of rage, which is theorized to be caused by prolonged exposure to multiple instances of their sleep-stopping waves. Why some victims are exposed to multiple waves when a single instance has been shown to be 100% effective is unknown, and it's hypothesized that they may only engage in this behavior when especially hungry to try and speed up the process. Though others have put forth the theory that SCP-966 may take some perverse form of joy in seeing its victims suffer prior to expiring. Wild instances of SCP-966 have been found across the globe, and while the SCP Foundation has been successful in thinning their numbers, they still exist in high enough numbers to pose a serious threat to humanity. For these reasons, they have been assigned the classification Euclid. Mobile Task Forces IOTA-1 and IOTA-2 codenamed the Dream Hunters and Air Chasers, respectively, are continually monitoring for any reports of sudden or violent deaths related to sleep deprivation in order to identify and neutralize the remaining instances of wild SCP-966. Four SCP-966 specimens, three males and one female, have been acquired by the Foundation, and they are currently contained in a 10 by 10 meter room that is lined with lead and equipped with infrared security cameras. Each specimen is fed 20 kilograms of meat each month, and in the event that the female specimen gives birth, the new specimen is to be taken for observation and study before being disposed of prior to reaching maturity. You're on your way home from work after having just finished working a double shift. It's late, and the interstate is completely abandoned, no cars visible either in front or behind you. It's only about a 20-minute drive but you know you're going to struggle to stay awake, even in this old beater that shakes and rattles as it travels down the long, straight road. The rattling causes a piece of tape to fall off of the gauge cluster, revealing a lit, check engine light beneath. You grab the tape and put it back over the light, covering it once again. There, good as new. You turn on the radio, and it comes to life for just a moment before dying. You slap the radio and it blinks to life for just a second before dying again. You're about to slap it again when you notice huh? lights in your rearview mirror. And more than just a pair of headlights, it's a whole wall of lights. They're getting closer, and quickly too. Before you know it, they look like they're barreling down on you. But then they suddenly go black, blinking out of existence. Did that trucker just turn off his lights, you think? You have no time to dwell on the thought because the sound of an explosion suddenly causes you to scream in fright. It sounds like lightning has struck just inches from your car. The inside of your car suddenly lights up with fire and smoke. Has your engine exploded? What's going on? No, it's not coming from you, it's coming from next to you. You don't know where it appeared from, but next to your car is now a massive semi. At least, you think it was a semi. The smoke is so thick it makes you cough and you quickly can't see. You lose control of the car and slam on the brakes, but you can feel yourself going off the road. As the smoke finally clears up inside of your car, you can see the moon. It's at this moment that you realize you're no longer right side up as the car flips and tumbles through the air. You open your eyes to find that you're still buckled into your seat. You release the seatbelt and drop to the roof of the car. You crawl out to find that your car slid to a stop upside down several meters from the road. You look around and far off in the distance, you can see it. The semi that ran you off the road, driving at an almost impossible rate of speed off into the night. You look back at your car, which is completely totaled, and wonder what you're going to do now. It's late the next morning when you finally get back home. The police did not seem to believe your story about the magically appearing semi-truck causing your single car accident, but they did at least give you a ride back home after administering a sobriety test. You enter your small studio apartment and look around at the sparsely decorated room, wondering how you're going to pay rent next month if you can't get to your job. You go to the fridge and open the door, but there's nothing inside except for a carton of milk that's well past its expiration date. You open it and take a whiff, but this is too far gone even for your state of desperation. 
You close the fridge and lean on the door, trying to figure out what you're going to do. You're so deep in thought that you barely notice the mail being pushed through the slot in your door. You decide to go pick it up, even though you know it will only be bad news. And you were right. Bills, bills, and more bills. First, second, and final notices. You wonder if you've ever had a piece of good news show up through that slot in your door. What's this, though? The last piece of mail is a battered and folded envelope that looks like it's been used and repurposed many times. It feels thick and heavy, but there's no information on it at all. It's completely blank. You open the envelope, and your eyes light up. Inside is money. It's a stack of crinkled old bills, different denominations, all in a random order, but there's a lot of them. There must be over a thousand dollars here. And there's something else, too. A note. You unfold the creased and dirty piece of paper to see a simple message that looks like it was hastily written in black crayon. All the note says is, Sorry about last night. Hope this helps, compadre. You flip the note over and look in the envelope again, but there's nothing else other than the wad of cash. The apology note may have been unsigned, but you weren't the first to receive something like it, and you would be far from the last. The SCP Foundation, though, knows exactly who sent it. This was a message from SCP-3899, also known as the Night Hauler. SCP-3899 is a black Peterbilt 379 semi-trailer truck with an attached trailer. But as you no doubt have determined, this is no ordinary truck. SCP-3899 has the anomalous effect of appearing seemingly at random upon stretches of highway within the continental United States and usually at a considerable distance away from any other motorists. The truck will manifest already in motion, traveling within roughly 3 kilometers per hour of the posted speed limit, but it will not stay at this speed. Once SCP-3899 has appeared, it will almost immediately begin accelerating, and the speeds it can reach are truly staggering. Despite appearing to be a normal truck, SCP-3899 is able to reach impossibly fast speeds, and it's been observed traveling at over 420 kilometers per hour, or 267 miles per hour. As SCP-3899 flies down the road, it will attempt to avoid other vehicles and roadside objects, and has even been shown the ability to displace itself across short distances, which it seems to mostly do in order to avoid collisions with vehicles. SCP-3899 will disappear and then immediately appear somewhere else, though always within 300 meters of its last location. This reappearance will be accompanied by a thick cloud of dense black smoke that lab tests have revealed to consist of a mixture of diesel fuel combustion byproducts, volcanic ash, and trace amounts of unidentified human blood. The anomalous truck will only appear at night and will demanifest completely once it encounters direct sunlight or if it causes an automotive accident which it has done plenty of times. In one particular incident, undercover SCP Foundation agents working within the Virginia State Department of Transportation became aware of reports of a large black truck appearing on a particular stretch of interstate that had caused multiple accidents. They were able to track down and locate one of the victims of these incidents, a woman named Martha Lewis, who they soon brought in for questioning under the guise of it being a police investigation. The agents questioned Martha on her experience, and she explained her own interaction with the black semi. She said, It's all still clear in my head. I'm driving down I-64 on my way home and the sun had just gone down. There's no other cars and I'm about to take my exit when out of nowhere this huge truck just appears right next to me. There was a bunch of smoke, like it was on fire or something, and the sound was like a bolt of lightning had just struck right next to me. It all happened so fast. All the smoke clouded my windshield and before I could really process what was happening, I was plowing right through a concrete divider and into some trees. I think I passed out. When I came to, there were paramedics and cops. They took me to the hospital. The agents asked if anything happened after that, and she said there was one other odd thing. When she left the hospital and went home, there was a letter waiting for her, but it didn't have a return address. Inside was a large amount of US currency in a random assortment of denominations, with many of the bills appearing wrinkled and worn. There was a note in the envelope too, which read, I'm sorry, didn't mean no harm, for the damages, get y'all a new rig and drive on. Later foundation analysis of the document revealed that the note was written with a piece of charcoal on non-anomalous notebook paper. Now you're probably asking yourself the same question that the SCP researchers had. Just who is the driver of SCP-3899 that apparently wrote this odd note and also paid for the damages they caused? The operator of the truck, 
which has been designated as SCP-3899-1, is a very mysterious figure. Observers who have been able to get a brief glimpse inside of the truck as it moves past them at a rapid speed have described the driver as looking only like a silhouette of a slightly overweight male wearing the type of headwear that is typically referred to as a trucker hat. Some reports have also alluded to the presence of what appears to be smoky, tentacle-like appendages within the cab, though all further efforts to determine the exact physical characteristics of 3899-1 have failed, as the truck has proved resistant to any kind of outside scanning equipment. Most of what is known about the driver has come in the form of direct communication, though not in the form of interviews or any other sort of face-to-face -face interaction. No, while SCP-3899-1 has never been willing to stop and have a discussion with Foundation agents, it does seem more than willing to speak with anyone and everyone in its immediate vicinity over Citizens Band, or CB Radio, which is a type of shortwave person-to-person -person communication system that is popular with many long-haul truckers. In one particular instance, an SCP Foundation helicopter happened to be traveling above a stretch of road where SCP-3899 appeared. An agent within the helicopter began communicating with the anomalous trucker, first asking for their call sign, to which SCP-3899-1 replied, I'm a night owl and I'm coming in hot. I know y'all can feel this speed. After adjusting their volume to compensate for 3899-1's loud response, the agent asked if the entity could explain where they came from. 3899-1 answered with, I roll with the wind. My wheels sing sweet love to the blacktop. I'm filling y'all's veins with road salt and exhaust and the smell of burning rubber. Ain't no bother where I'm from. We all gotta live for the ride and die for nothing. I see, the agent responded before asking, are you hauling anything in particular? SCP-3899-1 came back with, Ain't you listening, girl? You seeing this? What I got is pure rattling salvation. 18 wheels at a time. When y'all's roads is choked, when the ways is blocked and y'all's speed is all dead and gone. I'm dropping this load and we'll all be drinking gas and breathing smoke. The agent didn't understand, though, and asked again who they were and what they wanted. 3899-1 replied, This is for the souls of the road, for the long nights and dead engines, and everyone trying to put that horizon under their wheels. I am the roar of hot iron. I am screaming freedom. I am the death of all barriers. This rig ain't got no quit, honey. I do not stop. Can you feel the rumble? Can you see the fire and smell the burn? I know you can. I can taste your heart and I know you want to fly apart with me. When the agent began to answer in the affirmative that they could indeed, quote, feel the rumble, seemingly caught up in the excitement of SCP-3899-1's proclamation, the investigation was quickly halted and the helicopter broke off from its pursuit. Following this incident, the potential mimetic influence of communicating with 3899-1 is under investigation. SCP-3899, being currently uncontainable by any conventional means, has been classified as Keter. Upon reports of it manifesting, all CB radio transmissions emanating from the truck are monitored by nearby Foundation listening posts for attempted contact by SCP-3899 to civilian recipients. Any individuals who are contacted are to be administered Class B amnestics, as are any eyewitnesses of the truck itself. All information about SCP-3899 is to be suppressed, and a disinformation campaign is active to make all reports of a mysterious truck that can appear out of nowhere and move at impossible speeds seem like nothing more than an urban legend. Just what is SCP-3899? Is the driver some sort of anomalous ghost, or perhaps an old, eldritch god, a manifestation of freedom and perpetual motion given physical form as a diesel-powered behemoth on the highway? Perhaps the answer to that question is up to you. Candace Hayes, we have thy confession. A witch as brazen as you shall be burned at the stake. The crowd gathered in the small room bursts into a cheer as the judge hands down the sentence. The accused woman doesn't react, though. She looks neither scared nor afraid, but simply resigned to her fate. No time is to be wasted in carrying out the punishment that the judge has decreed. A pair of constables grab the woman by the arms and take her away. A mob follows along as the woman is led through the town, taunting and jeering, calling her a witch, a wife of Satan, and worse names. She doesn't seem affected by them, though. In fact, she looks as if she can't even see them. Her attention is focused solely on one mysterious woman who walks along with the crowd, and yet somehow seems disconnected, as if she isn't truly there either. The two women maintain eye contact as the constables keep pushing the condemned woman along. 
They lead the woman outside of town to a tall hill. The ropes binding the woman's hands are cut, and she has just a moment to rub her sore wrists before she is forced to the ground and lashed to a piece of wood as another group tosses the last logs onto a nearby pile. Once she is securely tied down, the constables step away, but then another man wearing a hood approaches. He carries a large club and without hesitation begins beating her legs. The woman's composure finally breaks and she cries in pain from the cracking of her bones. The crowd only cheers louder at the screams from the witch. The beating has left the woman's legs mangled, but this is far from over. The woman, still strapped to the wood, is placed on the pyre, where she hangs like a scarecrow above the combustible material. The judge steps forward out of the screaming mob, carrying a torch. He loudly exclaims that for her crimes, she will be burned until dead. But the judge doesn't step forward. He instead announces that another will have the honor of lighting the flame. Another man steps out of the crowd and takes the torch from the judge. He walks towards the pyre and looks up at the woman. She is exhausted from the beating, but she lifts her head. She doesn't look at the man with the torch, though. She's looking past him, locking eyes with the mysterious woman who walked along with the crowd. The man looks angry, slighted that she won't even meet his eyes in this final moment, and without another moment's hesitation, he tosses the torch onto the pyre. The wood lights instantly, the tinder combusting and turning into a huge roaring fire. The crowd also erupts into even louder cries of celebration as the woman screams from inside the blaze. The man watches as the woman is lost behind the fire and the smoke, and eventually her cries too are hidden behind the crackles and pops of the flames. He doesn't move until the fire has nearly burned itself out. Most of the crowd has left at this point, having gone back to their homes content with the role they played in doing the Lord's work. As the constables pull a charred torso down from the wood and unceremoniously toss it over a steep side of the hill, the man finally turns and starts to walk away, a tear rolling down his cheek. The judge approaches and places a hand on the man's shoulder. There, there, the judge says, attempting to comfort the man. You'll find a new wife soon enough. Hundreds of people were accused of witchcraft in colonial America, and while it is likely that many were falsely accused, there is reason to believe that some were under the influence of, or were themselves, what we now describe as anomalies. And SCP-3998 is just such an example, better known as the Wicker Witch Lives. SCP-3998 is a human cadaver which dates from the late 17th century that is covered in fourth-degree burns and is missing its legs. There is also evidence of extensive blunt force trauma, but it is not known if the beating or the burning was the ultimate cause of death. At some point, the remains were collected and fastened into a scarecrow that is held together with wicker, nails, and wire. While a scarecrow fashioned from a cadaver is rather unconventional, what brought SCP-3998 to the SCP Foundation's attention were its other anomalous attributes. It constantly secretes a flammable liquid from its bones that primarily consists of ethanol and human fat, and every night between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., the corpse ignites. This fire doesn't cause any damage to the corpse, though, and it is unknown how it produces the flammable liquid or ignites. 3998 does not keep its flames to itself, though. It appears that the SCP targets those who have either killed or physically abused a romantic partner, causing them to catch fire as large quantities of boiling ethanol appear in their stomach. Their midsection will eventually melt and then explode, leading to amputation of the lower half of their body. The fire burns both incredibly hot and unnaturally fast, and is unable to be put out until SCP-3998 is extinguished. A number of historical documents related to the case have been discovered and made available to Foundation researchers that shed light on SCP-3998, including excerpts from a 17th century diary belonging to a woman who lived near where the cadaver was discovered. In the entries, the woman describes attending the wedding of her neighbors, Aidan and Candace Hayes, though Candace did not seem especially happy with the arrangement. Candace is characterized as someone who likes to keep to herself and who does not conform to the era's idea of a good wife. As a result, it appears that she became the victim of abuse at the hand of her husband. The diarist hypothesizes that Candace has brought this fate upon herself due to her behavior, which may stem from her being under the hold of the devil. In other words, the neighbor believes that Candace is a witch. 
Others must have had the same suspicion, because we also have records of Candace's interview with a judge William Stoughton, who questioned her about the accusations of consorting with evil spirits. Candace readily admitted to this, though she disagreed that it was in any way evil. She told the judge that the rituals and magics she practiced were not inherently good or bad, and that anyone was capable of using the same tools. She went on to explain that she hated her husband, that she had been forced to marry him, and that he had been nothing but cruel and violent towards her. Candace also mentioned a name, Clovis, that the judge assumed to be the demon that she had made her cursed pact with. Candace appeared to offer no defense or excuses for her actions, and the judge sentenced her to die by burning at the stake, with her husband, Aiden, being the one to light the fire. The story of this witch trial was typical of the time, and that likely would have been the end of what we know about SCP-3998. But another historical document was located that has truly given a new perspective to this anomaly. A sealed letter found in the cellar of a home that is addressed to Candace, though it appears to have been written after her death. The letter is from her secret lover, and describes how they collected Candace's burnt bones from the bottom of the hill before binding them together with wicker and wire. The letter then describes how Candace's husband has recently restocked his own home with gin, which is well known to be extremely flammable. The letter ends with an affirmation of the writer's eternal love for Candace and is signed, Clovis. But perhaps the best information we have about the origin of SCP-3998 comes from an obscure local tale that was passed down orally for years and eventually documented on an urban legend website. The legend tells of a woman who promised her soul to a she-devil who taught her magic but also offered companionship. When her husband found out, he contacted the local authorities and had the woman arrested. She was tried, her legs were broken, and she was hung up like a scarecrow before being burned alive. Her body was dumped off the side of a mountain, but the she-devil collected her bones and gave her life again. The need for revenge burned in the woman's heart, so in the middle of the night, she doused herself in her husband's gin, set herself on fire once more, and fell upon him as he slept, burning him alive so he could suffer the way that she did. SCP-3998 is currently held in a secure holding locker in Site-34 that is fireproofed and vacuum sealed to prevent it from igniting. Every morning at 9 a.m., 3998 and its locker are cleaned to remove the secretions of flammable liquid. D-Class personnel who have been convicted of domestic abuse crimes are to always be kept at the site to ensure that they are the targets of SCP-3998, which when it's not allowed to ignite, will result in them only feeling mild discomfort in their head and chest rather than spontaneous combustion. Due to its relatively easy method of containment, SCP-3998 has been classified as safe. However, recent developments have caused the Foundation to rethink this classification. Despite 3998 being securely contained, the number of arson-related homicides in the state of Massachusetts have actually increased following containment with many showing the same damage to their body as would be expected in a victim of SCP-3998. And while it may be that these are the result of a yet uncaught serial killer who simply happens to employ similar methods of killing their victims, a recent re-examination of the SCP-3998 corpse has revealed more troubling details. The body of SCP-3998 does not belong to Candace Hayes, and in fact appears to be a male who was in his 30s at the time of his death. Following these new revelations, reclassification of SCP-3998 to Euclid is pending. Whether SCP-3998 is the body of Candace's husband Aiden, forced to endure an eternal punishment of burning again each and every night, or if it's some other unfortunate victim of a violent and painful death, is unknown, as is the ultimate fate of Candace and Clovis. But with the deaths that would appear to be attributable to SCP-3998 showing no signs of stopping despite containment, it can only be assumed that the Wicker Witch lives. A young man is in the middle of one of his regular night jogs through the park. He loves running through this park at night. It's dark, the air is cool, and the sounds of the city that surround the park disappear, offering peace, quiet, and a small reprieve from the busy world. He jogs along a path that winds through the park and starts upon a section that is surrounded on both sides by tall trees. He follows the path around a sharp bend and is stopped in his tracks. Standing there, in the middle of the track, is a figure. It has its back to him and isn't moving. He's tall and so uniformly black that he almost disappears into the night. Whoever or whatever this is, he's scared of it. 
But the creature doesn't move, and neither does he. He's frozen, unsure of what to do, when the creature suddenly turns his head towards him, revealing a pair of bright, glowing eyes. The runner is so terrified he can't even scream. He falls and crawls backwards in the dirt, trying to get away from the creature. The creature turns its body towards him and begins stepping forward. The runner scrambles to his feet and runs. He's sprinting as hard and as fast as he can, adrenaline pumping, heart pounding, trying to put as much distance as he can between himself and that, that thing. His muscles burn, his lungs ache, but he can't stop. Finally, he's back at his house. He bursts through the door, locking and bolting it behind him. His girlfriend is reading on the couch and doesn't understand what's going on. After struggling to catch his breath, he tries to explain what he saw on the path, but his girlfriend just laughs. A giant man with glowing eyes? He was just seeing things in the dark. It was probably a dog, nothing that would justify the panic he was now in. The next day, he's left wondering if he really was mistaken. Those piercing, glowing eyes are burned into his mind, though. Maybe his girlfriend was right, and it really was just a dog. Yes, that must be it. His mind was just playing tricks on him in the dark. Even so, he's going to stick to running inside, at least for a little while. But he soon finds that he's having a hard time. He notices that he's running out of breath much quicker than normal. Is he coming down with something? He doesn't feel sick. But then why is he suddenly so weak? Two weeks have passed since he saw something in the park. No one he brought it up to, not his friends, not his co-workers, have ever heard of such a thing. And no one seemed like they believed him either. At this point, he is feeling sure that he really did imagine it, but he can't get that image of whatever it was out of his head. He can't keep running on a treadmill forever, though. He misses his night runs. It's time to get over his fear. He's running through the park again, enjoying the silence and the light breeze on his skin. He continues down the path, acutely aware that he's getting closer and closer to the spot where he saw that thing before. He can't stop, though. He has to prove to everyone that he's not afraid. He has to prove it to himself. He reaches the part of the path that runs through the tall trees. Just like before, the sounds of the city melt away, the only sound coming from his steady, heavy breathing. He follows the winding path and feels his heart starting to race, but he has to keep going. He rounds the same corner and nothing is there. He slows to a stop. Of course nothing is here. Nothing ever was. He really did imagine it. Or did he? Buongiorno. Today's file comes from the Italian branch of the SCP Foundation, SCP-015-IT, also known as the Boogeyman. SCP-015-IT is a humanoid entity that stands just under two meters tall. Its body is devoid of any hair, and its dark, black skin absorbs 98% of all light, making it virtually invisible in low light. Its head lacks a nose or ears, but these missing features are hardly noticed, because if you see 015-IT, its eyes are what demand all of your attention. While the boogeyman's skin is completely black, its eyes contain light-producing organs on the irises, causing them to glow in the dark, like a deep-sea predator. Its mouth contains eight pointed teeth on both the upper and lower jaws, and a long 28-centimeter forked tongue. The two tips of its tongue each have a hollow, needle-like organ that leads straight into its esophagus. More on what it does with that specialized biological feature soon. Physically, SCP-015-IT is rather slight, but it is surprisingly strong and easily able to overpower an adult human. Its skinny arms are much longer than an average human's, and each of its four fingers ends in a razor-sharp claw. It has also been shown to be quite resistant to physical injuries and possesses the ability to heal wounds and damage to internal organs at a hyper-accelerated rate. SCP-015-IT is primarily active at night, which is unsurprising given its skin's natural camouflage in the dark. The boogeyman hunts mammals, with humans being its preferred prey. But it does not feed on flesh. Instead, SCP-015-IT draws its sustenance from the adrenaline and noradrenaline produced by its quarry. Adrenaline and noradrenaline are chemicals the body produces to increase heart rate, blood flow, and provide more energy to the muscles in moments of stress, or in the case of SCP-015-IT, extreme fear and it has developed a hunting method to cause this exact reaction in humans. 015-IT will usually hide in dark spots, 
trying to keep out of sight as much as possible as it stalks its next victim. If it has been able to remain unseen, it will wait for a moment when its prey has become distracted so it can silently approach them. Once close enough, it will leap towards its unaware victim, grab them, and quickly bite them on the side of the torso, near where the adrenal gland is located. It uses its large teeth to anchor its mouth in place as it uses the needles on its forked tongue to probe into their body. With one needle, it pierces directly into the adrenal gland and begins draining the blood that is now rich with fear-induced adrenaline. At the exact same time, the other needle releases a mild sedative, allowing 015IT to feed and then depart without risk as the victim remains immobile. Another anomalous effect occurs when someone is unlucky enough to actually see the boogeyman. Roughly two weeks after observing the creature, the person who saw it will begin experiencing various detrimental mental effects, including hallucinations and panic attacks. Some will also begin to experience physical issues, most often damage to the cardiovascular system. It is unknown why exactly these mental and physical effects occur, but it is theorized that SCP-015-IT may use it as a way to weaken certain prey that it considers too strong or potentially dangerous. In 2011, the Boogeyman was actually contained, but not by the SCP Foundation. The Brotherhood of St. George's Knights is a secret order in the Catholic Church that was created by the Pope in the year 453 to either contain or eliminate all anomalies, and it was this group that first captured SCP-015-IT, which they designated as DIA-212 in line with their own classification system. While it was in their containment, they made a number of discoveries about the creature that they labeled as a shadow demon. First, they found that while it feeds on the fear of its victims by ingesting their blood, it doesn't actually require this to survive. DIA-212, as they call it, is an unstable entity, and feeding allows it to maintain its physical shape in our reality. In addition to its impressive physical strength, the Boogeyman is also quite intelligent, as seen by its ability to successfully hunt, attack, and escape from humans. Strangely, it also appears to be resistant to weapons which have been blessed, causing only a fraction of the physical damage that they should when compared to a similar, non-holy version. During the course of research into the creature, Father Ilardi, a member of the Brotherhood of St. George's Knights, wrote that despite the creature being repugnant beyond every limit, he believed that it had a gentle soul and that its screams are similar to a pained cry. He postulated that SCP-015-IT may have even once been a human before some dark force transformed it into the monster that it had become. He decided that it was his mission to find a way to communicate with the creature, and one day bring it back into the light and love of his god. Father Elardi was making good progress with the creature, and it seemed like it was even growing fond of him and his disciples. But his advances were halted when they were attacked by a group of soldiers from the Fascist Council of the Occult, a terrorist group that seeks to use anomalies as weapons in their quest to disrupt the social order. In the attack, several of the Brotherhood were killed, and in the commotion, SCP-015-IT escaped. Following this, reports soon began to come from the province of Caserta that described what sounded like vampire attacks. A mobile task force was sent to the area, and while 015-IT was initially able to make use of its various physical abilities to evade and escape capture, it was eventually shot with a transmitter that allowed it to be tracked. The Italian mobile task force was able to surround the creature, but fearing being contained again, it responded with a level of violence that it had not been thought capable of. Several members of the task force were killed in the line of duty before the boogeyman could finally be subdued. Today, SCP-015-IT is contained at Site Vittoria in the Emilia-Romagna region of Italy. Since this anomaly is both sentient and highly unpredictable in its behavior, it has been classified as Euclid. It is kept in a standard humanoid entity containment cell and is monitored by video cameras and infrared sensors at all times. Due to the light-absorbing properties of its skin, its cell and the adjacent corridors are painted white and are to be kept well lit at all times. Twice a day, SCP-015-IT is given a normal domestic pig that it is allowed to feed on. Any personnel assigned to 015-IT duty must undergo a psychological assessment on a weekly basis and, regardless of the results, must be cycled out after three months of exposure to the boogeyman. The store manager had heard of crazy customers, but this was something else. A mob comes barreling towards the store, visible through the display windows as they charge down the street. They all look crazed, much closer in appearance to rabid animals than human beings, 
frenzying, foaming at the mouth. A few of them stumble in their haste while rushing for the automatic sliding doors. Some fall to the ground, only for others to clamber over them, leaping like athletes going over hurdles, with all the same speed, but with none of the grace. To the staff inside the store, they look like a pack of zombies, all apparently infected by the same virus that had given them such a ravenous hunger. For savings! I thought Black Friday was a week ago, the trainee remarks as the doors slide open and the first of the mob spills inside. Welcome to the Mattress Madness Megastore, everyone. If you could kindly form an orderly... Within seconds, the trainee vanishes as a tidal wave of Madden Mattress Store customers starts to pile into the store. Each and every one of them is deranged. That much is clear, even from a distance. Across the store, the store manager watches as his colleagues are shoved and tackled out of the way, just from their misfortune of standing too close to the entrance. It's only as one of the mob wanders closer that the store manager notices their eyes. Both lids stay shut, somehow closed, despite the crazed customer standing upright. They aren't screwed tightly. It's clear this person isn't forcefully keeping their eyelids clamped down. Instead, they're gently sealed as if the customer is still asleep or sleepwalking. The whole situation was astounding. First thing in the morning, just at opening time, a horde of sleepwalking customers barged their way into the Mattress Madness megastore, moving and fighting retail staff as if they were all still awake and fully aware. And as if that isn't bizarre enough, it quickly turns out these people aren't here because they're eager not to miss out on great deals on their bedroom furniture. To the store manager's horror, the mob has come to the Mattress Madness megastore for breakfast. He watches an elderly woman, eyes closed, shuffle up to a luxury cashmere pillow top California king-size mattress and proceed to eat it. And not bite by bite either, not even ripping off pieces to chomp through like so much cotton candy. In a far more horrifying fashion, the old lady eats the mattress whole. The store manager feels his blood run cold at the sight of her mouth widening unnaturally, unhinging like a snake eating its prey. Except in this bizarre unaired nature documentary, the snake is a human being, and its meal is a perfectly good bed that moments before had been resting on a stylish ottoman frame. The same exact display of confusing carnage is unfolding all over the Mattress Madness megastore, people devouring entire Egyptian cotton mattresses. Some had even already devoured their respective meals and were already moving on to any accompanying pillows or cushions, feeding on them in much the same way. The few members of staff bold enough to try and intervene couldn't seem to wake the sleepwalking shoppers up, no matter how hard they grip each one by the shoulders and shake. Nothing could deter them from devouring divans and munching on memory foam. A sudden, terrifying, and inescapable thought cuts through all the confusion, striking the store manager with an even greater fear. The stock room. Behind a series of doors, marked with signs reading, employees only, are shelves upon shelves of new units. The Mattress Madness Megastore being a much bigger outlet means that there's additional inventory to replace any mattresses on the shop floor that gets sold. And more mattresses mean more food for the mob. The worry that these sleepwalkers might soon develop a taste for human flesh never occurs to the store manager. He hurriedly races around the store, gathering up as many of his surviving staff as he can, and urges them to help him defend the stock in the back room. Some are already abandoning their posts, ripping name tags off their polo shirt uniforms and rushing to leave the store. They aren't willing to die for $7.25 an hour. The Mattress Madness Megastore has insurance. It'll cover the damaged stock once the crazed customers have feasted on feather beds, but the manager urges them to stay. The store's insurance covers stock that is damaged in transit, not mattresses that are eaten by hungry lunatics. A few stay, using the manager's desperation to leverage pay raises and more annual vacation days in exchange for their help during this crisis of cashmere carnivory. With his resistance force gathered, the store manager commands the remaining employees to charge for the door at the back of the store, but some of the nearby mattress eaters overhear in their sleepwalking state. The staff freeze, uncertain whether to bolt for the stockroom and risk being chased by the hungry customers. They need a distraction, a sacrificial lamb to grab the horde's attention. And with a solemn expression, the store manager realizes what he must do. This isn't a fight he'll make it out of alive. He leaps up onto a twin inner spring and calls out to the crazed customers. Attention everyone, he bellows. I'd like to announce that all our mattresses are half off for the next five minutes. The crowd goes even more rabid, all eager to eat the pillowy pedestal the store manager is standing upon. 
His staff flees in the opposite direction, rushing to barricade themselves inside the storeroom while their boss meets a grisly demise, and the crazed customers devour every remaining mattress in sight. But what on earth could have possibly caused such a scene to unfold? What was the inciting incident for this unprecedented act of mass matricide, the Devon destruction, and combination carnage? All it took was one seemingly innocuous image, an unassuming online post, to stir over 7,000 people into a featherbed feeding frenzy. It's December the 3rd, 2020, almost an entire day before the deranged events that would soon unfold at the Mattress Madness Megastore. And just like he does most days after college, the student is trawling various internet forums in search of things to laugh at. He's procrastinating and, through inaction, allowing himself to be buried under a veritable avalanche of assignments, all with rapidly approaching dates that they're due in by. But he doesn't care. He can always do them tomorrow. As far as he's concerned, there's plenty of time for him to waste doing, well, very little. But no matter where he looks, nothing brings with it even the smallest hit of dopamine. It's been hours since he stopped checking the clock at the bottom right-hand corner of his computer screen, instead wearing out the muscles of his finger as it spins the scrolling wheel of his mouse. His social media feed is all the same, more doom and gloom, and despite his searching, he can't find anything funny to alleviate his ongoing existential nightmare for so much as a second. If anything, seeing every anxiety-inducing post about the state of the world or dour headlines of reposted news articles only makes everything worse. That is, until the fateful link appears in his inbox. It's from one of his friends at college, living in the dorm across campus. The pair of them constantly swapped links and exchanged memes over direct messages, sometimes while sitting in the middle of important lectures. So the student quickly opens up the latest message from his friend, pleased to have something to relieve the monotony instilled by the prior several hours worth of mindless scrolling. Sure enough, his friend's message sits waiting to be read in his inbox. It's just a single blue hyperlink with no additional context offered, nothing to indicate what the link is or what website it leads to, or even why the student's friend bothered to send it. They're long past the need to provide context for the memes they send each other. The link redirects to a familiar corner of the internet to the student, the deep fried meme subreddit. Just seeing that written in the hyperlink is enough to spur an enthusiastic click. It's like going home back to somewhere warm and welcoming, where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came, and where the student knows he's bound to find something to entertain himself. A deep-fried meme is usually a heavily edited image with a number of different filters added to it. Its contrast is boosted, the picture is oversaturated and distorted, all to the point wherein the colors are unnatural, and the image appears as a grainy, washed-out mess of pixels. And they're one of the student's favorite subgenre of funny posts. Opening up the link sent by his friend, he finds one such deep-fried meme staring back at him. It depicts a man, long-haired and wearing dark clothes, presumably a fan of heavy metal music. In front of the metalhead is a table with a chessboard placed neatly atop it. The pieces on the board are distributed in such a way that places the metalhead in checkmate, and his opponent? Directly opposite him at the table is a glass bowl filled with water and a goldfish aimlessly swimming around. And to top off this Louvre-worthy masterpiece is text, seemingly cut and paste from various different places, judging by the alternating fonts and styles. The words have been placed into a sentence that reads, Tell me your secrets, fish. And the student explodes with laughter, as if answering his prayers for some humorous entertainment to avoid working on his college assignments, his friend had appeared out of the blue and delivered a perfect deep-fried meme. But that momentary boost in serotonin levels quickly subsides, and the student knows how these exchanges work. This has to be reciprocal, a mutual trading of memes, like for like, akin to swapping trading cards in the playground at a younger age. And so he searches the subreddit for a token worthy of returning to his friend. He clicks on a search filter, sorting the results from the top posts of all time to the most recent posts of the day. These were fresh, hot off the presses, or out of the deep fryer in this case. And the newer they were, the lower the chances that his friend had already seen them. Scrolling through, the student is met with a few underwhelming attempts that weren't worthy of the prestige expected by the deep-fried meme subreddit. They'd be better suited for posting on R cringe. But then, it appears, the perfect, deep-fried, crispy, golden brown, cooked to perfection picture to send back to his friend. The distorted image is a photograph of a bed, specifically a king-size mattress on what looks like a polished wooden bed frame. 
although it's not easy to tell thanks to just how grainy the picture has been made. Whoever edited this meme knew what they were doing and has nailed the absurdist, bizarre humor that the student and his friend thrive on. A label over the mattress simply reads, King Size, and the meme is captioned in a classic top text, bottom text format with the phrase, A Feast Fit for a King. And the piece de resistance, the crowning touch that makes this meme worthy of the student's lofty standards, is the title given to it by the original poster. It sums up the meme perfectly, succinctly in three words, eat your mattress. The student erupts into uncontrollable fits of laughter, so much so that tears start to stream down his face. His stomach almost feels like it might explode at just how fine he thinks the post he's found is. Through giggles that hit like the aftershock of an earthquake, he copies the link to the Eat Your Mattress meme into a message and hits send to share the hilarity with his friend. Little does he know, he's just condemned his friend to the same fate that now awaits him. As soon as he falls asleep, it'll happen. And the student and his friend aren't the only ones either. The post spreads, either sent directly from one person to another or seen by those just browsing the deep fried meme subreddit and happening across the Eat Your Mattress photo. Not all of them find it funny. They don't have to. They aren't even required to share it, to pass it on to someone else and help the post spread like wildfire. They've looked at it, and that's enough. Come the next day, an estimated 7,000 people across the world have seen the same meme, and it affects them all in the exact same way, becoming a directive, a command planted in their subconscious, one that they will act on without even realizing. It's been only a few hours since all the carnage erupted at the Mattress Madness Megastore, but by now, the SCP Foundation has swept in and taken control of the scene. A cordoned section of multiple blocks under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak, it's enough to keep civilians and prying eyes away without asking too many questions. But as for the Foundation personnel themselves, they've got plenty of unanswered questions of their own. Two members of the cleanup team are reviewing the store's security footage, baffled by the sights of the chaos that unfolded there earlier that same morning. On the screen, frenzied customers are eating entire mattresses, stretching their mouths wide open and swallowing them whole. They watch as the store manager appears to make an attempt at a noble sacrifice to distract the horde of ravenous customers so his employees can rush towards the storeroom. But the manager is fine. Once the horde has eaten all the mattresses out on the store's main floor, they start trying to break into the stockroom out back where the other employees have used layers upon layers of cellophane-wrapped mattresses to barricade the door. By the time the foundation arrives, the customers have already forced their way into the stockroom and have devoured around half of the mattresses while exhausted employees try to wake them from their sleepwalking state. The foundation sees to it that everyone affected is rapidly administered with memory-wiping amnestics to forget all about the ordeal. Their next job is to try and track down the source of whatever caused this unprecedented outbreak of mattress eating. But being experts in all things anomalous, it doesn't take the foundation long to start pursuing possible explanations. Having already confirmed this wasn't a viral anomaly, their next course of action is to investigate possible mimetic causes, and sure enough, a common factor quickly presents itself. The mob that attacked the Mattress Madness Megastore, along with subjects who have engaged in similar acts of mattress eating across the world, all have one thing in common. Each one has been exposed to the Eat Your Mattress post on the Deep Fried Meme subreddit. It takes some deduction on the Foundation's part to figure out the cause, after all, the meme in question is similar to a number of others posted in the same subreddit. As a result, the Foundation's online detection software, or web crawlers, initially fail to flag the mattress meme as an anomalous image. Once they do, it is designated as SCP-5126. But with a cause established, the pieces start to fit together. The Foundation's researchers soon realize what the image does. Another reason it was initially missed is that its effects only occur once the subject that has seen it falls asleep. The student is one such subject who lived through this. He dozes off in his gaming chair well past the middle of the night, hours after he's first seen SCP-5126. While sound asleep, without waking up once, he starts to seek out his mattress, laying unoccupied on his bed on the other side of his cramped dorm room. He and all the others who have seen SCP-5126 then consume their mattresses, including in many cases their pillows, any cushions, and even plush toys. Their bodies stretch unnaturally to accommodate the meal, only to return to normal once they have done the deed. Having returned to normal, the student and the others like him remain unaware they've just eaten a mattress. But the Foundation is left puzzled. There's still one question 
that hasn't been answered. Their examination of the several hundred customers at the Mattress Madness Megastore revealed that the consumed mattresses aren't digested like food ordinarily is. They vanish without a trace. So this naturally begs the question, where are all these eaten mattresses going? Well, the Foundation quickly comes up with an experiment to find out. They place tracking devices inside of the cell of a member of D-Class personnel and expose him to SCP-5126. Sure enough, the meme takes effect, and once asleep, he eats his mattress. The experiment is going exactly as the Foundation planned. Now they can follow the signal from the tracking devices to pinpoint the destination that all the consumed mattresses are disappearing to. And after several sweeps of the Earth's surface, their satellites discover a ping coming from a remote location in the state of Montana. MTF Sigma-16 suit up, ready to head out to the location. This mobile task force operates under the code name Slumber Party, and it's up to them to investigate. They come across a large structure. It looks a lot like a medieval castle, but it has been built out of mattresses and large cushions. It's the ultimate pillow fort. It even has pillars and all the fortifications you'd expect from a real historical castle, all made out of even more pillows. The Slumber Party team enters the fort and quickly discovers that the structure is able to anomalously reconstruct itself. Sigma-3 kicks over a stack of pillows and plush toys arranged to resemble a statue and watches as it reforms after collapsing. The team ventures deeper into the pillow fort and is quickly met with humanoid entities that are also made out of pillows. An entity swipes a pillow arm at Sigma-1, but she ducks out of the path of the attack. Drawing her firearm, she fires, causing a plume of feathers to spray out of the pillow person. The entity is unfazed, and several additional shots do nothing. Even a taser is ineffective. The pillow entities are exhibiting extreme resistance to damage, but Sigma-2 has an idea. She grabs a pillow from one of the walls and uses it to bash the entity attacking her teammate Sigma-1. The pillow person collapses into a pile on the floor, inanimate. And just like that, the mobile task force has a way to fight back. They all grab pillows and make quick work of their attackers before they move on to explore the rest of the castle. Then they encounter the king. There is a man sitting atop a large stack of cushions, wearing a nightcap and pajamas, eating feathers from an expensive brand of pillow. Scattered around him are empty pillowcases. Trying to ignore the smell, the slumber party team attempts to interrogate him. He claims to be the king of cushion, obsessed with pillows since a young age. Their smell, taste, and texture inspire him to create a kingdom of plush, his masterpiece of mattresses. It doesn't take very long for the Foundation operatives to realize that this man is insane. They question him about how SCP-5126, the Eat Your Mattress meme, works. How is it able to make people consume entire mattresses and send them to the King's cushiony castle? And why? Well, the King explains that buying mattresses is expensive, so in order to build his castle, he's outsourced the gathering of building materials. As he sees it, he is offering people affected by the meme a delicious meal in exchange for their beds, spreading the world of pillows so he can gather resources for his kingdom. Suddenly, he challenges the slumber party team to a pillow fight for having tracked him down. The King of Cushion takes up a pillow in one hand and charges towards the mobile task force, armed and ready to do battle with them all. He is quickly incapacitated by Sigma-1's taser and drops to the floor defeated. Now designated SCP-5126-A, the King of Cushion is transported back to the SCP Foundation for analysis and containment. Their testing reveals he possesses no anomalous properties whatsoever, and the King actually requires his stomach to be pumped thanks to the copious amounts of pillow feathers he's been eating. The Foundation gets to work dismantling his pillow fort and moving all the components into storage. And as for the Eat Your Mattress meme itself, the Foundation's web crawlers are keeping an eye out for any other posts of the anomalous image. And don't worry, if you find yourself giggling at a funny deep-fried image that jokingly implies you should eat your mattress, the Foundation will ensure you don't remember it happening. And they'll even throw in a replacement for your swallowed mattress at no added cost. Now that's a bargain. If he breathes, the bear will see him. Lying flat in his stomach, the boy has no choice but to watch as the hulking brute eats his father before his very eyes. Lying in the thicket just a few trees away, the boy knows that any small movement he makes could prove fatal. A bear this large, hunting for its hibernation, will have no issue chasing him down in a split second and doing exactly what it did to his father 
to him. The boy is utterly powerless. All he can do is stay deathly still and watch. They'd found the tracks too late. On the way back to camp, they'd been following the wooded cliff that lines the ocean's edge. Bows and salmon slung over their shoulders, they'd been so proud of their catch and the prospect of bringing it back to the tribe that they hadn't kept their wits about them. By the time they'd seen the enormous prints in the dirt, the sound of lumbering footsteps were already echoing through the trees behind them. The boy's bow is too far out of reach. He dropped it when his father pushed him into the thicket. He's got the knife hanging at his side, but he doubts it's long enough to even get through the bear's fatty hide. In contrast, the only thing protecting him from its bite is the leather hide slung across his shoulders and a woven garment from the tribe's elders. One slash of the bear's claw, and he'd be… A breeze ruffles his hair. The boy's eyes widen in horror. That wind hadn't come from in front of him, but from behind, blowing his scent, his fear, directly towards the bear's nostrils. The boy plants his muddy palms into the dirt, staring at the animal. Its nostril twitches, then twitches again. It half turns its head, sniffing the air. Maybe it won't bother with him. The bear's turning back to its meal already. The boy lets out a sigh of relief, and a twig snaps. The bear snarls and whips its head around. For a second, the two of them lock eyes, predator and prey. Then the boy takes off running. Fast as he can, he leaps through the undergrowth, ferns and nettles whipping at his shins. He fumbles the knife out of its sheath and slings the water skin off his shoulder, throwing it wildly behind him. He doesn't know if he hit the bear. He doesn't have time to turn around and see. It's going to be on him in an instant. Up ahead, he sees sunlight streaming through the thick trees, the cliff edge. If he can just get to that, maybe he can climb down and… No, there's no time. Besides, bears are better climbers, better swimmers, better runners. All the boy can hope for is that he's a better jumper. Him and the boys from the tribe have left off plenty of cliffs along the shore, but never these ones. There are too many rocks, too many shallows. But the thundering of four enormous paws behind him is looming larger and larger. He can almost feel the bear's hot breath on the back of his neck. There's nothing for it. Here goes. The trees clear, the sun blasts his skin, a claw slashes at his back, and the boy launches himself into the air. The wind carries him, the weightlessness of wheeling his arms and legs through the empty sky is almost enough to make him laugh with joy, until the boy looks down. The cliff is higher, much, much higher than he'd realized. His momentum carries his torso forwards into a tumble. He's not going to land straight, and he can see jagged rocks everywhere beneath him. The boy closes his eyes and crashes into the sea. All of the air is slammed out of his lungs. His knee hits something hard and sharp in the water. A swell throws him away from the shore and pulls him deep. Without air in his chest, he can't float. Kicking hard as he can, the boy swims upwards, eyes still screwed shut. His face bashes into a sandy rock. No, that's not upwards. Which way is it? Which way should he swim? The ocean current rolls him over and over. Darkness fills his mind. But his feet find a hard surface, and he pushes against it, launching himself through the water, kicking as hard as he can. The darkness fades. Light. The boy's head breaches the water, and he splutters for air, rubbing the water out of his eyes. He looks around wildly. The sea has carried him away from the cliff and out into open water. It's lifting and dropping him with each wave, carrying him this way and that, like a flower in the wind. And there, traversing the cliff face, scrambling down the rocks, is the bear. The boy's stomach turns. It reaches the bottom of the cliff and sees him there in the water. Tipping back its head, it roars at an almighty volume, deafening the boy over the sound of the waters. Even from this distance, the animal looks impossibly large. It dwarfs the boulders that line the water's edge. It slips into the water, barely making a ripple, and kicks off from the shore. Going straight for him, the bear is covering the distance so fast he only has seconds left. With barely the strength to keep himself afloat, the boy knows he'll never be able to outswim this creature. Instead, he takes a deep breath and looks up at the woods, remembering all of the happy moments he'd spent in there with his father. A current swells beneath the boy and almost throws him out of the water. An enormous shadow flies through the depth beneath him. A whale? It couldn't be. Whatever it is, the shadow is swimming straight at the advancing bear. So fixated on its prey, the bear doesn't even notice what's approaching until it's too late. The ocean explodes. A blast of water as tall as the cliffs themselves shoots up into the air and showers the boy's head. Somewhere in the midst of the spray, a monster erupts from the depths. Snapping its jaw around the bear, 
It lifts the animal into the air and throws it against the cliff. The impact is so strong that a small landslide follows the bear's rolling body as it tumbles back towards the water. But the boy has eyes only for the monster emerging from the sea. Crawling up the rocks with one gnarled foot after another, the boy can hardly make sense of what he's looking at. It seems to have some kind of scaly hide, harder than the rocks surrounding it. A wave crashes against the monster as it leers over the bear and sinks its teeth into the animal's hide. Unable to look away, the boy kicks out and starts swimming away up the coast. Only once he's a long way around the bay does he dare to clamber out and back onto land. That night, once the rest of the tribe have gone to sleep, the boy can't help but lie wide awake in his tent. Without his father here, it's just… it's not the same. Quietly rolling up the high doorway, the boy slips out into the night. They're camped by a small cave with beautiful smooth walls inside. They say it's the cave of their ancestors, the place where all life started. The fire in the cave has to always burn. Fortunately for him, the cave is empty. The boy stares up at the wall in wonder. Finger drawings of animals, hunters, mothers, shamans, gods, and forests fill almost every part of it. Only one space remains in the corner, the finger painting of the rocky cliffs with the swelling sea beneath. Dipping his finger into the paint, the boy sits by the wall and starts to paint. A terrible monster crawling out of the sea, with a scaly hide stronger than any rock. That's it. You know that from just some finger painting. The archaeologist turns to the group of researchers surrounding him in the cave. UV lights are set up all along the walls, with the blue and violet shapes revealed all across the stonework. The archaeologist can't help but empathize with the spiritualism of their long-forgotten ancestors who lived in these caves thousands of years ago. The professor was the one who asked the question. A cold woman, standing well over six feet tall with a crop of fiery ginger hair. To him, she seems less of a scientist and more of a military leader. But what does he know? Walk with me, she says and leads him out of the cave. Personnel fills the surrounding area, most of them are armed. Cranes lift huge sheets of reinforced lead plating into place. Several mysterious vats line the edge of the forest, each adorned with more warning and hazard signs than you'd see in a nuclear power station. The two of them have to pause for a moment as three tanks roll past them. The archaeologist breaks the silence. You know the reason I started all my research in the first place? Did I ever tell you that story? Every early civilization in the world, whether it's ancient China, Mesopotamia, South America, Northern Europe, all these cultures, you take a look at their mythology and what do you find? The professor ignores him, instead choosing to bark orders at a group of agents talking over coffee. They all immediately dump their drinks and get back to work. What one thing do they all talk about, even though it never existed? Dragons! All these disparate people with no contact with one another, all of them still draw pictures of dragons. The professor stops walking at the edge of the cliff. The pair of them stand there, surveying the vast ocean stretching out in front of them, as researchers, agents, and workers rush around behind them. After a long pause, the professor asks him to proceed. In ancient Hebrew texts, when they talk about God creating the world in seven days, what happens on day five? The professor flicks the hair out of her eyes and replies curtly. God created fish in the sea and birds in the sky. Well, not exactly. Look at the original Hebrew. He created all of the fish that teem in the sea shore, but he also created Leviathan, a serpent-like monster from the depths, as old as the world itself. You think that's what we're dealing with? Maybe. Or something worse. By nightfall, preparations are operational. Enormous floodlights switch on, one after another, illuminating an enormous steel box with an open lid at the top, surrounded by armed agents, huge net launchers, and several tanks. It all seems a bit excessive as far as the archaeologist is concerned. He isn't officially still supposed to be here, but in all the scramble for the Foundation to get the capture site ready, no one noticed that he had stuck around. From the viewing platform several hundred meters away, he has to watch it all unfold through a pair of binoculars. Out above the water, suspended from one of the cranes, is an elephant carcass. The professor told him that the Foundation had even marinated it for extra flavor. He had only been recruited into this project a couple of months ago, but from what he could tell, it's been an ongoing priority for the Foundation for several years now. The scale of the operation of just setting up at this site is already mind-boggling, but they've been chasing up leads like this for years now. Arriving at scenes, they suspect this creature has been sighted in the past and setting up traps for it. He was only brought in out of desperation. The Foundation had exhausted all recent hunting grounds and was trying to cast the net even wider. He'd just been quietly working on his university research paper about ancient reptile drawings when the agents had let themselves into his office. But staring through his binoculars now, 
The archaeologist knows there's no chance of this operation actually working. They have floodlights for crying out loud. No intelligent predator would come anywhere near that elephant carcass. Movement. Not in the waters or any of the lit up areas. No, there's something in the forest line, just behind a group of researchers. He reaches instinctively for his walkie-talkie, then stops himself. How many times had he got jittery before and reported something preemptively? The agents already don't take him seriously as it is. He can't be jumping at shadows. But there it is again, a shape moving fast through the trees. He scans the binoculars this way and that, trying to find it. Just a group of researchers there, some agents there, supply crates, researchers, agents… wait. Weren't there more of them a second ago? He looks closer. Someone's gone missing. He clicks on the radio. Uh, South Lookout Team, report in. Nothing. South Lookout Team? A sickening feeling settles in his stomach. With all those bright lights everywhere, they're casting a lot of dark shadows. He has to do something fast. Running down from the lookout point, the archaeologist takes off running through the trees to the site. He holds his radio up to his mouth as he goes, trying to get anyone to respond. But it's hopeless. The thicket cracks and crunches under his feet as he tries to make his way through the dark woods, ignoring the feeling that crawls up his neck of being watched. A boulder blocks his way. The archaeologist grabs onto it with both hands and hauls himself on top of it, stopping for a moment to catch his breath. From up here, he can see the floodlit capture site. The tanks and cranes still sit rumbling ready to go at a moment's notice, but he can't see any ground crew anymore. He switches the radio to the open channel and calls out for anyone to respond. The professor's voice crackles back at him. What are you still doing here? This is a highly dangerous operation that you don't have clearance for. He yells at her to cancel it. They need to evacuate the site immediately. It's compromised. She laughs derisively and cuts off the channel. No, she has to believe him. People are dying, and more of them will if she doesn't… The archaeologist whispers to himself in the darkness. It's no monster. It's just an innocent creature. You're playing with a power you don't understand. It's strange. For a moment, he swears he almost hears a voice whispering something back to him in the woods. But when he looks around, he's all on his own. He has to keep moving. The creature could be anywhere. Hopping off the jagged boulder, the archaeologist takes off running through the forest once more, looking over his shoulder every few steps. The light must be playing tricks on him. In the darkness, he can't see the boulder he was standing on a moment ago anywhere. He bursts out of the tree line and into the clearing right next to the steel box. A ramp leads up to the top of it, with a large trap door suspended over the open lid. Well, if he wants to be seen and heard, that's where he needs to go. The archaeologist runs up the ramp and waves his hands wildly in the air. The tanks all turn their turrets to aim at him. The crane holding the enormous steel lid for the enclosure looms menacingly above his head. And there, marching out onto the field, looking absolutely furious, is the professor. Her red hair looks more like a ball of flames right now. We need to evacuate the site now! It's here! She snarls and marches up the ramp to meet him, jabbing a finger in the archaeologist's face. He suddenly realizes how much taller she is. You are not jeopardizing our one chance of catching this thing. Get out of the way, or I will have you detained. Besides, what evidence do you have? But the archaeologist isn't looking at her. Instead, his eyes stare in horror at the elephant carcass suspended behind her. There was a huge, reptilian bite mark taken out of it. A testing bite, like the ones given by sharks. She turns to follow his gaze, and all of her rage is washed away in a sickening delight. It's here. A scream from the crane holding the elephant makes them both jump, but by the time they look up at the cabin, all they see is a hulking shadow leaping away into the darkness. The professor clicks on her walkie-talkie and starts issuing commands. No one responds, except the tank crews. She tries again. Radio silence. Now the gravity of the situation really starts to hit her. Eyes wide with panic, she runs off down the ramp, barking into a radio and leaving the archaeologist up here on his own. Suddenly, under all of these lights, he feels very exposed. It could be anywhere in the shadows. Footsteps, heavy planted footsteps tremor through the ground, and out of the woods walks the creature. Several meters long, fat from all of its hunting, the beast that would soon be known as SCP-682 slinks into view. It looks up at him, standing there on the trap door over a metal box, and looks like it's almost ready to laugh at how easy this will be. Boom! The tank blast hits the creature square in the torso, knocking it sideways. Boom! 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 The three tanks open fire one after the other, laying round after round into the colossal reptile, kicking more and more dust into the air. Before long, there's a crater in the ground so large that it looks almost like an asteroid hit it. Smoke and dust fill the air. 
The archaeologists' eyes fill with tears. That majestic creature, roaming the earth long before mankind ever did, exterminated just like that. Cowards. That's what people really are. Cowards. But as the dust clears, a groaning sound echoes around the clearing. The archaeologist shields his eyes and peers into the crater as best he can. But there's nothing there. Boom! He wheels around and almost falls backwards in shock. The SCP is snuck through the haze and leapt onto one of the tanks. It bites and tears at the armored bodywork, doing all it can to destroy it. In a panic, two of the tanks point toward one another and fire, destroying themselves in the process. The creature rounds on the remaining tank and bites down hard on the barrel. The tank fires, the round going straight down the monster's throat and exploding inside its gut. The backdraft from the blast shoots back through the tank, and a puff of smoke trails out of the hatch at the top. And suddenly, once again, the clearing is quiet. Turning back to the archaeologist, SCP-682 slinks towards him, smoke still curling up out of his leering teeth. With heavy, thunking steps, it climbs the ramp towards him, stopping just short of the trap door. The two of them stare each other in the eye, predator and prey. Neither move for a moment. Then it opens its mouth. The archaeologist closes his eyes. Do you know that you disgusting creatures deserve this? He opens them. Did the monster just speak? What do they hope to accomplish by attacking me? He gulps hard. That whisper he heard in the woods, the rock he'd been standing on. They're scientists. Scientists always try to learn more things, understand the world better. We think you can't be killed, so we're there testing their hypothesis. The creature growls. The stench of rotten flesh fills the archaeologist's nose. It takes a step towards him, then another. The archaeologist runs. He'll leap off the other end of the platform. It's a big jump, but he could make it. The predator's breath is on the back of his neck. He jumps, just as the trap door gives way. With an enormous thud, the SCP falls into the steel enclosure. Before it has a chance to move, the crane unhitches the steel lid, and it crashes down into place, sealing the monster inside. The archaeologist lands in the dirt and rolls onto his back to see the professor, wild-eyed and cheering, up in the crane's cabin. He lies there on his back, panting and staring up at the stars. A clunking sound echoes through the clearing and the gurgle of a liquid flowing through pipes. He sits up, adrenaline still pumping through him. The professor has plugged a pipe into the metal enclosure and is running gallons and gallons of liquid into it. He follows the tube with his eyes, all the way to the enormous hazardous vats on the edge of the clearing hydrochloric acid. His eyes widen in horror. The professor laughs at him. Come on, cheer up. We're just scientists, that's what you said. Just testing a hypothesis. Everyone in this school knows to step aside when the goth girl is on the move. She strides down the school hallway, confident that no one will challenge her as the undisputed ruler of this high school. It's not just her dark wardrobe or her black nails and eyeliner that intimidate the other students. Her domineering attitude and sharp tongue make her feared. She brushes past a gaggle of underclassmen who wilt under her devastating gaze. Beat it, dorks, she hisses, jerking her head to indicate that they should get out of her way. The other students disperse instantly, afraid the chance really getting an earful. Her terrible reputation means that no one ever makes trouble for the goth girl, but it's more than just her attitude that keeps her on top. It's also all those rumors around her. The rumors started last year, just after a new transfer student arrived in their school. She was a younger classman who shared the goth girl's same dark fashion sense and sensibilities. Students even saw the younger girl occasionally hanging out with the school's resident goth population. But it was no secret that the goth girl didn't like her. Maybe she felt like this younger girl was homing in on her territory or even angling to take her place among the goth crew. Whatever the case, other students couldn't help but notice how the goth girl's lip quivered or her eyes flashed whenever the younger girl tried to worm her way into the goth gang's meetups. Then, one day, the younger girl didn't come home from school. The younger girl's parents reported her missing and organized a whole search party. The police spent weeks tracking down every lead, desperately looking for anything that might tell them what became of the missing girl, but found nothing. Rumors spread around school that the goth girl had something to do with it. After all, Hadn't the younger girl been her biggest rival? Hadn't she always hated the younger girl? And if anyone at this school would have had the chutzpah to actually do something sinister, it would be her, right? 
Despite all the gossip, though, no evidence ever surfaced to link the goth girl to the disappearance. The police even interviewed her several times, but she always denied knowing anything. Yeah, I didn't like that little brat, she said in the police interview. She was always getting underfoot and thinking that she could hang with us. But that doesn't mean I did anything to her. I mean, it's not like I would have really wanted to hurt her. The goth girl concluded her statement with a knowing smirk, as if she was pleased with herself for getting away with murder. But you can't build a case out of a smirk. So even if the police suspected anything, they were forced to let her go. Eventually, life at school returned to normal. Other than a few fading missing child posters still fixed to telephone poles around town, most students eventually forgot about their missing classmate. But the goth girl's fearsome reputation persisted. Could she have actually had something to do with that younger girl's mysterious disappearance? Now that other students thought she might have actually killed someone, they naturally found her even more intimidating. The goth girl didn't mind, though. After all, she already thought most of the other students were normie losers anyway, so she liked that they gave her a wide berth. The goth girl walks toward the end of the hallway, pushing open a designated fire exit door and slipping out behind the school. Today, the other goths are hanging out behind the school building. They nod curtly as the goth girl joins them. What's going on, losers? She says, adopting an aura of bored detachment. I was just telling them that there's this haunted game you can download, says the goth boy. It's all messed up. Like, the game knows all your worst secrets, and the more you play, the more it taunts you. Then, when you finish, you just disappear. The other goths snicker at the story. None of them really believe it, but it makes for a fun, spooky tale to help set the atmosphere as the sun sets. But one girl is more skeptical than the rest, to the point that she's almost insulted by how obviously fake this story is. What do you mean you just disappear? Asks the girl. The boy shrugs. I don't know. I just know that no one ever sees them again. I don't believe that at all, says the goth girl. That sounds made up. No, no, says the boy. It's 100% real. It's called the Book of Tamlin. Okay, sure, whatever you say. And who exactly is Tamlin? The boy shrugs. I don't know. Clearly, I haven't played it since I'm still here. The girl rolls her eyes. That's ridiculous. I'll show you right now. She whips her cell phone out of her backpack and starts to thumb through the app store until she sees it. The book of Tamlin. It's right there in the store. That just makes this whole story seem even sillier. She would expect that if there were a real haunted app. It would only be accessible via the dark web or maybe a strange glitch that randomly installed it into doomed victims' phones. But it's right here for anyone to download. With a skeptical smirk on her face, she punches the button to begin the installation. It's right here in the app store, says the goth girl. Any of you chickens gonna play? The other goths eye each other nervously. Sure, they were all pretty quick to dismiss the ominous story about this weird game before. But now that their friend is challenging them to actually play it, they don't feel quite so confident. The goth girl snorts derisively. She wonders why she bothers hanging out with these posers. They're the closest thing that she has to friends, since so few other students even dare approach her. But what does a bossy prima donna like her really need with friends anyway? She watches as the game loads up the intro screen, and then gameplay begins. She snorts again. The Book of Tamlin appears to be a hidden object game, where the point is to discover various objects hidden in a larger image. This is baby stuff, thinks the goth girl. Find the ten black cats in the cemetery! instructs the game as it pulls up a cartoony image of a graveyard. The goth girl's finger hovers over the screen, and she quickly taps it whenever she spots a black cat crouching behind one of the pixelated tombstones. Is this supposed to be scary? The screen fades, and an empty room with a pair of doors fades in. The goth girl intuits that she's supposed to pick one to advance to the next screen. Rolling her eyes, she selects the door on the left. The next scene looks familiar. Too familiar. It's a bedroom. Her bedroom, in fact. She recognizes the dark decor and the black clothing thrown on the floor. She narrows her eyes suspiciously. Surely that's just a crazy coincidence, right? She eyes the other goths, but they don't give any indication that they were expecting this twist. Are they playing a trick on her? Find the outfits that make your parents ashamed to be seen with you, says the instructions. She grits her teeth. What's the deal with this stupid program insulting her? She knows that her parents don't exactly approve of her fashion choices, but this stupid game can't know that. It's probably just guessing that any young person who plays a game will probably have had quarrels with their parents about the way they dress. That's pretty normal, right? Again, the empty room with the two doors appears. This time, the goth girl chooses the one on the right. 
The next screen after that is a picture of a pretty garden, and the instructions say to pick out ten pretty flowers. The next is a barnyard, with instructions to find five cows. The goth girl starts to relax. That weird screen with her room must have just been a fluke. Otherwise, this game seems pretty mundane. But the next screen makes the goth girl's face go as white as a sheet. Her eyes bug out of her head, and sweat starts to beat on her forehead. No. No way. There's no way that this next screen could be real. The image that appears is familiar to her. It's a real-life place. She knows, because she's been there. It's an image of a particular ravine deep in the local woods. People sometimes throw old garbage down there, so it's full of old washing machines and wrecked cars. Years ago, an old oak tree fell across the chasm, and now the dead log functions as a makeshift bridge. Sometimes kids dare one another to cross it. The instructions read, Find the girl who wanted to be a part of your club. The goth girl doesn't need to search the image to know what she'll find. She knows, deep in her heart, that the hidden object that she's being instructed to find will be a broken body lying at the bottom of the ditch, half hidden under old blankets and debris. How could this game know? She was so careful. She remembers last school year when that younger girl kept trying to usurp her place in her clique. It made her so mad. But that younger girl seemed to look up to her, to think of her as the leader of the group, and the one who she needed to impress in order to be accepted. That was good. The goth girl knew she could use that to her advantage. She told the younger girl to meet her in the woods, by the old ravine, late at night. Of course, it was nothing sinister. It was just for a little initiation test to prove that the younger girl could take her place as part of their gang. The younger girl was only too excited for her test. The goth girl was waiting at the ravine when her younger rival finally arrived. I came as fast as I could, said the younger girl. What do you need me to do? Listen, I see how you want to hang out with us, said the goth girl. But you have to prove yourself if you want to be part of our group. But you have to understand, us goths, we embrace the darkness. We're not scared of the void. We only take the coolest and the bravest, the kids who aren't afraid of death. So you have to show me that you're willing to look eternity in the eye. All you have to do to join us is to cross this ravine over that log over there. She pointed at the fallen log. The younger girl looked frightened, but she nodded. The goth girl half expected her to turn tail and run home, but she was surprised to see her rival make her way toward the log. Maybe she wasn't as much of a poser as the goth girl thought. The goth girl didn't mean for anything bad to happen. She really only wanted to scare the younger girl. Maybe she could freak her out enough that she wouldn't want to hang out with them anymore, and then she wouldn't have to deal with that little pest anymore. The younger girl clambers up atop the log and slowly starts walking across the deep gorge, carefully placing one foot in front of the other. But the peeling bark of the old log is more slippery than it looks, and it's hard to keep her footing in the dark. The younger girl makes it almost halfway across the ravine before she loses her footing. With a yelp, she lurches to the side and falls down the slope, tumbling head over heels and landing amongst the garbage with a sickening crunch. The goth girl screamed in shock. She stared down in the ravine, seeing the younger girl lying still at the bottom, her neck bent at an impossible angle. It was obvious that the fall had killed her instantly. The goth girl knew she was in trouble. Or was she? Nobody knew she was out here. Nobody knew that she'd asked the younger girl to meet her here. All she had to do was keep her mouth shut, and nobody could pin this on her. The plan worked. She worked out her alibi and stuck to it during all the police interviews, never deviating, practicing her story until it sounded natural. The cops fell for it, clearing her as a suspect before moving on in their investigation. For a whole year, she had carried this terrible secret. Of course, it got easier over time. She gradually convinced herself that the whole thing was a terrible accident. It couldn't have been prevented. She had nothing to feel guilty about. And yet, somehow, this game knew. This game knew exactly what she had done. The phone slips from her palsied fingers and drops to the ground. The other goths look at her in confusion. They've never seen their leader in such a state of terror. What could have spooked her so bad? Which of you made this dumb game? She snaps. It must have been one of you. Fess up. We don't know what you're talking about, says the goth boy. I already told you, it's supposed to be haunted and... I don't know what you think you know, but you don't know anything, shouts the goth girl, hysterical in her fear. Has she been found out? Was this entire game just an elaborate ruse to trick her into confessing her guilt? Well, she's not going to fall for it. She's still the queen boss of this school, and if any of these losers think that they can knock her off her perch with a silly game, they're dead wrong. What do you mean we don't know anything? The other goths are murmuring amongst themselves. Of course, they'd heard the rumors about their leader as well, but they never really gave them much credence. 
She may be a little sharp, but that doesn't make her capable of murder. But the way that this game had freaked her out so much is really beginning to make them wonder. The goth girl is frantic now, seeing her control slip away as the other kids begin to mull the possibilities. She can't believe this. She wonders desperately if someone was there that night to see the whole terrible accident play out. Or maybe she let something slip without knowing. What other explanation could there possibly be? I'm out of here. Leave me alone. Don't follow me, she yells as she stomps away. The other goths don't make any move to follow, intimidated by the wrath of their leader. But when the goth girl throws open the door to head back inside the school, she's confronted with an unexpected sight. Instead of the long gray hallway lined with lockers that she expected, she instead sees a single empty room. It couldn't be, but it looks exactly like the empty room from the game, the one that she glimpsed between levels. This isn't supposed to be here, she cries. Behind her, the other goths stare in confusion. They too recognize the room from the game, but they can't figure out for the life of them how it's managed to appear in real life. What's going on? Is her guilty mind playing tricks on her? No, that can't be. The reaction of the other goths shows that they see it too. She doesn't think she can trust her senses, but she also feels an overwhelming urge to step into that empty room. Don't go in, calls the goth boy, but it's too late. Internally, her rational mind is screaming at her to stay out, but she can't control her feet. She steps inside, and the door swings closed behind her. The goth boy runs to the door and yanks it open, hoping to help his terrified friend. But beyond the door, he sees nothing but the ordinary hallway that's always been there. The mysterious empty room is nowhere to be seen, and the goth girl has completely vanished with it. Not many people would say that SCP-1590, better known as the Book of Tamlin, is any fun. SCP-1590 is a downloadable app that has been designated as Euclid, and seven copies of the game are currently held by the Foundation in a containment locker for experimentation purposes. Whenever the Foundation discovers new instances of SCP-1590, information technicians initiate an immediate DDoS attack on the hosting server, and an MTF is to be sent in to appropriate all hardware. Any systems that were able to download copies of the game before the DDoS attack should be infected with the COM-AMA computer virus to prevent unwitting innocents from playing the game. SCP-1590 is a one kilobyte program or application designed for use with touchscreen hardware such as tablets. Attempts to view SCP-1590's coding reveal only the numbers 1 through 66,666 in numerical order, but on the front end, SCP-1590 plays as a mostly ordinary video game in the hidden object puzzle genre. Like other hidden object puzzle games, the player is given a list of objects that they must find in a scene within an allotted amount of time. What makes SCP-1590 unusual, though? is that as the game progresses, the scenes and hidden objects become more personal to the player, often referencing traumatic or unsettling events from the player's life. It is not known how SCP-1590 is able to gain such intimate knowledge of a player, but since some players report that SCP-1590 seems privy to personal secrets that have never been revealed to another person, it is unlikely that it's just due to very good research on the part of the game's designers. The game always begins with the same dedication screen, containing the message, To Joey, who taught me how to be cool. The dedication continues, listing another name who almost made it out. The second name changes with every playthrough, but it is always the name of the previous person to play the game. The dedication screen is followed by an animated cutscene with a humanoid silhouette standing on the deck of what appears to be an oil tanker. The screen turns bright white, then returns to the oil tanker. A yellow wall, larger than the ship, has been added to the scene. The wall's appearance causes a wave to crash over the ship, waving the humanoid overboard. The screen fills with bubbles, and the words, The Book of Tamlin and Start Game appear overhead on the bubbles. The significance of this animated sequence, as well as the title, The Book of Tamlin, if any, is currently unknown. When a player chooses Start Game, the title screen fades into an image of a cluttered room. The user is presented with a series of tasks, directing them to find objects hidden in the room image. The allotted time to find every object in a scene ranges from 1 to 12 minutes. Once the user finds every object in a scene, a set of doors appear on screen, and the player must choose one to progress in the game. The game continues through a random number of screens, labeled from 7 to 43. Eventually, if the user fails to find all objects in a scene within the time limit, the next scene will be an empty room. The words, you've found out everything there is to find about the house, now all you have left to find is the way out, appear on the screen. At this point, the game ends and cannot be replayed by the same user. 
The actual length of the game appears to vary from player to player, but even players who appear to win the game, always finding all hidden objects within the time limit, will eventually be shown the same end screen and receive the same message. As strange as the game is, what happens next is even stranger. Within 72 hours of completing the game, whether a player has ostensibly won or lost, the player will encounter the final room from the game in real life. They will find that some ordinary door, possibly in their home or workplace, no longer leads to the room it should lead to, but instead leads to the empty room from the end of the game. If someone other than the player attempts to pass through the door, they will find themselves not in the empty room from the game, but instead in the room that the door normally leads to. If the player passes through the door, though, they disappear into the empty room. Any tracking devices cease to transmit after the user passes through the doorway. The Foundation currently has no idea who or what is behind SCP-1590 or how the game manages to access users' memories. It's also not clear what purpose the game solves, whether it's intended as a therapy device to help subjects work through hidden trauma or as an instrument of justice to punish wrongdoing. Either way, you might want to make sure you have a clean conscience before you download any new mysterious games for your phone. You never know when you might find yourself confronting the Book of Tamlin. It's not every day that the SCP Foundation opens a brand new site and appoints a new site director, but today is one of those days. Work is about to begin at Site 41, and a respected senior researcher has been appointed director of the brand new site. He hasn't been told much about it yet, but he knows a few things for certain. Some sort of new, highly volatile anomaly was discovered, a site was constructed around it, and his many years of loyalty to the organization have finally been rewarded with a promotion. As he takes his morning shower, his mind races, turning over the possibilities that this new chapter might bring. Is he up to the potential challenges? Just how dangerous is this new anomaly? What could possibly necessitate the building of a brand new site just to contain it? Whatever it is, these years of securing, containing, and protecting have prepared him. He's seen bizarre creatures, cursed places, and objects that defy the laws of physics. Whatever awaits him in his new position, he can handle it. He rinses the shampoo from his hair, letting his jitters flow down the drain with it, and switches off the water. He climbs out of the shower and turns to the foggy mirror. He sweeps a palm across the glass and meets his reflection's eyes. His serious expression catches him off guard, and he can't help but let his mind wander back to someone else who looked at him that way, with those stony gray eyes such a long time ago. He and his brother had never gotten along. Though they shared the same face, the same hair, and the same eyes, they couldn't have been more different. He was the screw-up, the one who couldn't focus in class and was always bumbling through life like a bull in a china shop. His brother was the golden boy, the star student who could do no wrong. As the boys got older, he tried to climb out of his brother's shadow and tried to live up to their parents' expectations, but anything he did, his brother could do better. He got into a great college, his brother got into Harvard. He got a job, his brother got a more impressive one. He got a Honda, his brother got a Mercedes. He fell in love with a girl, and his brother married her. It seemed like he would never stand on his own, never be anything but the lesser version of a perfect man, a nasty little homunculus who just happened to be wearing the graven image of something greater than himself. On the night of his brother's wedding, the festering resentment had finally come to the surface. He remembers the night in bits and pieces, a harsh word, a fifth drink, a broken champagne glass. His brother said something that went too far, cut too deep. Without thinking, he shoved him, just a bit too hard. He watched his brother fall, watched his head hit the corner of the table, and then he was still, silent. He thought about turning himself in, but then another thought crossed his mind. Why ruin two futures at once? His brother was gone, there was no coming back from that. Should he really spend the rest of his life in prison over a tragic mistake? It didn't seem fair. Instead, he planned. For once, he was grateful for the similarities between him and his brother, their handwriting, for instance. He forged a note to his brother's new bride, telling her that he couldn't take the pressures of his life anymore. He was leaving, fleeing to Europe to start a new life, with a new name, and leaving all of his old ties behind. Then he packed his brother's body, the one that looked so much like his own, into a suitcase. He drove out into the woods, to a place they had once gotten lost as children, and he buried it so deep, no one would ever find it. He'd never forget how he felt that night, laboring away in the dark forest, face an unpleasant mess of snot and tears, the end of his shovel piercing the dirt again and again, until he'd made a big enough hole to consign the case that now held his own brother's mangled body. 
Every shovel full of dirt that he piled back on, hiding his sin, felt heavier than the last. What had he done? What the hell had he done? But by the time the grim deed was concluded, rationalizations had smoothed out the hard edges of his crime. There were a million reasons this was okay. This was justified. It was an accident, of course, that much was clear. But didn't his brother also have it coming, for flaunting his perfect life in his face for all these years? And who was the worthless chunk of dead meat now? The scales were balanced once more. No one would ever know what he did. No one but him, in those moments where he could see his brother in the mirror, reminding him of his greatest shame, no matter how hard he tried to forget. But that moment is long gone. He's back in the present now, grounding himself with a splash of cold water on his face. He shakes off the memories and dresses for the day. It's time to get to work. When he arrives at the facility, he's shocked by what he sees. It's a castle, grand and imposing, even if the years have not been particularly kind to it. The Foundation did not build this structure, though they've set up shop inside now. His reminiscence has made him late, and he hasn't even had a chance to look over his paperwork yet. But when you're a site director, what does it even matter if you're a little late? You're the boss, the head honcho. The party doesn't start until you walk in. Just the thought of it is enough to make his chest swell with pride. He will have to ask someone to fill him in, an eager subordinate who won't mind going over the basics of the new facility and what they are here to study. Like clockwork, a young assistant researcher scurries up to him, holding a clipboard and practically vibrating with energy. She clearly hasn't been working here long. There's still light behind her eyes. He thinks to himself, The things you see here will snuff that out soon enough, my dear. The assistant researcher leads him inside the castle, its guts ripped out and replaced with sleek modern technology. A stone staircase has been swapped out for a row of elevators, marble busts exchanged for security cameras and monitors. They enter one of the elevators and the assistant presses the button for the lowest possible floor. They are going deep into the bowels of the castle, into the belly of the great beast. With a ding, the doors open and they step out. The air down here has a peculiar smell, musty and dull, with a sharp metallic tang of dried blood. Along the wall, he can see a row of prison cells, eight of them to be precise, all shut tight. They're rusted and old, they've been here for quite some time. The Foundation didn't put these here. Of course, he realizes with a sinking feeling in his stomach that he can't quite explain, these cells themselves must be the anomaly he's here to supervise the containment of. He should have read the file before arriving, shouldn't have let himself get distracted, then he would know what he's walking into. So here we are, the assistant chirps, startling the man. He had almost forgotten she was standing next to him. Shall I give you the grand tour? She won't last long here with such a chipper attitude, he thinks, but he nods just the same. She walks ahead of him, referring dutifully to her clipboard as she goes. This is the first cell. As you can see, all of them are currently inactive. We'll be performing some tests later, though, and you'll hopefully get to see them in action. It's really something. She continues walking to the second cell. There are a lot of potential applications for this anomaly that, once we understand it, could be incredibly promising. He's only half listening as he trails behind her. As they near the third cell, the assistant glances back at him. I really look forward to working with you, sir. I've heard such great things. He opens his mouth to brush off the praise, to feign humility for her sake. When a sound startles him, the grind of metal against metal, the screech of a long disused door, the third cell is opening on its own. The assistant flips through her notes, growing pale. This isn't supposed to happen. This shouldn't be happening. She stammers, but he barely hears a word. He's staring, transfixed, at the darkness within. There's a rattling sound, like chains being dragged across a stone floor. What is about to be unleashed from this prison? He braces himself, remembering all of the near-death experiences he's faced down in the past. Nothing could prepare him for what finally appears. A pair of iron shackles, attached to lengths of chain, shoot out from the shadows, headed right for him. A shackle clamps suddenly around each of his wrists, the cold metal tight enough to cut off the circulation, digging into his skin. Then, an invisible force on the other end of the chains begins to pull. He fights it, the shackles cutting into him as the assistant screams for help, but his efforts are futile. Whatever wants to pull him closer, whatever is trying to lock him away, it's far stronger than he could ever be. The chains yank him inside the cell, and the door slides shut behind him with a crash. He thinks for just a moment that he can see his brother laughing. Then he's gone, leaving only an empty cell and a traumatized assistant behind. Sometimes the sins of the past come back to haunt you, and unfortunately for this particular man, there's no statute of limitations when it comes to SCP-567 or The Dungeon. In case the nickname wasn't clear enough, 
the dungeon is not the sort of place you would ever want to be confined. SCP-567 is a series of eight cells located beneath Foundation Site-41. Each cell has a designated number from SCP-567-1 through SCP-567-8. Most of the time, the cells are inactive and indistinguishable from any ordinary prison cell. However, when someone that one of the cells deems to be guilty of a specific offense enters their proximity, the anomalous properties of SCP-567 become abundantly clear. Each cell punishes a specific horrible act. SCP-567-1 targets those who have committed theft. 2. Punishes sexual violence. 3 and 4 punish various types of murder. 5. Punishes adultery. 6 and 7. I'm afraid I can't quite make out what it says. Someone appears to have deliberately scratched out the text in the file. As for SCP-567-8, whatever wrongdoing it chooses to penalize is still unknown, and it is never activated in the entire time the Foundation has known of it. Every other cell is completely empty, but 567-8 contains one single, antique wooden chair in the center of the room, nailed to the floor. The purpose of this chair is unclear. When an individual who has committed one of the aforementioned acts comes within 2.5 meters of their corresponding cell door, a pair of shackles will shoot out from within the cell, seemingly materializing out of nowhere. These shackles will then lock around the individual's wrists and drag them inside, at which point the cell door will slide itself closed and lock, and the prisoner and shackles will disappear. Multiple researchers have compared this anomaly, both in its function and its methodology, to SCP-1002, or Demisers, and SCP-2701, or True Solitary Confinement, which I have discussed at length before. Since the Foundation first contained SCP-567, only two prisoners have ever reappeared after being taken. 68 hours after he was first placed inside SCP-567-3, D-903912 escaped and was found collapsed on the ground just outside Site-41. He died only moments after reappearing, before any medical intervention could take place. An autopsy showed severe injuries, including lacerations, internal bleeding, and burns on his wrists and ankles. The second subject to ever return was D-937122, who was found 157 months after being locked in SCP-567-6. In spite of her injuries, which included head trauma, missing fingers, and the same burn marks on her wrists and ankles, this subject had a great deal more energy and attempted to attack the Foundation personnel that found her. She was subdued by several guards, restrained, and interrogated by an unnamed agent. Thankfully, an audio log of the interview was included in the file, giving us a sense of what transpired. Please state your name, the agent began. D-937122 did not respond. Please state your name, they repeated. Again, no response. The agent sighed heavily and changed tactics. Look, I'm very sorry and I want to help you, but we can't give you medical attention unless you cooperate with us, so please, please state your name for the record. At long last, the D-Class responded with an intense outburst. My name? You want to know my name? Screw my name! There is no name! There is no anything! But, but there is. I escaped. I got the medal off. None of the and here the audio was corrupted to the point where I couldn't understand what was being said. After the interference clears, D-937122 could be heard shouting, I should be free! Let me go! A struggle followed as she attempted to escape custody. The agent then replied in an attempt to calm the D-Class down, I apologize, but now we have the opportunity to- Screw your opportunity! There is no opportunity! There is only escape! You called me a monster, maybe I am one, but the nightmares, they- she briefly broke down into unintelligible mumbling before returning to normal speech. Compared to their crimes, I've done nothing wrong. Nothing at all. I haven't done anything wrong. Nothing. At this point, the D-Class became inconsolable, all coherent speech dissolving into sobs. The agent attempted to calm her down, but she remained hysterical. After several moments of sobbing, the D-Class began to gasp as if she was having difficulty breathing. She clutched her chest and began to go into apparent cardiac arrest. The agent attempted to administer CPR, but it was unsuccessful, and after a few minutes, she was dead. An autopsy was ordered following the interview, which revealed the apparent cause of her death. Her body was covered with tiny punctures, and a toxicology report revealed an unknown poison in her bloodstream. Though only two people have ever emerged from SCP-567, they were not the only organic life forms to break out of the dungeon cells. Every so often, the doors of a cell will open, and an entity will emerge. These creatures are given the designation SCP-567-9, and they are always aggressive. 
They do not usually match the description of any existing animal, instead appearing to be some sort of undiscovered creature. Once an instance of SCP-567-9 has escaped its cell, it will attempt to leave the dungeon and attack anything that gets in its way. The first instance of SCP-567-9 observed by the Foundation was a four-limbed creature approximately two meters in length. It walked on all fours, but had human-like hands on its front limbs, complete with opposable thumbs and sophisticated enough mobility to operate machinery. It was highly intelligent and used this intellect to take out 14 Foundation operatives before it was contained. The details of SCP-567-9-2 have been stricken from any official documentation. The only thing I can surmise from the file is that nine personnel were killed after it appeared, and one of the agents that helped contain it requested and received psychological counseling for what they experienced during the process. So whatever it was he encountered, it wasn't anything good. During a round of routine testing with SCP-567-4, while the cell door was open, an instance of SCP-567-9 appeared, attacking and killing the researcher leading the tests. The entity was not contained, but after seven casualties, was lured back towards its original cell. At this point, the cell deployed its shackles and the creature was pulled back inside. The most recent instance of SCP-567-9 emerged when the door to SCP-567-7 opened and closed spontaneously. This was spotted on the CCTV footage, but none of the security monitoring the video could see anything leaving the cell. Two weeks later, an agent assigned to the dungeon was found dead in his home, still in bed. The circumstances of his death were virtually identical to those attributed to SCP-966, a nightmarish species of creature known as the Sleep Killer, which I've discussed here on the channel before. When the escaped entity was found in Site-41, it was found to resemble an instance of SCP-966, with only a few variations. It was successfully contained, and the on-site security cameras were upgraded to prepare for future anomalies like it. Though many specifics are missing from the file, including the exact appearances of the creature that emerged from the cells, I have deduced one thing. Wherever SCP-567 is transporting those it deems guilty, it is a prison for monsters of all species. Humans are not the only ones it wishes to hold accountable for their crimes. As I was reading about the dungeon and the various tests involving it, a rather morbid question came to mind. What would happen to a test subject guilty of more than one crime? Which cell would claim them? Well, fortunately for my curiosity, and unfortunately for him, one D-Class found out. D-834200 was used as a human test subject during initial studies of SCP-567. He was placed in front of SCP-567-6 and 7. Almost instantly, the cells rattled open and the shackles shot out to grab him. His left wrist and ankle were ensnared by cell 6, and his right were trapped by cell 7. Then, he was pulled into both cells. Well, part of him was at least. How can I best explain his fate without causing too much distress? Have you ever held a wishbone in your hand at a family dinner while your sibling or cousin held the other side and you both pulled until it broke? It was a bit like that. SCP Foundation Site-41 has been established in the abandoned castle that contains SCP-567 in order to prevent any civilians from coming across it. The entrance to the dungeon is kept sealed at all times, and the doors to each of the cells are monitored via CCTV. If any door is opened without authorization, Task Force Delta-9, also known as HACS, will be deployed to contain the resulting instance of SCP-567-9. If, for any reason, it cannot be contained, the Task Force is permitted to terminate. In order to prevent the unnecessary loss of any personnel, all applicants to join Task Force Delta-9 must have a clean criminal record, have never committed a crime at all, even at the behest of the Foundation, have a strong dedication to the law, and show loyalty to the social contract and the feelings of others. A robust moral compass is considered a vital qualification to work near SCP-567, lest they become simply one more victim added to its long list of tortured penitents. The Foundation has encountered many anomalies over the years that could pose a danger to the organization itself. SCP-567 is no exception. Untold numbers of Foundation operatives have committed terrible acts in the service of the greater good. They have lied, stolen, and even killed in order to protect and contain the secrets locked away in files and behind heavily guarded walls. A great deal of caution should be used when dealing with the dungeon, no matter how justified a person thinks their past sins might be. After all, there's no chance to plead your innocence, and the very prison that plans to hold you is also the judge, jury, and executioner. You can never win a fight in Minnie Mouse ears. The girlfriend learns that lesson the hard way in the car driving through Florida. No matter how articulate you are, how many one-liners your brain throws together on the spot, or even how right you are, 
If you are wearing Minnie Mouse ears, you just won't win the argument. You said it was all booked! She yells, throwing her arms in the air and sending drops of iced caramel latte all over the inside of the rental car. He snatches the drink out of her hand and plants it firmly in the cup holder. He yells back at her that it wasn't his fault. How was he supposed to know the payment was declined? You didn't even check for a confirmation email? She scowls and crosses her arms. Her boyfriend glances across at her and laughs. I just can't take you seriously in those, her boyfriend says, pointing at the Minnie Mouse ears. She punches the button to wind the window down, rips the ears off of her head, and is about to throw the big black ears out the window. Only, she can't do it. Looking at the little bow, she feels her bottom lip start to tremble. She deflates, feeling the fight go out of her. I'm sorry, she says. I just really wanted to go to Disney World. I know. The pair of them drive in silence for a moment. The fight wasn't really about Disney. None of their fights were ever about what was really wrong. They'd always pick stupid, superficial things and shout about those, but not say what was really going wrong deeper down. That said, not getting to go to Disney World isn't just a superficial thing to her. Growing up in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, she was very much used to having to explain to people where she was from. Sleepy Eye, yes, that's its real name. It's near New Ulm, near Mankato, about two hours from Minneapolis. If you don't know where Minneapolis is, she can't help you. Anyway. This trip was her first real adventure. She'd never left Minnesota much before. The flight down to Florida had been her first time on an airplane. All to come to the happiest place on Earth. Only they got to the front gates and her boyfriend realized his payment had been declined. Did they have the money to buy two new tickets on the door? Of course not. They've blown it all on airfares, car rental, airport food, and a pair of Minnie Mouse ears. I'm sure there are plenty of great things to do in Florida her boyfriend says, trying to sound optimistic. For free? He doesn't reply. They just drive on in silence. Without a ticket to go to Disney World, they have no choice but to spend what little cash they have left on a motel for the night. It takes them about an hour to get there. The girlfriend gets straight out of the car and into their room, slamming the door behind her. Her boyfriend will just have to take a walk for a bit. There are cockroaches in the sink and some questionable stains on the bed, walls, and every flat surface in the room. There is apparently a pool out the back, but she's heard the stories of alligators roaming around this state and is in no mood to roll that dice in a place like this. She opens YouTube on her phone and puts on a horror video to listen to in the background. That calms her down. She loves that kind of thing. After 20 minutes, there's a soft knock at the door. Looking apologetic as anything, her boyfriend nudges his way into the room, holding a brochure in his hand. She snatches it off him without a word and reads it with as grumpy of an expression as possible. Spooky self-guided tours in Florida. Visit the infamously haunted Pensacola Lighthouse today to chill your bones in the Florida heat. Explore the scariest spot on the coast for free with a special Disney twist. Okay, fine. Her boyfriend does know how to cheer her up, but she can't let him know that. He's still supposed to be in trouble. But the following night, as the pair of them approach the lighthouse in the pitch darkness, she can't help but crack a smile. With the light at the top turned off and the railing surrounding the building stabbing sharply into the air, the place certainly looks pretty haunted. The brochure tells them that the place is a maritime museum during the day, but is currently closed to the public for maintenance. However, there's a spare key to be found right under… Got it! Her boyfriend straightens up proudly and turns to hand her the key that he retrieved from under the flower pot. She scowls at him to make sure he still knows he's in trouble for not getting them into Disney, but she does secretly feel a little glimmer of affection. He's always been the first behind the couch during horror movies, so he's clearly trying his best to make it up to her. The creaking noise that she was really hoping for doesn't come when she opens the door. It opens smoothly. Her boyfriend flicks the light switch instinctively, and the inside of the museum immediately lights up, showing glass cabinets, old nautical equipment, and a few flags. She groans and switches the lights back off. It's not exactly a haunted tour if you just turn all the lights on. But the magic of the room is gone now. They've now seen everything, nothing lurking in the dark, no shadows, just a boring old museum. They trudge into the next room. There's so much streetlight spilling through the window that they can see practically everything in here as well. It's a recreation of the old lighthouse keeper's bedroom. A couple of old-looking beds, antique wardrobes, and clothes from the olden days. So much for a haunted lighthouse. This is so lame, the girlfriend groans and switches the light on. Even her boyfriend isn't looking scared by any of this. There's literally nothing to be scared of in here. Can we just go home? Her boyfriend looks apologetic again. 
He's really tried to salvage this vacation, but it just hasn't happened. She can't be too mad at him. You know what? No, she says. Let's at least finish looking around this museum, then we can go. We can just switch on the lights, read the exhibits, and see the view from on top of the lighthouse. So they do that. The pair of them go back into the first room and start reading through the signs under each of the displays. There's a diagram explaining all of the different knots that sailors used to tie. A long paragraph all about how the lighthouse used to burn oil but now runs on electricity generated by… The girlfriend yawns. Without the adrenaline of any ghosts, museums are much harder work in the middle of the night. It isn't even Disney-themed like the brochure promised. The only Disney thing in here is that Mickey Mouse mascot in the corner. It doesn't even fit with the rest of the museum, just a random costume on a mannequin. It must be almost seven feet tall. Her boyfriend is staring at it real close. He leans in, examining the material up close under the bright museum lights. This thing's weird, he says. I wonder how old it is. Look, the white's all faded, and it's got this fur effect. Crunch! Mickey Mouse chomps into her boyfriend's arm with a ferocious set of teeth. Neither of them reacts at all, frozen by total disbelief as Mickey stands there, his huge rat-like fangs embedded in the boyfriend's arm. He yanks it from the cartoon character's jaws, blood leaking from the wounds. How can this be happening? Mickey's eyes flick between the two of them. He raises a gloved hand and waves. The boyfriend shrieks, turns on his heels and runs, clattering into one of the exhibits as he goes. He crashes into her and the wound on his arm hits her in the chest. She looks down, confused at the blood stain on her shirt, then back at Mickey Mouse. He gives a little shooing motion with his hands. Run. Now it's her turn to scream. She grabs her boyfriend and bundles him out of the room. Mickey was standing right by the entrance. They're gonna have to hope there's another way out somewhere deeper in the museum. They run through room after room, every few steps turning to see Mickey following them. He isn't running at all, he's sauntering along, arms swinging cartoonishly around. Just like in Steamboat Willie, he's whistling a tune to himself as he goes. That must be the door out of here. The pair of them crash into it and go tumbling into the next room. There's blood everywhere. Her boyfriend is looking more and more pale by the second. They're not outside, though. They're in a small circular room with a spiral staircase running up, up, up into darkness. Mickey's whistling is getting louder. They don't have a choice here. The girlfriend jumps up and hauls her tiring boyfriend to his feet. Putting his unwounded arm over her shoulder, she half carries him up the stairs, feeling the metal spiral shudder under them with every step. Halfway up, she looks back over her shoulder. Mickey is standing in the doorway. He waves enthusiastically. Her legs are burning by the time she reaches the top of the lighthouse. Barging open the door, she throws her boyfriend rather unceremoniously up onto the balcony around the big light. Panting, she turns back around to look back down into the darkness below them. Mickey is standing by a big switch on the wall. <laughs> he laughs and flips the switch. A big clunking sound comes from the light next to her. Very slowly at first, it starts to spin. The light flickers on dimly, dimly at first, then gets brighter. Faster and faster it spins, brighter and brighter the beam until it's blinding. She raises an arm to shield herself from the piercing light. Against the dark of the night, her eyes can't adjust between light and dark fast enough. She's going blind up here. From below, she hears a heavy footstep on metal, then another. The whistling starts again as Mickey cheerfully makes his way up to them. She glances down at him. He waves happily up at her again. She almost waves back instinctively. No, now's not the time. She needs to come up with a plan. But her brain just can't do it. For all the horror movies she's watched, all the times where she's screaming at the TV telling the protagonist what to do, now that she's in one for herself, she's got nothing. But wait, maybe she does have something. A pair of gloved hands appear on the doorframe, gripping the wood tightly. A smiling Mickey Mouse pops his head around the door, blood all over his chin. He just stays there for a moment eyes flitting between her and her boyfriend, bleeding out on the floor. <laughs> he sticks a comically large shoe out from the doorway and steps out onto the gallery to join them. The light swings around and shines in his face. As soon as it hits him, he bares his teeth, thousands of them, and shrieks in their faces. That's it. The girlfriend runs at him, fast as she can. At the last moment, she jumps, bends her legs, and with all the force she can muster, two foot kicks him in the chest. The giant mascot is really solid. He's so heavy that all of her efforts only just about knocks him off balance. But it's enough. Tripping over his own giant shoes, Mickey falls backwards. His back hits the railing, and for a second, it looks like he's going to be okay. But his momentum is just too much. His feet fly up into the air as he tips back over it, tumbling down into the darkness and laughing all the way down. Crunch! 
Mickey lands, impaled on the spiked railings outside the lighthouse. One of the rails stabs straight through his head. His smile freezes in place. His laughter stops. Her boyfriend is not looking okay. He's barely conscious now, lying in a sickeningly large pool of blood. They need to get him to a hospital fast. Still not recovered from carrying him up the lighthouse stairs, she now has to haul him back down them. The pair leave a red trail all the way through the museum, but that's the last of her concerns at this point. Not looking across at Mickey lying dead on the railing, the girlfriend dumps her boyfriend into the passenger seat of the rental car and goes round to the driver's side. She doesn't have a license, but she did a few lessons this year. Should be fine, the roads will be empty. All she needs to do is get them to a hospital. Her boyfriend is groaning in the passenger seat. She starts fishing through his pockets for the keys. She glances up in the mirror. Mickey is still lying on the fence, motionless. The door to the museum is closed, just like how they left it. Or wait, did they leave it open? She tries the other pocket. Her boyfriend is trying to say something. She shushes him. He can tell her later, but he keeps trying, raising his uninjured arm. He points at something on the dashboard. Her mouse ears. What's the big deal? They've already dealt with Mickey Mouse. No, wait. Not Mickey. Minnie. Bang! Two large dents appear on the car's roof right above their heads. The girlfriend desperately turns back to her boyfriend, searching pocket after pocket for these keys. Why does he have so many damn pockets on these shorts? She glances out the window and stops dead still, peering through the glass at her, head upside down as she leans over from the roof. Minnie Mouse waves at her. The gloved hand stops moving and points at the third pocket down on the left. The girlfriend reaches into it and finds the keys. Minnie gives a big double thumbs up, tilts her head back, and slams it into the glass. Bang! Bang! Again and again, she pounds her forehead on the windshield. The glass sags and fractures into smaller and smaller pieces. The girlfriend doesn't have time to sit and wait, though. She stabs the keys into the car and starts the engine. Slamming the accelerator to the floor, the car shoots off into the night. Minnie gives her another double thumbs up, winds a hand back, and punches it through the window. The girlfriend screams. The hand grabs the top of her boyfriend's head and starts to slowly twist it around. No matter how much she swerves the car, the girlfriend can't knock the mouse off the roof. Round and round her boyfriend's head goes. Crunch! His vertebrae detached and grate against each other. His head is looking all the way backwards at his seat. The mini keeps turning it, round and round, until he's looking straight forwards again, neck crumpled and splitting, eyes lifeless. Minnie puts a hand to her mouth and giggles. Oops! The road disappears from under the car, and it free falls for a second, the nose tipping forward. Crash! The nose lands first, tipping the car forwards and throwing the girlfriend through what remains of the windscreen. She tumbles across the sand, feeling her arms snapping underneath her as she goes. In a blur, she tries to get to her feet, but collapses. Rolling onto her back, she stares up at the stars as the sea laps against her cheek. A pair of giant round ears with a little pink bow block her view. Minnie peers down at her, spotting the girl's broken arm. With two giant gloved hands, she reaches down and takes the arm in her grip, breaking it back the other way and shoving it together until it resembles how it used to look. Minnie gives her the double thumbs up. The girlfriend doesn't even try to move. This is it. She's accepted her fate. But Minnie looks sad. Putting her hands under the girlfriend's armpits, she lifts her up and puts her back on her feet. She makes that same shooting motion Mickey did before. The girlfriend stumbles back a couple of paces, but falls over again. Exasperated, Minnie throws her hands in the air, picks the girlfriend up again, and puts her back on her feet. Minnie points at her. You. She then makes a little running motion with her fingers and points off up the beach. You run. Just kill me. The girlfriend says, exhaustion racking her every word. Minnie puts her head in her hands, even more exasperated than before. The mouse puts her hands together and makes a begging motion. Please? The girlfriend just stands there. Minnie throws her arms in the air, looks down at the girl, and shrieks, baring all her teeth. She stays put. Minnie pushes her over, jumps down into a straddling position, and punches the girlfriend in the head with her gloved hand. Pain fills the girl's head, shooting the fear back into her. With nothing left, the girl pushes herself free and stumbles away from Minnie. She hobbles up the beach, blood flowing freely down either side of her head. She's going as fast as she can, but it's barely faster than a walk. Behind her, Minnie is covering her eyes and counting on an outstretched hand, playing hide-and-seek. There's nowhere for her to go, though, nowhere to hide. 
They're just on an open beach, stretching out in front of her and behind her. Nowhere to go, except... She splashes out into the sea, up to her knees, her waist, her chest. Now she's just fully swimming. Her broken arm screams at her from the motion. She barely has the strength to kick. Salt water splashes up into her ear holes and feels like it's washing straight into her brain. The world sounds strange and choked. The girl cranes her neck around to see Minnie standing on the shore. The mouse waves at her enthusiastically. The girl waves back. Minnie giggles. The two of them stay like that for almost an hour, the girl steadily dying in the sea, trying to stay afloat, Minnie waiting enthusiastically on the shore. With each wave, the girl is slowly brought closer and closer to the mouse, until she's lying helplessly at the creature's giant feet. The last thing she sees is a pair of giant, round ears. Turns out she had been wrong. You can absolutely win a fight with a pair of Minnie Mouse ears. Next time you're considering going on vacation in the state of Florida, it would be wise of you to avoid reading any brochures you may come across just in case you come across SCP-3640, a seemingly harmless brochure. SCP-3640 can be found all across the state, though it is currently unknown how they come into being. These brochures will promote self-guided tours within the state, all of areas that have particular ghost stories, folklore, or rumors of hauntings attached to them. These tours are free and promise tourists an up-close and personal look at the haunted history of Florida. However, most are not prepared for just how up-close these tours end up being. If you read this brochure and decide to go along to the location advertised at the time it lists, you will be met with instances of SCP-3640-Alpha. In this case, these creatures manifested themselves as Mickey and Minnie Mouse. However, they can take the form of any uniformed mascots associated with the Walt Disney Media conglomerate. These mascots will hunt you down mercilessly, but with all the charm and squeaky clean joy we all know and love. Live ammunition does little to stop these SCPs when directed at the body, but a clean headshot has been proven to do the trick. It is fortunate then for our tourist couple that Mickey's head was impaled on the railing. What is less fortunate, however, is that they were there together. This is because SCP-3640 has a few interesting rules for how it operates. In order for SCP-3640-Alpha instances to engage in the hunt, every member of the party has to have read the brochure. If a group of five go to a haunted house at the designated time, but only four of them have read the brochure, they will enjoy a nice, spooky, but safe evening. If all members of the party have read the brochure, however, the same number of mascots will manifest and hunt them down. For a group of 20 college students, you can only imagine the colorful range of Disney characters that come out to play. These SCPs will also only remain within their state borders. If you find yourself being hunted down, you can either run for the border or find a good place to hide until the times allotted for your self-guided tour come to an end. It remains unclear how these SCPs grow, reproduce, or where they go outside of their hunting times, if they continue to exist at all. Who knows, there are a lot of back rooms in Disney World with all mascot costumes lying around. The Walt Disney Company is under continuous surveillance to ascertain any link between SCP-3640 and the brand themselves. To this day, a letter from the company to a local governor in 1979 is the only tie to have been found between them and the creatures. It reads, Dear Governor Askew, the Walt Disney Company thanks you for your cooperation in this matter regarding the unlicensed Walt Disney character operators. Please pass along the following information collected by the outstanding men and women of the City of Orlando's Police Department to the Florida National Guard. If a character is spotted, call to get its attention and then rapidly flash your flashlights at the costume. If it does not flinch, fire on sight. Aim at the head if possible. Else, aim at the knees to disable them and then finish them off with headshots. Body shots have been known to lack effectiveness. Deceased characters are to be incinerated. No other means of disposal are advised. We are currently pursuing alternative legal means of shutting down these unlicensed operators and hope to achieve a settlement within the end of the year. Cordially yours, The Walt Disney Company. All he could see were glimpses, flashes of movement, but he could clearly make out that there was a girl. He could see the man walk up behind her and slip a bag over her head. There was a struggle, a body being dragged through the dark, and then the sound of a shovel scraping against the hard dirt. The body is thrown into the shallow hole, and as the dirt begins to rain down on her face, her eye opens up. The boy's eyes open too, and he sits up with a panicked jolt. Shaky and covered in sweat, he looks around his dark room and realizes that it was only a dream. 
The entire morning as the boy gets ready, rides the bus, and sits through school, all he can think about is the dream and the girl. A group of teenage girls are out for a ride in one of their father's sports car convertible. They're having too much fun and driving much too fast down the dark country roads. It doesn't take much. It never does. Just the shadow of an animal bolting across the road, but it's enough to make the driver jerk the wheel, causing the car to lose control. All of the girls scream, but none more than the one who is tossed from the sliding, spinning car. The girls stand around their dead friend and make a solemn pact. No one here will ever know that she was with them. But what will they do with her? One of them points towards the woods, and everyone turns to look at the dilapidated shed. As the girls, now dirty from their long night of digging and then filling a hole, emerge from the shed into the dim morning light, none of them are aware that beneath the dirt, the girl is still breathing. The boy gasps for air and struggles in the dark. He throws the blankets off of him before realizing that he is safe in his own bed. Another breakfast, another ride to school, another day of classes where the boy can think of nothing but the girl from his dreams. Who is she? He's never seen her in his life, he's sure of it. But then why does she keep appearing in his dreams? The boy is snapped out of his deep train of thought by the teacher slapping his desk, and he apologizes before focusing on his studies once again. The look on the woman's face is a mix of sadness and annoyance. She doesn't know how much longer she can go on like this. It never stops. How can someone cough so much? The woman sits in her chair and tries to push away the same thought that comes to her over and over, that it would be better for both of them if it would just end. The girl coughs loudly in her bed. The disease has ravaged her lungs, and it takes all of her willpower not to scratch at the burning, itching sores on her face and chest. She looks towards the door with dazed eyes and sees her mother enter the room. She's carrying a tray with soup, just like she always does at this time, even though she has no appetite at all. As her mother gets closer, she can see that the tray is empty, and it isn't a tray in her hands. It's a pillow. The girl can barely muster a scream as the woman places the pillow over her daughter's face. As the mother walks out of the old shed in the backyard and towards the house, she stops for a moment. Can she hear the sound of coughing coming from the shed? That morning at breakfast, the boy's father tells him in no uncertain terms that he doesn't want to hear any more about the girl. It's just a dream and he needs to put it out of his mind. What he needs to be focusing on is school. The note from his teacher said that he isn't paying attention in class, and if that keeps up, he's going to have much bigger problems. The boy promises no more about the girl. As the boy stares out the bus window, it isn't his fault that thoughts about his dream rush into his head. Because as the bus drives along the country roads, he catches a glimpse of something down a long, tree-covered driveway. It's the house from his dream. The shed door opens with a creak, allowing a sliver of light from the full moon to fall inside. The boy enters the shed as quietly as he can and goes inside. He soon emerges with his bike and a shovel strapped to his back before riding away from his own backyard into the night. The boy stops his bike at the bottom of the driveway leading up to the old abandoned house. He rides up the drive and doesn't even consider stopping at the house. His destination is somewhere else. The boy lets his bike fall to the ground in the backyard and stares at it. It's the shed he's seen so many times before, despite never seeing it in person. It's dark and quiet, the shed silhouetted against the large, bright moon. He approaches the only door on the small shed and reaches for the handle. It opens with a loud, rusty squeak. The boy takes out a flashlight and turns it on, illuminating the shed's interior. Inside is nothing except for a wooden bench sitting on the dirt floor. But wait, there is something else. A spot on the ground appears different, blackened, almost as if it were burned. This is the spot, though. This is the place the boy keeps seeing in his dreams. He knows she's down there. She needs his help. The boy thrusts his shovel down into the dirt, but it doesn't even scratch the surface. The ground is cold and hard. He strikes down again, and the shovel pierces into the dirt. The shovel suddenly falls to the ground, though, as the boy begins to cough. He drops to his knees as the coughing becomes a fit. He can't stop, and now he can't breathe. It feels like his throat is filling with something. He falls to the ground, still coughing as he feels whatever is filling his throat and lungs moving and vibrating. The final great hacking cough, he unleashes a swarm of creatures from his mouth. He lies in the dirt, struggling but unable to get any air, as the buzz of thousands of locusts drowns out his final noises. 
It's no surprise that what this young man ran into wasn't a dream at all, but an interaction with an anomaly that has since been classified as SCP-4595, but also has the quite simple and appropriate name of Witch. SCP-4595 is the designation given to a small room located inside of a woodshed that is itself found behind a home near the town of Jasper, Indiana. The house appears to have been abandoned for some time, and there are no reliable records of who the home's most recent or original owners were. The only item inside the woodshed is a simple, rough-hewn wooden bench, though at the time of the anomaly's discovery, two other objects were found as well. The first was a small shovel, the type that might be used for gardening. The shovel appears to be ordinary in every way, except for the very tip which has what looks to be a blood stain on it. Though tests have been unable to retrieve any genetic material from the discoloration, the second object was a small human skeleton. The body of the deceased person was removed from the woodshed, and an autopsy revealed that it had belonged to an adolescent male, roughly 11 to 13 years old. While the exact cause of death was unable to be determined, it is extremely likely that it was due to the anomalous effects that SCP-4595 produces, but more on those in a moment. Further examination of the woodshed reveals that the word witch has been scrawled on the door with charcoal, though it is unknown who wrote the message and whether it is meant to serve as a warning or has some other purpose. It is highly likely, though, that the word is referring to the final element of SCP-4595, the body that is buried beneath the woodshed's dirt floor. Ground-penetrating imaging tools were brought in to investigate the shed, and researchers discovered that underneath one portion of the floor that appears to have been scorched at some point, a body is buried roughly one meter beneath the surface, which has since been designated as SCP-4595-A. Scans have revealed the body to be a humanoid figure, vaguely feminine in appearance. Its limbs are twisted in a painful and unnatural manner, and there are several large wounds present on its face, chest, and neck. But perhaps strangest of all, is that despite evidence at the site pointing to the location not having been disturbed for many years, the corpse buried beneath does not seem to show any signs at all of decomposition, still appearing as it most likely did at the time it was interred in the ground. You are most likely asking yourself why the SCP Foundation has relied solely on subterranean imaging in order to assess the state of SCP-4595-A, and why they don't simply dig up the anomalous corpse. The reason why they haven't is due to the anomalous effects present at the site. Testing on SCP-4595 has concluded that anyone who enters the shed and remains there for any substantial amount of time will begin to experience a number of effects. First, they will start to feel paranoid, getting the impression that someone is watching them. This purely mental effect is quickly followed by a physical one, where the individual's skin will start to itch. Those who linger in SCP-4595 long enough will eventually begin to violently scratch at themselves in an attempt to relieve the itchiness. These effects, while very uncomfortable, will eventually subside if they leave the location, and it is very likely that they are meant to serve as a warning of what will happen if one partakes in the most dangerous aspect of SCP-4595, which is disturbing the body buried beneath it. Anyone who attempts to impact SCP-4595-A by attempting to dig it up or otherwise remove it from the location will quickly experience a horrendous anomalous effect. The individual will soon find that they are experiencing a shortness of breath and soon will begin coughing and choking and be unable to breathe at all. This is due to a phenomenon in which any empty space in their chest cavity, lungs, airways, stomach, and intestines will completely fill with Schistocerca gregaria, better known as the desert locust. The insects will continue to appear within the individual's body until they expire, a process that typically takes mere minutes. Any locusts that manage to escape the individual's body, most often through the mouth and nose, will disappear into a vapor that quickly dissipates the moment they cross the threshold of the woodshed's doorway. So far, no method has been determined that can prevent any of SCP-4595's effects, and for the time being, no personnel are allowed to enter the anomalous shed except for testing purposes, but even in those cases, the disturbance of SCP-4595-A is not allowed. Due to the relative ease with which the Foundation can secure the site and is able to prevent anyone from entering, it has been classified as safe, with the additional disruption class of dark and the risk class of warning. Just what is SCP-4595? Is the SCP-4595-A body a victim, doomed to an eternity beneath this ramshackle shed? Or is it a monster, sealed away for some unknown purpose, the only warning for us to stay away being a single word on the door? Maybe one day we'll finally know the answer to why SCP-4595 is only known 
as the witch. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right 
and these are Manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden, smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent. No matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag, he doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop. But it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something, to retort that he too was suffering all night. But he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water, and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned, and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps, he can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. 
He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being, as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell, and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, 
and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site 88, with D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site 88, but the environment itself. An additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site 88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flattest were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned-off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur-oxidizing bacteria, 
embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13, odor eaters, are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. The boy and his father have spent the entire morning cleaning out the basement of the boy's grandfather, and the boy is absolutely exhausted. After yet another trip up those rickety cellar steps, the boy collapses onto the old living room couch. He can still hear his father puttering around downstairs, yelping and gasping in surprise every time he finds some memento of his childhood stashed among the debris. The boy sighs in annoyance. He doesn't really know his grandfather, so he doesn't feel any sense of loss as they tear through the boxes and bags in the basement. His father, however, insisted that the boy come along. It'll be good for us to spend some time together, he said, and the boy suspects that his father is trying to deal with his own guilt about his strained relationship with the boy's grandfather. Perhaps he hopes that a day of father-son bonding is just what they need to make sure that they don't grow apart as his father did with his grandfather. The boy, however, doesn't think that cleaning out a musty old basement should qualify as effective father-son bonding. It's super boring. Worse, it turns out that the boy's deceased grandfather was an absolute hoarder who couldn't throw anything away, so the house is filled with all sorts of worthless garbage. The boy groans, his feet ache from traipsing all those stairs, and his back aches from carrying boxes. He thinks that he deserves a little break. He pulls a small handheld gaming console from the pocket of his hoodie and turns it on. I'll just play for a couple minutes, he thinks to himself, then I'll go and help dad some more. He won't mind if I take a short break to recover. The boy is sitting on the battered couch in the living room, playing the latest game on his handheld game console, when his father lurches into the room, carrying a gigantic white plastic box in his arms. Check it out, sport, says his dad, a wide grin on his face. Look what I just found in the basement. The boy briefly looks up from his game, resisting the temptation to roll his eyes at his father's annoying enthusiasm. His father is always getting excited for the dumbest things. As for that white box, the boy's never seen anything like it. It's a Sega Dreamcast, the father says as he sets the white box on the living room floor and starts to untangle the massive wires protruding from the back of the object. This was my favorite video game system when I was a kid. I guess your grandfather just couldn't throw it away. What else is new? mutters the boy under his breath. Buddy bites his tongue as he watches his father studiously pick apart the knots in the tangled wires. Obviously, this hunk of junk has big sentimental value for his dad. Reluctantly, he slides off the couch and takes a seat next to his father on the floor, and together, the two of them set up the Dreamcast. This had all the best games, continues his father. Soul Calibur, Sega vs. Capcom, oh you're gonna love these. After a few minutes, his father has the wires plugged into the television, and the hand controller's ready. He nudges his son in the side with his elbow. What do you say, champ? You ready to go mano a mano against your old man with some real video games? I'm about to school you in what real games are like, none of this silly What's it called? Among Us junk like you played today? It's not called Among Us, Dad, mutters the boy under his breath, but his father is already distracted pulling out old games. His father holds up a CD clamshell and pries it open, revealing a stack of silvery discs. And look at this, all my old games, too! The boy tries to contain his boredom as his father rattles off a list of his favorite old video games, none of which are familiar to the boy. But eventually, his father reaches one disc that isn't familiar. Eurythmics? he says, squinting at the title embossed across the disc. I don't remember this one. I wonder if your grandfather got it after I moved out. The father pauses as if overcome with emotion. The boy can imagine what his father is thinking. Did his grandfather buy this disc knowing how much his father loved his Dreamcast video games and hoping that maybe it could serve as a reconciliation present between them? That's exactly the sort of dopey sentimental thing that his dad would think after spending all morning going through his grandfather's junk and reminiscing about what could have been. Uh, it looks like it's some sort of dance game, prompts the boy, hoping to get his father to focus more on the game than his feelings of nostalgia and loss. Oh, right, right, says the father. I wonder why Grandpa had this when he didn't have a dance mat to connect. Maybe you just have to hit the control buttons in rhythm? Hmm. He holds it up, the reflective disc shining brightly in the light of the overhead lamp. 
and the boy stares at the silvery disc in confusion. He's seen pictures of CD-ROM discs before, in old catalogs or even movies, but he's never seen one in real life. Who even uses discs like that anymore? Everything's just downloadable from the internet these days. What is that anyway? asks the boy. A CD? This is not a CD, says his father, a slight edge of annoyance in his voice. The boy rolls his eyes. His father is always acting like he should be familiar with the outdated dinosaur technology of his father's youth. When will his dad learn? Just because this junk was important to his father when he was growing up doesn't mean that it's still important to the next generation. The boy holds his tongue, knowing that his father will probably start to sulk if he's reminded that time marches on, and that he's no longer as hip and with it as he likes to think he is. It's a GD-ROM says his father, as if those words are supposed to mean anything to the boy. It stands for Gigabyte Disk Read-Only Memory. The boy has no clue what that means, and he hopes that his father isn't about to start a lecture on the different kinds of obsolete video game tech that he's suddenly decided are so vitally important for his son to know about. Luckily, his dad doesn't launch into a long-winded talk. He's too curious about what's on this mysterious disk to bother about that now. The father shoves the disk into the Dreamcast and settles down on the floor, gripping the controller with both hands. He's as excited as a kid in a candy store as he waits for the screen to boot up. The boy can't remember the last time that his father has been so eager for anything. But his excitement is short-lived as the first loading screen boots up. A cheerful, happy melody plays from the Dreamcast's speakers. The game title, Eurythmics, flashes on screen with options for one or two players listed below it. The father clicks over to two players, nodding for his son to pick up the other controller. The boy does as he's told. He can't imagine that this game is going to be any good. How old is it anyway? It's from when his dad was a kid, so that's all the way back in the 90s. This game might as well be 100 years old for all the boy cares. Immediately when the father chooses two players, the screen starts to glitch. The father yells in frustration, throwing his controller to the floor, but the boy sighs in relief. Thank God, at least now we won't have to pretend that this dinosaur game is anything good. I guess it's busted, says the boy, ready to turn away from the Dreamcast, but his father is insistent. No, no, it's just warming up. Watch, I'll fix this. He grabs his controller and tries to click on two players again. The screen only glitches more. Okay, okay, just give me a minute, says the father. If this doesn't work, I'll just take the disc out and blow on it. I'm sure that'll work. The boy stares in confusion. It's a disc, not a cartridge. He doesn't see any way that blowing on it will have any effect. His father is just desperately grasping at straws, upset that his attempt at father-son bonding is being thwarted. Meanwhile, the cheerful loading screen music starts to fray stuck repeating a single reverberating note that gradually degenerates into a tuneless cacophony. The pixels shimmy and wobble on screen, the image fracturing worse and worse as the father struggles to get the game console to respond to his commands. The boy watches the screen with disinterest at first, but then… wait, what's going on? The more he stares at the screen, the more the random noises and broken graphics seem to form into something strange, something unknowable, but also something vaguely coherent? He blinks in confusion, his jaw dropping. He wants to call his father's attention to the bizarre formations on screen, but his father is too busy wrestling with the controller to notice the effect that he's having. Dad, Dad, look at the screen, says the boy, grabbing his father's shoulder and pointing. Huh, what is it, did it work? What the? The father furrows his brow in confusion as he notices the wildly oscillating image on the TV screen for the first time. That doesn't look like a Dreamcast game at all. It's all broken. I… I think? The colors swirl around the screen in hypnotic, psychedelic patterns, and both father and son find themselves mesmerized, unable to look away. The boy is only vaguely aware of what computer graphics in the late 90s would have looked like, but he's reasonably sure that no underpowered 90s console could produce something this wild. The boy feels himself getting groggy, his brain fogging over as he stares at the wildly oscillating shapes on the screen. He feels like he could almost make sense of them if he just tried hard enough. It's like looking at one of those old-fashioned magic eye pictures, where the image only collapses into sense if you cross your eyes just right, but these strange swirls of color are something far beyond that. The swirls spiral into distinct vortex patterns, to the point that the boy might almost believe that he's looking at… eyes. Yes, that's it, he's sure of it. He wants to panic as he becomes aware of the sensation of being watched. He feels like something beyond the screen, some malevolent entity has somehow gained access to his world via this video game and is now watching him, sizing him up like a predator would size up its prey. He can't think of anything except those staring eyes with their rotating pupils. 
He wants to fall forward and disappear into the eternal nothingness of those awful eyes. Next to him, his father is silent. Like the boy, he's also enraptured by the infinite eyes on screen. Oh my god, he mutters, so quiet that the boy can barely hear him. Do you... do you see the eyes? It's your grandfather. He's watching us. From... beyond. I know that's him. The boy doesn't know whether his father is right. His father is probably just letting his guilt color his perception, because the boy doesn't feel like there's human intelligence on the other side of the screen. Whatever is out there, whether it's an alien mind from beyond human ken, or simply a computer program given awful sentience by a freak accident, it's not something that the boy can even begin to comprehend. He feels his mind shutting down in the face of that terror, as if his brain simply cannot take the strain anymore. He's only vaguely aware of his father hitting the floor in a dead faint. That should worry him. He should be frightened. He should want to rush to his father's side and try to shake him back awake. But his brain can't make his body respond. He feels his arms and legs getting weak and his eyelids getting heavy. It isn't long before his eyes drift shut and the boy collapses onto the floor next to his father. Hours later, after the sun has already set, a car pulls up in front of the house and the boy's mother gets out. She frowns as she looks at the front of the house, noting that the lights are on inside, and the front bay window casts a yellow square of light across the front lawn. The boy and his father must still be inside. They were supposed to have finished moving all that junk hours ago. She's tried calling both of their cell phones to remind them that they should be home for dinner, but neither father nor son has answered any of her calls or texts. She's not worried, though. They often ignore their phones when they get really involved in an activity, and she suspects, rightly, that her husband probably found some childhood relic in the basement that's distracted him from getting the task done. She's willing to bet that the two of them probably haven't even finished cleaning the basement. She walks up the garden path and puts her hand against the doorknob. The door creaks open. She frowns. Nothing sinister about that, right? Of course, they wouldn't bother to lock the door if they were still working inside, right? Nevertheless, she feels a strange chill run up her spine. Why is she suddenly so nervous? She pushes open the door and fumbles for the light switch. The foyer is dark, as is most of the house. The only light comes from the living room, and she can see that something within is throwing dancing shadows against the far wall. She hears a toneless, mechanical drone emanating from the living room. Are they watching television? That would be just like them to turn on the tube and completely lose track of time. But what TV show would make an awful din like that? She storms into the living room, ready to read her husband and son the riot act. But then, she stops dead in her tracks. Her husband and son are here all right, but they're lying in crumpled heaps upon the floor, staring glassy-eyed at the ceiling. She screams as she rushes to her husband, praying that she's wrong, that they're just playing a prank on her, that they just got tired and lay down on the floor to rest. But as she presses her finger against his wrist, she feels that he's cold and lifeless. He's dead, and has been for hours. Her son, pale and cold and lifeless, lies next to him. She looks up, her gaze connecting with the television screen. It continues to flash vacillating images in an erratic loop, nonsense static that she can't understand. But if she didn't know better, she might almost feel like it's watching her. The strange, swirling eyes stare back, unblinking and eternal. What started as a misguided attempt at father-son bonding time ended in tragedy, because those GD-ROM discs weren't ordinary discs at all, but rather instances of what the SCP Foundation has dubbed SCP-4904. SCP-4904 is a set of seven modified GD-ROM discs manufactured by the Sega Corporation. SCP Foundation agents have been able to pinpoint the date of manufacture of each disc sometime between 1997 and 1999. The GD-ROM was a proprietary format originally used for the Dreamcast video game console, developed by Yamaha as an answer to fighting the piracy that was rampant among more standard compact discs, and to offer increased storage capacity without the expense of the fledgling DVD-ROM. The GD-ROM seemed promising at the time, as it had a storage capacity of a full gigabyte, 42% higher than conventional CDs. Ultimately though, GD-ROMs failed to catch on and were quickly outpaced by DVD technology. The seven discs in the SCP Foundation storage are visually indistinguishable from non-anomalous GD-ROM discs, except for their serial numbers. The serial numbers give some indication of the mystery behind their origin, revealing that they were created by Sega's enigmatic R&D Zero division during the height of the 90s console wars. 
It is estimated that R&D Zero produced a total of between 60 and 100 experimental GD-ROM discs similar to those in SCP-4904, but the rest of the production line is currently unaccounted for. Each SCP-4904 GD-ROM contains one Sega video game, including Sonic Adventure, Sega Rally Championship 2, House of the Dead 2, Sega Bass Fishing, Godzilla Generations, Virtua Fighter 3 TB, and an unreleased 3D rhythm game by the name of Eurythmics, but the result when anyone tries to play any of these different games is always the same. When an instance of SCP-4904 is fed into a Dreamcast console, it causes the optical disk drive's reader to move in unpredictable ways, accessing disk data seemingly at random. At first, the game boots up as expected and seems perfectly ordinary, but when a player progresses past the loading screen, the game very quickly becomes illegible. Sprites and assets blend into each other in asymmetrical chunks, maps recursively render onto other maps, and soundtracks transform within seconds into incessant, oscillating noise. A perfunctory glance at the result seems like absolute chaos, but eventually, observers will start to notice patterns within the noise. These eventually coalesce into complex renderings of landscapes and figures wildly inconsistent with the content of the original games, and computationally impossible for 1990s-era video game hardware to render. Repeated tests by SCP Foundation agents have turned up a recurring motif in the images shown by SCP-4904, spinning disks that resemble malevolent eyes. SCP agents hope that research into R&D Zero and the man responsible for the disk's creation might help to explain the reason or the purpose of SCP-4904. R&D Zero's former lead hardware programmer Ken Matsuya has said on record that the team encountered numerous problems in implementing the disk's anti-piracy encryption measures. The result was unplayable. Frustrated by this failure, Sega ordered that the encryption project be abandoned and the prototype disks quietly destroyed. However, it does not appear that Sega's orders were carried out to the letter. Matsuya himself rescued seven of the disks, hoping to learn more about the issue on his own time, and it's possible that other disks not currently known to the Foundation also survive. With the help of improvised Sega hardware, Matsuya spent the next four years trying to understand the cause behind the disks' erratic behavior. Notebooks recovered from his apartment contain numerous sketches of the disk-generated visuals. Depicting fractal combinations of landscape and figures seemingly drawn from places outside of the game data themselves, and stylized spinning disks in the shape of eyes. Matsuya himself met a strange and untimely end when he was found dead from a heart attack in his apartment in August 2003. Stranger still, an autopsy revealed that large portions of his brainstem and limbic system were missing. His death puzzled authorities since there was no evidence of any human, or even non-human, intrusion. Matsuya had apparently loaded one of the SCP-4904 instances in his possession into his home Dreamcast before his death, because the distinctive psychedelic visuals were playing on his television screen at the time that his body was discovered. Foundation agents suspected that the visuals might have some connection with Matsuya's death, leading to the disc's subsequent classification and containment, but intensive tests on SCP-4904 by Foundation personnel have failed to shed any light on the situation. Both the disc's strange behavior and Matsuya's death remain complete mysteries. Is SCP-4904 a gateway into some other dimension, and its bizarre images a signal from another world? Could it be a message from beyond the veil? Or is it all just due to a simple computer glitch and Matsuya's death just a freak coincidence? Whatever the case, the Foundation is doing its best to uncover the truth. SCP-4904 has been given the object class safe, but should be stored in conditions comparable to those needed to keep non-anomalous disks viable. All seven instances of SCP-4904 are kept in a climate-controlled safe class storage locker at Site-15. Long-term tests lasting over an hour should only be conducted on reinforced, modified hardware to prevent disk deformation or explosion. You've seen his face before, probably during a particularly distressing bout of sleep paralysis. His appearance can vary a bit from manifestation to manifestation, but a few traits are always present. He resembles an elderly man, his touch corrodes everything in his path, his presence creates a disgusting, black, mucus-like substance thought to be a method of pre-digestion of his prey, and he is rotting. No matter his appearance, he is always in some stage of decomposition, gray skin sloughing away from yellowed bone, eyes milky and flat but brimming with malice, wide, toothless mouth stretched into a wicked grin. The entity is incredibly difficult to contain, 
its corrosive properties, and ability to vanish into solid matter and disappear into its pocket dimension layer make it a threat as unpredictable as it is dangerous. The smell of decay and the presence of visible corrosion on any surfaces nearby may be the only warning a person gets before the old man grabs them in his decomposing arms, dragging them off to a painful, terrifying demise. We know where the being disappears to and have learned a great deal about how he operates, but where did he come from? It is the year 2000. Dr. Robert Scranton and his wife, Dr. Anna Lang, are the head researchers at SCP Foundation Site 120. Over the course of their happy relationship, the two have been working on an experimental research project, an early prototype reality anchor device called the Lang Scranton Stabilizer. After a lot of late nights at the office, working and reworking the theory, it is, at long last, ready for testing. Dr. Scranton is standing in Reality Lab A, as Dr. Lang observes from a nearby room. He follows the same routine he has followed each time they tested the LSS, walking down a line of buttons and levers, pressing and flipping each into place. The little red blinking light signifies that the microphone is recording his every comment and observation. Suddenly, the routine is broken by a low rumbling sound from deep, deep within the earth. The ground beneath him begins to shake, and Dr. Scranton stumbles, losing his balance as the once solid floor begins to roil and quake as the seismic shift rolls through the site. He hears the unmistakable grind and splintering of metal and plastic as the LSS-2 begins to shake, components sliding out of place and breaking off. Nearby, Dr. Lang's monitor goes dark as the security feed is cut short by the earthquake's damage. Robert! She screams, making a break for the door and rushing to Reality Lab A, terrified that she will find her husband's body lying on the floor. When she and the guards reach the room, however, they find… nothing. Well, not nothing entirely. The room is a wreck, bits of machinery strewn across the floor, the smell of burning plastic in the air. But the Lang Scranton Scrambler's control panel and Dr. Robert Scranton are nowhere to be found. Dr. Lang falls to her knees in the suddenly empty room, pounding at the floor in despair. Where did he go? She demands, but of course, no one knows the answer. No one wants to say what they're thinking. Wherever he is, Dr. Scranton is probably dead. Probably long, long gone, and he is never coming back. But no one says it, not out loud. They just think it, and keep thinking it, for the next five years, eleven months, and twenty-one days. The time passes, and most everyone forgets about Dr. Robert Scranton everyone except for Dr. Anna Lang. She never gives up hope, never lets go of the possibility that somewhere, in another world, another time, on another planet, her love is still alive. One day she wakes up and it's December 23, 2005, a day like any other, save for its uncomfortable proximity to the holidays she struggles to celebrate nowadays. But then, in the middle of the day, something impossible happens. The LSS control panel reappears in Reality Lab A. It isn't how anyone last saw it, though. It's coated in some sort of unidentified organic matter, and it reeks of blood, vomit, and decay. As her colleagues try to shield her from the site, try to warn her away, Dr. Anna Lang wades into the area, desperate for a glimpse at any sign of her husband's fate. As she makes her way into the containment field, she is unable to contain her horror. Oh God, what the hell, what, what, what is all this? This, this is, this is the, oh God, Robert, Robert, is this you? Oh God, please, please, no, don't let it be you, don't let it be you. Robert, I thought, I thought, how can this thing be? Her colleagues try to stop her, but she touches the Lang Scranton stabilizer interface and it fires to life. It still works. Somehow it still works. She racks her brain for what to do next before saying, access audio log. Playback starting from January 2nd, 2000. The machine prompts her to verbally state her password, and her voice shakes as she replies, Password is Anna Bobana. Request acknowledged. Processing. The machine replies, I'm sorry, there are no audio logs for January 2nd, 2000. Dr. Scranton accessed log on January 13th, 2000 via voice recognition at time. Anna slams her hands down on the machine with a cry. Playback now, damn it, play it back. A researcher warns her not to touch any of the material with her bare hands, but she doesn't hear him. She is too busy, calling out to Robert, hoping that somehow, somewhere, he can hear her. There's so much blood here, there's so much... Honey, are you okay? Where did you go? Oh god, oh god, oh god. Something small and metallic clatters to the floor, lost in the sludge. She retrieves it, wipes it off on her lab coat, and holds it to the light. She would recognize it anywhere. 
she slipped it onto her true love's finger on the happiest day of her life. It's Robert's wedding ring. Her knees buckle at the realization. She collapses to the ground, and her head cracks against the floor. One of her colleagues snaps into action. Report, this is Dr. Matthew Skinner reporting from Site 120 Reality Lab A. I need medical attention here immediately. Once Dr. Lang recovers from her fall, she demands access to the rematerialized control panel. She's going to go through the audio logs one by one and find out exactly what happened to her husband, even if the truth is as ugly as she fears. The machine whirs to life, and her lost love's voice emanates from the speakers. Name, Robert Scranton. Age, 39. Birthday, September 19th, 1961. Favorite color, blue. Favorite song, living on a prayer. Wife, Anna. She has green eyes. I love her very much. He repeated these simple truths to himself for days, before he even realized that the control panel was picking up his voice. My name is Robert Scranton. Yeah, yeah, my name is Robert Scranton, former researcher at Foundation Site 120. It has been... I don't know, actually. I I can't remember. I, I estimate it's been ten days, but I... I, I don't... I, I can't... Oh, God. Can anyone hear me? I, I, I don't know what's happened. I, I don't know where I am, and... And please, please, is anyone there? Hello? Anyone? Anyone? He began keeping track of how much time passed as best he could. Two weeks, three days, seven hours, and 58 minutes. Oh, Jesus. Back at the Foundation, with at least a tenuous knowledge of where Dr. Scranton could be, Personnel try their best to stage some kind of rescue effort. A mobile task force team is ordered to attempt to replicate the experiment with a hastily assembled Lang Scranton stabilizer copy. The result is an explosion that kills three of them. Senior researchers also approach SCP-343, a powerful reality warper known to some as God, hoping to get some insight from him about where Dr. Scranton could be found. His response is, He's beyond any of us now. I'm truly, dreadfully sorry. Anna starts having nightmares. She twists and turns in bed, haunted by visions of her beloved Robert consumed by darkness. A strange specter starts to appear in her dreams, a man with a horrible, rotted face. She turns to her bedside table in the night, numbers blurry on the screen of her alarm clock. The photograph of herself and Robert that she keeps there. Something is wrong with him, wrong with his face. Is it that same awful, rotted man? She screams and closes her eyes when she opens them photo is normal again. She weeps into her pillow. It can't keep going on like this. This place, it's it's some sort of reality gap, I think. If I don't concentrate on it, it's fine, but I feel this tingling all over my face. I'm not sure why. Two months, 15 days, four hours. Anna begins to accept the horrible truth she may not see Robert ever again, and holding on to the foolish fantasy that she will is starting to kill her. She repeats it to herself like a mantra at work. Robert Scranton is dead. Robert Scranton is dead. Robert Scranton is dead. One day, a co-worker notices her muttering and strikes up a conversation. It's been years since Robert disappeared. What's the harm in talking to someone again? She even finds herself smiling and laughing at his jokes, but when he asks if she'd like to go for coffee, She gets a flash of Robert screaming in the darkness, of that terrible, rotted face grinning. She runs to the bathroom to throw up and weep. The tingling in my face has worsened. I wish I could sleep here, but all this damn gunfire overhead. Can't take it anymore. Can't take it. Trench foot. Shell shot. Hell would be reprieve in a place like this. And all the men, all the poor souls who look up to me, Call me Corporal. What a jerk. To think I have any more idea of what's going on here. Anna can hear it in his voice. He's getting worn down. As Anna feels her emotions start to dull and fade, she begins accepting more dangerous assignments from her superiors, perhaps hoping just to feel something again. She works on the SCP-682 case, trying to devise more futile termination methods. She spends time with SCP-939, the abominations known as With Many Voices, 
until they start to imitate Robert's voice, and she knows that she can't do this anymore. She works with SCP-280, eyes in the dark, feeling no fear whatsoever as it floats towards her. The worst thing that could possibly happen to her has happened already. Now, she's just waiting, killing time. She has no idea of the further horrors to come. Lately, I've been hearing whispers in the dark. I think the rats are talking to me. <laughs> Funny. My troops must think me mad. What does it matter? This is a mad place, a mad time. A mad man is perhaps best suited to a time like this. So many went over the top yesterday, only to be cut down by machine gun fire. Isn't it odd that I laughed? It was so funny. I think perhaps this mental malady is connected to a physical one. Nosebleeds and vomiting spells. A strange black liquid. Faintly acidic to the touch. But so... <sighs> delicious. So fun. My troops tell me I look unwell. Like anything about this is well. Maybe I'll sneak into one of their bed sits tonight and teach them to lighten up a bit. None of them smile anymore. Me. I'm always smiling. I'll teach those little cowards to smile too. But as she listens to more of the logs, she's forced to reckon with the fact it really isn't him anymore. Not as she'd ever known him. He'd become something else. All the others are dead. <laughs> All my good, hard work. Making them dead. I followed them down the length of the trench. Their silly little bullets didn't hurt me. Oh no. Oh no, no, no. The look on their faces. All the screaming as they saw me. How thrilling to savor their fear as I approached. All those screams. What are you, you horrible old man? I showed them what I am. I can walk through walls now, you know. Have all the fun I want. Yes, yes, yes. Nothing can hurt me anymore, and I can hurt everyone. And when the war is over, I'll go home. Go home to my sweetheart. I know she's waiting for me. I can't wait to see her, to touch her beautiful face. My lovely, lovely Anna. Hearing him like this, so broken, so utterly transformed, it's too much for her to bear. But the work always needs her, and she returns to it day after day. One night, she sits up late, making her way through a stack of paperwork. When she hears it, a curious sound. Drip, drip, drip. Something thick dripping steadily onto the floor behind her. The smell of rot fills her nostrils, making her gag. She turns and comes face to face with SCP-106 dripping its slimy black mucus onto the floor, bringing decay to everything it touches. It reaches out toward her, grasping at her arm. She breaks free, but not before its touch melts away the fibers of her lab coat, threatening to seep through the fabric to her skin. All the while, it's staring straight at her, like it knows her. Anna runs out of the lab as fast as she can, shouting for help. A guard tries to come to her assistance, firing his weapon at the old man, but the bullets don't leave a dent, don't even slow him down. The old man grabs the weapon from the guard's hands, letting the metal rust, warp, and melt in his grasp. Then he turns his corrosive touch on the guard's face. Anna screams in horror at the sight, but she can do nothing to help him. All that she can do is keep running and hope that the monster doesn't catch her. She runs as fast as her legs can carry her, but she isn't as young as she once was, and years of sitting at a desk have made her muscles stiff and weak. Her foot hits the ground at just the wrong angle, and she stumbles, falling to the ground. She scrambles back to her feet, but when she looks up, something is horribly wrong. Her surroundings have changed. It looks like the Foundation site, but it's not quite the same. It's as if someone tried to recreate the facility from memory and couldn't retain all of the details. Then she hears it again, the drip, drip, drip. He 
is here. She spins around, and there it is, that awful face so close to her own. She takes a trembling step back when suddenly the monster speaks. <laughs> it's him. She knows it, as surely as she knows that she is about to die. The monster that once was Robert Scranton reaches out and caresses Anna's cheek with his wrinkled hand. She screams as the skin begins to droop, and he seals her lips with a kiss that makes her insides drip like melting wax. The two become one once again. A young researcher is thrown against the wall so hard that his spine breaks. A man turned into a scarecrow. A woman unmoored from gravity. A man losing a vital component of his brain. All these poisoned prizes can be yours if you have your hands on a certain special object. The thief is confused, to say the least, at the sight before him. It isn't exactly what he has been expecting to find on his travel to the Forgotten Cave. The strange object is displayed on an altar, with a beam emanating from somewhere above, shining a bright column of moonlight onto it. This must be the treasure that he was sent here for. But what was this strange treasure? He's still aching all over from his long journey, many days and nights spent crossing the desert just to reach his destination. All around the cavern are precious stones and gold coins, jewelry and riches beyond the thief's wildest dreams, and it's all his for the taking. Just as long as he fulfills his promise to the strange, decrepit old man he met at the entrance of the cave. The thief steps closer to the altar and examines the object the old man told him to recover. Upon hearing the word, lamp, the thief had been picturing an ornate oil jug with a handle and spout, not this thing. The thief had never seen an object quite like it. It's a tall, thin neck that winds upwards from a flat, circular base. The top looks like the hem of a dress, but far smaller and made from green glass. It's a lamp, all right, but not as this thief would know it. He lifts it up to get a closer look and notices something, an empty space beneath the stained glass lampshade. It looks like there's a part missing. Nearby, he comes across another curiosity, a rounded, almost perfect sphere of glass with an elongated protrusion terminating in a metal connector. It seems like it would be the perfect fit for the vacant port on the lamp. So, figuring out how to affix the two, the thief attaches the light bulb to the lamp. To his surprise, the bulb begins to glow a light blue. Cautiously, he places it back down and backs away, uncertain about what is about to happen next. A sudden plume of blue smoke erupts from the lamp, and the thief ducks for cover, thinking the object has exploded. But there's no loud sound, no flames, and this prompts him to peek out from his hiding place to see a mysterious figure emerging from the cloud. It looks to be an older man, hovering above the ground, not legs, but a tail of the same smoke as the rest of his body. Now the thief recognizes what's going on. He's grown up with stories of creatures almost exactly like this one, and it fills him with a rush of excitement. It's a genie. He can remember as clear as day tales about genies. They are mystical wish givers, imprisoned within lamps and then bound to the person who discovers them. Once it emerges from its slumber, a genie will then offer whoever freed it three wishes. Hey, you there. You gonna hide all night? Come on, kid, let's get this over with. What'll it be? The genie asks rather brashly. The thief approaches the smoky, translucent figure and immediately knows exactly what to do. He's already thought of exactly what to ask for, the wish that can free him from his life of stealing and poverty. Genie, I wish for you to make me rich, he says. As soon as he's finished his sentence, the genie vanishes, leaving the thief confused. Surely he still had another two wishes. He's startled as the light bulb he had affixed to the lamp suddenly explodes, for real this time, with a spark and a shower of small glass shards. Before the thief can so much as call for the genie to return and demand that it explain itself, he feels a sickly churning in his stomach. Something is very, very wrong. After a few short moments of violent and painful sickness, the thief lays dead on the floor of the cavern. If one from a more advanced period of history were to examine him, they'd find the thief's body exposed to an extremely large overdose of vitamin C, enough to kill him. The genie had made him rich. It just goes to show the old warning to be careful what you wish for is always applicable, especially when you find yourself making a wish from SCP-4035. 
Although it might look like an unassuming table lamp from the outside, within it stored an ancient entity who also happens to be wildly unpredictable, and a bit of a jerk to be completely honest. Anyone examining SCP-4035 will notice the first odd thing about it fairly quickly. The lamp itself is rather unremarkable, composed of a simple iron base with a conical lampshade above. Its patterned stained glass sports a number of shades of green, and overall, it looks like the type of lamp you might find at a grandparent's house, or a distant elderly relative who always tells you just how much you've grown when you visit every five to ten years, and whose home decor hasn't changed since the mid-1970s. But the first of SCP-4035's many strange properties is that it doesn't actually seem to work. Closer inspection of the lamp itself will reveal that it doesn't actually have any electrical components whatsoever. There's no wiring running through it, no cable leading to a plug that can be affixed to a wall socket, no switch, nothing. Except for a standard light bulb socket. So naturally, anyone coming across this seemingly useless table lamp will feel compelled to find a light bulb and see if the thing actually works. That's when things get even stranger. Light bulbs placed into SCP-4035 will indeed illuminate, despite the lack of electricity powering the lamp. There won't appear to be anything unusual about its functionality at first, other than the bulbs inserted into SCP-4035 will produce a blue-tinted light. But surely that's just because of its ornate stained glass lampshade, right? Wrong. Shortly after placing a light bulb within SCP-4035, that's when he emerges. Who is he? Well, the Foundation knows him as SCP-4035-1, but for the sake of brevity, let's just call him the Genie. Emerging from the lamp will be an entity that seems to be gaseous in its composition, lacking a tangible, physical form, and instead appearing to be incorporeal, almost like a ghost, or a man made of vapors. This being has been described as having the characteristics of a middle-aged, balding man, looking to be somewhere between his 40s and 50s. Whenever he appears, the genie always looks the same, always sporting a patchy brown suit coat. Beneath, however, he has no visible legs, and in their place is a cloud of blue gas that emanates from the lower body of SCP-4035-1. As soon as SCP-4035-1 appears, he will strike up a conversation with whoever placed a light bulb in the lamp that contains him. Now, you might be forgiven for, perhaps, predicting how the next interaction typically plays out. After all, you've seen Aladdin. A genie appears and offers to grant the person who discovered its lamp three wishes. However, the person making the wishes has to be very careful with how they word their requests to the magical entity. One wrong word, and they might find themselves suffering some unforeseen consequences. Or perhaps it unfolds like other myths and fables involving genies. The wishes are granted, but they come at a terrible, maybe even fatal, price. Well, you'd be almost right to expect something like that from this genie. But let's just say that SCP-4035-1 doesn't exactly enjoy doing things by the book. The genie introduces itself, usually under some randomly selected false name. Some favorites of his during past encounters have included Bobby, Spiff, Danny Fry, and Josephi Krakowski. Now you can see why just calling him the genie is a lot simpler. Anyway, after he manifests, SCP-4035-1 won't offer three wishes, but instead offers to sell a product to whoever placed a light bulb in SCP-4035. Attempts to ask the genie to elaborate on the product being offered are usually met with an evasive response and little detail being revealed. Once the person, or subject, talking to SCP-4035-1 responds, the genie then, in effect, grants their wish. They can just be trying to converse with the entity, but it will regard even a completely unrelated verbal response as an answer. The subjects typically receive a biological modification or other anomalous ability that directly relates to what they said to the genie, and we do mean directly. Once again, you might be forgiven for expecting that being granted supernatural powers by a magical genie would be a fun experience. After all, who doesn't want anomalous abilities? But be warned, the abilities SCP-4035-1 hands out usually fit the description of lackluster and disappointing. Why? Well, because typically, the anomalous modifications the genie makes are highly detrimental to the subject in question. You see, SCP-4035-1 has a habit of taking things extremely literally, almost to a pedantic extent. 
intentionally misinterpreting, and leaving any who accidentally make a wish with it harmful changes to their minds and bodies. And like most genies from mythology, this one doesn't undo the wishes that it grants. After bestowing someone with abilities that usually leave them in agony or distress, the genie disappears back into SCP-4035, causing the light bulb inside to violently explode. Should someone attempt to replace it and get the genie to reverse whatever horrific change it has made, its voice will emanate from the lamp and yell, Sorry kid, no refunds. But how bad could these abilities possibly be? Well, to find out the answer, you only have to take a look at a select few of the numerous tests the SCP Foundation has done involving SCP-4035. Dr. Bannock, at one point in time, is assigned to be the head researcher in charge of conducting experiments on SCP-4035. The approach he takes is sending members of disposable D-Class personnel to interact with the lamp and genie, then record the results. The first test unfolds as follows. The subject, a D-Class with the designation number D-4088, is sent into the containment chamber that houses SCP-4035. Dr. Bannock instructs him to place a light bulb in the socket and request telepathic abilities from SCP-4035-1. However, as the genie emerges, its sudden presence startles the D-Class, and he makes an expletive exclamation that we won't repeat. It was words to the effect of, what the heck is this? As a result, the genie grants D-4088 an ability that relates to the sentence he said. And to call it particularly unpleasant might be something of an understatement. You see, because of a certain word the D-Class had used, the genie gives him the ability to identify the chemical composition of what we'll refer to as waste. The fact that he can even identify what kind of creature said waste comes from does little to make D-4088 happy with his newfound power. Dr. Bannock is forced to refine his experimentation strategy following this bungled first attempt. In the lead-up to the second test, he informs the next D-Class candidate of what exactly they will be facing when they enter the chamber, so as not to be caught by surprise at the sight of the genie. As a result, the second D-Class subject repeats the process of activating SCP-4035 and calmly repeats the request for telepathic abilities that he's been told to ask for. I'd like to be able to read minds. Unfortunately, his wording means things haven't exactly gone according to plan. Testing with this subject reveals he hasn't developed any telepathic abilities. Disappointed, Dr. Bannock has the subject released back into Foundation incarceration alongside his fellow D-Class prisoners. However, several weeks pass, and it soon becomes apparent what ability this inmate has been granted. He encounters another D-Class, one of many pulled from maximum security prisons around the globe, this particular inmate has a tattoo on his forehead of a few words in Chinese. However, to the former test subject, these phrases appear to have been translated to English and read, Cuban butter mustache. When he reveals the mistake made by his fellow inmate's tattoo artist, the subject is attacked and beaten up. He had, however, gained the ability to read minds. He can understand any form of writing on the forehead of a living being. A little time passes, and Dr. Bannock finds himself still struggling to get SCP-4035-1 to bestow any worthwhile abilities to test subjects. The genie just seems to take everything far too literally, interpreting every wish with no regard for normal speech and colloquialisms, even disregarding the safety of the person making the wish. Dr. Bannock conducts yet another test, sending a member of D-Class to speak with the genie and telling him to wish for muscle regeneration. The D-Class places the request with SCP-4035-1 seemingly without issue. However, then comes the next part, testing whether this new anomalous ability actually works the way Dr. Bannock intends. The subject of this latest experiment is intentionally injured. As this happens, his body appears to rapidly change. His muscular system swells up and multiplies, increasing from its original size. A successful test, right? Well, it would be if the rapid muscle regeneration actually stopped. Before long, the D-Class test subject's muscle tissue is almost 250% bigger than its original size, making it much bigger than the rest of his body too. The subject is clearly highly distressed, although fortunately, this doesn't continue for long. Unfortunately, that's because his body can't function normally with this new rapid change, and as a result, the D-Class subject's vital signs stop after three short seconds. Getting more and more frustrated with the disastrous outcomes, Dr. Bannock makes the decision to simplify the requests made to the genie. 
Surely it can't misinterpret one word, can it? The next test that Bannock conducts sees yet another unwitting member of D-Class, D-1899, entering the containment chamber and placing a light bulb within SCP-4035, just like her predecessors have done. She follows her instructions, and as the genie appears, she asks for one thing. Flight. A short while later, the genie once again vanishes and leaves D-1899 with her wish. She has instantly become unaffected by the Earth's gravitational pull like normal. Within seconds, she is floating above the ground, as if experiencing the zero gravity of traveling in outer space. That certainly sounds idyllic, doesn't it? After all, who doesn't wish they could fly? To be granted the unique opportunity to view the majesty of the world from high above. Just one problem, though. Getting back down. D-1899 quickly realizes, as does an agitated Dr. Bannock, that she isn't in control of her newfound flying abilities. She can't alter her direction or return back down to ground level at will. She's stuck, floating in the air, only able to affect her trajectory by propelling herself off of solid structures. The results of SCP-4035 tests continue to be somewhat undesirable to say the least. An interaction with the genie that begins with the phrase, uh, hey man, causes the D-Class who spoke to be suddenly replaced with a crude scarecrow. When another subject makes a wish for a new life, they die almost instantly. Only four moments later, one of the Foundation's researchers to suddenly give birth to a baby with identical genetic makeup to the now deceased D-Class. Another test sees a member of D-Class personnel enter the containment chamber with the instruction to wish for whatever they can think of. Put on the spot, they're unsure what to request when the genie appears, and instead, they only offer up the response, I don't know. Moments later, this subject falls into a catatonic state and eventually passes away. An autopsy of the subject's body reveals that their hippocampus has been removed. Thanks to the genie, they literally didn't know anything. Further testing with SCP-4035 is later carried out, however, it should be noted that the next instance of a recorded experiment with a genie isn't one that was authorized by the SCP Foundation. Rather, hearing that there was a genie being tested, junior researcher Jacobson decides to try and make his ultimate wish come true. He's never been all that lucky in love, and it's left the young Foundation researcher with a little insecurity. Nothing that a visit to SCP-4035-1 can't fix, surely. Despite not being authorized to use SCP-4035, junior researcher Jacobson approaches the lamp within its containment chamber. He then repeats the process to make SCP-4035-1 appear, and then requests that the genie grant his wish. Make me more attractive? In an ideal world, this scenario wraps up with junior researcher Jacobson becoming more handsome by conventional standards, perhaps even improving his sense of insecurity as a result. But by now, you can probably guess, that isn't what happens at all. Instead, being as literal as ever, the genie grants the young researcher's wish and makes him more attractive. Seconds later, as soon as the genie has demanifested, Jacobson is suddenly flung across the containment chamber and smacked sharply against the solid wall. The sheer force of the impact gives the junior researcher a severe spinal fracture. Of course, this catches the attention of Foundation security, who bring junior researcher Jacobson to the on-site medical center. There, he is given a full analysis, and this reveals the extent of just how attractive the genie has made him. Junior researcher Jacobson's epidermis, his outer layer of skin, has been given properties similar to that of a high-powered magnet. He has been magnetically attracted to the metallic walls of the containment chamber, resulting in a spinal injury that would claim his life only two hours later. The extensive testing with SCP-4035 is still ongoing, and as a result, the Foundation sees it fit to keep a large supply of light bulbs near the lamp's containment chamber. Dr. Bannock's research seems to indicate that while a person is in close proximity with SCP-4035, they are more likely to suffer a sudden and inexplicable speech problem. For example, the most common of these are parapraxis, commonly known as a Freudian slip, or ankyloglossia, which is a condition wherein the skin joining a person's tongue to the bottom of their mouth is shorter than usual. And this affects normal tongue movement, sometimes being called a tongue tie. Being closer to SCP-4035-1 increases the chances of suffering some form of unintended speech mistake by 68% when talking to the genie. To cut a long story short, the genie doesn't just intentionally and obtusely interpret everything literally, but also directly affects how clear a person will be while making their wish. As for exactly where SCP-4035 comes from, 
there's little information available. Some theories suggest it might well be an actual mythological genie who is just tired of spending so many centuries in the business of granting wishes for mortals. After all, imagine you get trapped in a desk lamp for all eternity and have to magically fulfill the requests of anyone that comes across you. Living through that for so long is liable to make a genie bitter and petty. Then again, perhaps the genie isn't even really a genuine genie. It doesn't inhabit an oil lamp but instead a broken table lamp, and instead of granting wishes in the way they're intended, it misinterprets and takes things too literally, leaving the poor fools who thought they'd be blessed with supernatural powers to deal with the consequences. But perhaps that's the point. If nothing else, the genie residing in SCP-4035 serves as a reminder of that important lesson, to be careful what you wish for. In any case, if we were going looking for a genie, we'd take the friendly Robin Williams type over this pedantic jerk any day. Seeing that shadowy figure coming towards him makes the worker turn and run. He hasn't had the time nor the luxury of freezing on the spot, or waiting for it to get closer so he could get a clearer view. He just runs. With every pace, every hurried, horrified step, comes the mental image of the strange figure gaining on him. In his head, every movement he catches in the corner of his eye, every shuffling sound he detects, the thing was right behind him, inches away and ready to strike. So he just keeps on running. Only seconds ago, it was just standing under a streetlight, a ways ahead of the worker, barely moving. He calls out to it, assuming it's a person, somebody may be lost or in need of help. But then, it steps into the light, and it's not a person at all. The head of the suit isn't on properly, it droops at an angle like it hasn't been affixed or is barely hanging on. The crude, lazy-eyed face is haphazardly drooping. That too isn't on right, as the entire head sways unnervingly with each approaching step. Maybe underneath the suit, hiding beneath all that dirty orange fur, still coated in grime despite the rain, perhaps there's a person in there, whose arm hefts an old baseball bat as they plod closer and closer to the worker. But all he sees is the monster. The filthy costume might be clumsily made, but the worker instantly recognizes the all-too-familiar resemblance of an orange cat from a popular comic strip. It's what starts him running. That and the blunt weapon the monster is holding as it menacingly makes its way closer. The downpour doesn't let up as the worker turns a corner, met with the sights of two bright, blinding white beams of light cutting through the rain. A car, speeding its way down the road. It catches the worker in its headlights, and he starts frantically waving his arms, encased in the sodden fabric of his jacket. Help! Oh, please! Please help me! He yells. Something's coming after me! I think it's trying to kill me! The driver doesn't stop, instead simply cruising past. The worker can just about see through the passenger side window, the vehicle's sole occupant giving him a strange look from inside the safety of his car. Almost as quickly as it appears, the car has driven off, its headlights already fading from view thanks to the rain. What the worker doesn't realize is that the driver's look of confusion wasn't directed at him, but at the thing following him. The creature gives a low, animalistic sound, which causes the worker to spin around. Now he sees it, right up close in all its foul, ginger glory. A tail dangles lazily from the lower portion of the suit, trailing in puddles laden with muck, the water making the fur even dirtier than it already is. It's so close that the awful, pungent stench of the thing hits the worker's nostrils, a sickening smell that somehow seems to fit with the grim, gross costume and its wearer. Seeing the wet, fur-coated suit so close, he realizes that it isn't covered in the soft, plush, synthetic coat that he expects a costume like that to be made of. It looks real, like actual cat hair on a huge humanoid shape with the legs and arms of a man, arms that were midway through swinging a baseball bat right at the worker's head. He ducks just in time, the dull wooden bat glancing off the bricks of a nearby building, narrowly missing the worker's head. As it bounces off the wall, the blunt weapon slips from the soggy gloves of the suit and clatters to the ground. The second he hears the wooden bat land on the ground, the worker turns his heel and runs again, taking advantage of those precious few seconds to get further distance between him and his attacker. It's only exactly as he turns his back that he wishes he'd reached for the bat himself to fight back. Rushing further down the rain-swept street, the worker can hear the heavy slumping footsteps of the suited attacker giving chase. He alternates between looking straight ahead, the raindrops streaming down his face and getting into his eyes, and daring to glance back over his shoulder. Every time he does, he's met again with the horrifying sight of the suit behind him. He wants nothing more than to escape, to get out of this nightmare wherein he is soaked head to toe in rainwater and fear, running for his life, from someone dressed as the comic strip cat he sees every day. 
but as strong as his will to escape is, he can't bear to let the fur-suited pursuer out of his sight for even a second. If he can't see it, then it might be anywhere. At least looking told him that he was still right behind him, bearing down on the worker with its bat now firmly back in hand. The shrill noise of chain links rattling sounds behind him as the attacker in the suit starts striking a nearby fence, making the worker more and more aware that with every strike, it's getting closer. Through the relentless downpour, the worker spots a shape standing on the sidewalk just a few feet ahead. Short, stationary, something he sees every day of his life but never pays any notice to. But tonight, it might just be the thing that saves his life. A trash can. It's full, and that means heavy, and any second now, he'll be close enough to reach it. A plan forms in seconds, erupting like a fire with gasoline thrown on it. If that gasoline was pure, terrified adrenaline of being chased by someone in an orange cat costume, reaching out, as soon as his fingertips grip the wet metal rim of the can, the worker pulls as hard as possible, his instincts keeping him from stopping running. The trash can clatters behind him as he passes, followed by the heavy thud of the attacker falling to the ground as it trips over the obstacle and lands furry head first in the garbage now strewn over the sidewalk. The worker knows he's only got another short window, another blessing of a precious few seconds to get far enough away from his attacker. He turns, changing course to rush across the street. There's an old warehouse over there. If there are security guards working, they might be able to help. If not, and the place is unguarded, then at least it could be somewhere to hide. A sudden blaring noise pierces the worker's eardrums before he can make it all the way to the opposite sidewalk. It's a horn, coupled with a bright pair of lights appearing as if from nowhere. Then, before he can turn to see it coming, impact. First against the hood of the car, speeding through the rain towards him, unable to stop in enough time. Next, the pain of hitting the jagged blacktop of the road. The second impact, as the worker lands a few feet away, spots of rain still pattering against his face as everything goes from dark to pitch black for a few seconds. His head floods with scenes from earlier that day, as if his life was about to start flashing before his eyes, only in reverse. The news of the comic strip doing poorly arrives at the Paws Inc. office, and with it, the knowledge that, if there are going to be layoffs, then he'll be first. He's the new hire, after all. It didn't matter that the once-beloved comic of a cartoon cat is losing its popularity, going stale after so many years in print. It upset the investors, and the worker has been worrying all day if he'd be the one fired to appease them until he suddenly remembers what's coming after him. Fighting back and clawing his way back to consciousness, he struggles back to his feet, screaming with pain. He's injured, that much he can certainly tell, even if he doesn't know how badly. Hey, hey mister! The driver calls, stopping his car and starting to climb out of the vehicle. It's a different driver and car this time, and unlike the first, he makes the effort to stop, a mistake that is about to cost him greatly. He sees the worker getting back up, ignoring his calls. He raises his voice to cut through the noise of the pouring rain. Hey, you okay? I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. My lights were on low, wipers are going. It wasn't until you rushed out across the street that... Anyway, look, let me at least get you to a hospital. We can exchange our insurance information once they get you all patched up. The worker wasn't listening. He hears the driver's words but pays him no mind. He's still so intent on getting away that it takes him a second to realize. The car. It's a way out. And then, the worker makes the same mistake as the driver. He stops. And when he does, he sees what has clambered back to its fur-coated feet and is now shuffling towards the driver. Look out! The worker yells. The driver turns, just in time to see. What the hell? He exclaims. Wait a minute, why are you dressed in a Garfield costume? Whack! The sound of the bat being swung at the driver makes the worker feel sick. He turns his back and moves as quickly as he can towards the warehouse, despite the pain and the horrified screams coming from behind. Beneath the rain, there's something else, a twisted, vile squelching noise that quickly snuffs out the driver's dying cries. The worker doesn't dare to look back this time. He doesn't want to see what's happening. Lifting a heavy metal shutter and pulling it shut behind him, he finds himself in the warehouse. It's completely deserted. There isn't a single sign of life anywhere. The only sound is the pattering of rainwater against the hard concrete floor, dripping through a hole in the ceiling. Guided by the low, glowing light of the street lamps outside that bleeds through the warehouse windows, the worker starts fumbling around for a place to hide. Just as he crawls underneath a large pallet rack, he hears a metallic rattling as the fur-suited monstrosity lifts up the shutter. It's inside. With heavy, plodding steps in its suit, it paces up and down the aisles of discarded shelving. The worker clamps his soaked hands against his mouth, trying to mask his panicked breathing, only to let out a scream as he feels something grab his ankle and pull. With ease, the thing dressed as a disheveled Garfield pulls him out of his hiding place. 
Instinctively, the worker thrashes his legs, landing a solid kick to the creature. As his foot connects, he notices it doesn't feel like a person underneath the suit. There's no body, no familiar outline of a human being beneath all the soggy fur and stench. It's just a slimy mass. Nonetheless, the kick knocks the garish Garfield back, only a few paces, but better than nothing. He scrabbles to his feet, standing and running as fast as he can in the opposite direction, only to hit a wall at the far side of the warehouse. The shutter is the only way out, and right now it's wide open. But Garfield stands between the worker and freedom. He turns to dart down the next aisle, between the rows of shelves, keeping his eyes on the attacker as he passes underneath the hole in the ceiling. The rain is still coming down through it, leaving a puddle on the floor. The worker's focus is locked on the beast. He suddenly feels his foot slipping out from under him, that awful lurch of his heart as he falls. The puddle. He slipped on it and come crashing down to the ground. The force of the concrete striking his back knocks all the breath from his lungs. Everything is spinning in a nauseating mix of pain, disorientation, and terror. Above, through the unrepaired ceiling, drops of rain come pouring down on him. Then, a low, agonized meow from somewhere nearby. The monster, Garfield, brings its bat swinging down and sharply connecting with the worker lying on the ground. A new surge of pain racks his body, right at the hip where the baseball bat just landed in an unforgiving blow. The worker can do nothing but scream in pain and fear. A horrible sound, like something wet tearing, fills his ears over his own cries. He remembers the sickening feeling of a slimy mass being aggressively pushed into his face. It's disgusting, rancid, but even under all the horror and the repulsive taste, he can detect familiar hints. Pasta, beef, tomato sauce, cheese, all of it moldy and rotten but still recognizable. The monstrous SCP-3166 forces further fistfuls of lasagna down the worker's throat until the screaming stops. He'd always hated Mondays. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-674, The Exposition Gun Makes Nintendo Real Life.